Preface to a study of British genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Preface. For many years past material has been growing under my hands, bearing on the psychological and anthropological characteristics of genius, and from time to time I have examined these data and reach certain more or less secure conclusions. These conclusions, together with a summary of the material on which they are founded, I hope to set forth in a series of volumes. In the meanwhile, however, I am absorbed in another task, which will yet take some years to complete, and since life is short, I have thought it well not to delay longer the publication of the first of my studies of genius. It deals with a subject which can scarcely fail to be of interest to most of us, even apart from the biological questions involved, and as it stands, it seems to illustrate by a single concrete example of the first importance of the genius Great Britain, many of the special characteristics of genius generally. In the past, the phenomena of genius have mostly been approached from two distinct standpoints. In the first place, they were dealt with by alienists, who, being impressed by the fact that certain men of eminent genius had presented symptoms which may properly be termed insane became unduly inclined to attribute insanity to the manifestations of genius generally. On the other hand, the subject has more recently been taken up by anthropologists who have ignored altogether the psychiatric, and even for the most part the psychological aspects of genius. Mr. Galton is the earliest and most distinguished exponent of this highly important aspect of the study of genius. In the prefatory chapter to the second edition, 1892, of Hereditary Genius, Mr. Galton has admitted that it is not the only aspect, stating that some place must be given to the study of genius as a mental anomaly, an inborn excitability and peculiarity. My own attempt to investigate the phenomenon of genius may be said to start from the point where Mr. Galton's left off, though my standpoint was reached some years before 1892. My method of approaching the group corresponds, so far as the data allow, with that which, in France, Dr. Toulouse has recently adopted so brilliantly and thoroughly, notably in his study of Zola, in approaching the individual man of genius. From the purely psychiatric standpoint, from the purely anthropological standpoint, it is alike impossible to interpret the phenomena of genius adequately. The methods, which are instructive in the lunatic of Solon, or those other methods, such as under Dr. Haddon's initiating influence, have been carried out by Dr. Brown in the islands of the west of Ireland which prove fruitful in isolated communities of the normal population are here both out of place. In a study of genius, which is biological in the widest sense of that term, we must obtain alike the psychological data and the anthropological data, normal and abnormal, and seek to balance them steadily, without swerving unduly either to the right hand or to the left. The plan of the present book is simple. The bulk of the volume is taken up with the succinct coordination and summation of the data before us, all introduction of foreign matter which might unduly outweigh the conclusions at any point being strictly excluded. In small type are inserted the results obtained by previous investigators on somewhat similar bodies of data, together with the results obtained by the study of other mentally abnormal groups. These results are often of the highest significance in enabling us to interpret our conclusions. In the appendices, I have brought together some of the elementary facts on which I have worked. The reader is thus enabled to examine and check my methods for himself. He will also, I hope, be able at many points to correct or amplify the original data. I have proposed to represent the results of this study graphically by means of curves. On consideration, however, it seems that such a method was unsuited to the nature of the data and might tend to mislead the reader. For most of the groups of facts here dealt with the data unnecessary and complete, and although a more thorough sifting of the sources would certainly yield further facts, they would, in the end, still remain incomplete. It is undesirable to give an air of precision to data, which we have indeed good reason to consider approximately correct, but which at the same time do not enable us to reach the exact composition of the whole of the groups we are dealing with. A. Vlog Ellis, Carbus Water, Lenant, Cornwall End of preface. Section 1 of A Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 1. Introductory. The problem to be investigated. The method of investigation. The Dictionary of National Biography. The principles ruling the selection of names. Cattle's method of selection. Reasons for the principles here adopted. Proportion of eminent women to eminent men. The distribution of intellectual ability in the various centuries. The biological data with which the present inquiry is chiefly concerned. Fallacies to be avoided. Until now, it has not been possible to obtain any comprehensive view of the men and women who have chiefly built up English civilization. It has not therefore been possible to study their personal characteristics as a group. The 66 volumes of the Dictionary of National Biography have at the first time enabled us to construct an authoritative and well-balanced scheme of the persons of illustrious genius in every department who have appeared in the British Isles from the beginning of history down to the end of the 19th century, and with a certain amount of labour they assist us to sum up their main traits. It has seemed to me worth while, both for the sake of ascertaining the composition of those elements of intellectual ability with which Great Britain has contributed to the world, and also as a study of the nature of genius generally, to utilise a dictionary to work out these traits. I propose to present here some of the main conclusions which emerge from such a study. The dictionary contains some record, from a few lines to several dozen pages, of some 30,000 persons. Now this is an impractical and undesirable number to deal with impractical because regarding a large proportion of these persons very little is here recorded or is even known and desirable because it must be admitted that the majority though persons of a certain note in their own day or their own circle cannot be said to have made any remarkable contribution to civilization or to have displayed any very transcendent degree of native ability my first task therefore was to discover a principle of selection in accordance with which the persons of relatively less distinguished ability and achievement might be eliminated at the outset, one such class of individuals, it was fairly obvious, should be admitted altogether in the construction of any group in which the qualities of native intellectual ability are essential. Royalty and members of the royal family, as well as the hereditary nobility. Those eminent persons, the sons of commanders who have founded noble families, are of course not excluded by this rule, according to which any eminent person whose father, at the time of his birth, had attained a rank of baronet, or any higher rank, is necessarily excluded from my list. Certainly the son of a king or a peer may possess a high degree of native ability, but it is practically impossible to estimate how far that ability would have carried him had he been the son of an ordinary citizen. It might be maintained that a successful merchant, ship owner, schoolmaster, or tradesman requires as much sagacity and mental alertness as even the most successful sovereign. By eliminating those individuals in whom the accident of birth counts for so much, we put this insoluble question out of court. I am surprised to find how few persons of obviously preeminent ability are excluded by this rule, and many whom, at first, one would imagine excludes, it really allows to pass, especially in the case of sons born before the father was created a peer. In order to avoid any scandalous omissions, I have thought it well to rule in all those sons of peers whose ability has clearly been of a kind which could not be aided by person and influence. Thus I have included the third Earl of Shaftesbury, for it cannot be held that the possession of an earldom tends to aid a man in becoming a philosopher. It has, however, very rarely indeed been necessary to accord this privilege. I have always refrained from according it in the case of soldiers and statesmen. Having eliminated those whose position in the world has clearly been influenced by the accident of birth, it remained to eliminate those whose place in the world as well as in the dictionary was comparatively small. After some consideration, I decided that, generally speaking, those persons to whom less than three pages were allotted were evidently not regarded by the editors, and could scarcely be generally regarded as of the first rank of evidence. Accordingly, I excluded all those individuals to whom less than that amount of space was devoted. When this was done, however, I found it necessary to go through the dictionary again, treating this rule in a somewhat more liberal manner. I had so far obtained some 700 names, but I had excluded many persons of undoubtedly very eminent ability and achievement. Hutton, the geologist, and Jane Austen, the novelist, for instance, could scarcely be admitted from a study of British genius. It was evident that persons with eventful lives had a better chance of occupying much space than other persons of equal ability with uneventful lives. Moreover, I found that a somewhat rigid adherence to the rule I laid down had sometimes resulted in groups that were too small 
and too ill-balanced to be useful for study. In the case of musical composers, for instance, while those of recent times, of whom much is known, bulk largely in the dictionary, the early musicians, of whom little is known, though their eminence is much greater, were excluded from my list. On the other hand, a certain number of persons had been included because, although of quite ordinary ability, like Bradshaw, the regicide, they happened by accident to have played a considerable part in history. In going through the dictionary a second time, therefore, I modified my list in accordance with the new rule, to the effect that biographies occupying less than three pages should be included, if the writers seemed to consider that their subjects had shown intellectual ability of a high order, and that those occupying more space should be excluded if the writers considered that their subjects displayed no high intellectual ability. In this way, I eliminated those persons who ranked chiefly as villains, like Titus Oates, and have little claim to the possession of any eminent degree of intellectual ability. I likewise felt compelled to exclude women, like Lady Hamilton, whose fame is not due to intellectual ability, but to beauty and to connection with eminent persons. I also omitted one or two persons for the reason that although their claim to inclusion was unimpeachable, we are not in possession of a single definite biographical fact concerning them. From the present point of view, they would merely cumber the ground. So far as possible it will be seen, I have sought to subordinate my own private judgment in making the selection. It has been my object to place a list, so far as possible, on an objective basis. At the same time, it is evident that, while I only reserved to myself a casting vote of doubtful points, there was inevitably a certain proportion of cases where this personal vote had to be given. A purely mechanical method of making selections would necessarily lead to various absurdities. And all that I can claim is that the principles of selection I adopted have involved a minimum of interference on my part. It is certainly true that, even after much consideration and repeated revision, I remain myself still in doubt regarding a certain proportion of people included in my list and a certain proportion omitted. Indeed, any reader who finds on going through my list that there are certain omitted names which most certainly ought to have been included, and certain included names which might well be omitted, will have reached precisely the conclusion which I have myself reached. However often I went through the dictionary, I know that I should each time make a few trifling readjustments, and anyone else who took the trouble to go over the ground I have transversed would likewise wish to make readjustments. But I am convinced that if my principles of selection are accepted, the margin of such readjustment is narrow. It will be observed that by means of a slightly complicated and so far as possible objective method of selection, I have not merely sought to include only individuals of a very high order of intellectual ability, but have at the same time sought to avoid, so far as possible, the omission of others whom may have an equal claim to inclusion on account of their possession of a high degree of intellectual ability. It will at the same time be observed that I do not claim to be absolutely successful either as regards the inclusion or the omissions. I must hasten to add that any failure here very slightly impairs the primary objective of this study. It has not been my main object to obtain a final list to date of those British men and women who have shown the highest degree of intellectual ability. I wish to ascertain some of the biological characteristics, anthropological and psychological, of persons of the highest intellectual ability produced by Great Britain. For this purpose, it was essential that the list should be carefully and impartially obtained. It was not essential that it should be faultless, although that was the ideal I set before myself. There is some interest in comparing my list with another list, prepared by Professor Cattell, of the 1,000 most eminent men that have appeared in the world generally. J. McKean Cattell, A Statistical Study of Eminent Men, Popular Science Monthly, February 1903. Professor Cattell, in constructing the list, adhered rigidly to the very principle and mechanical method of selecting which I had at first proposed to follow, but, as has been above explained, found it desirable in some degree to modify by the adoption of additional rules of selection. He took six biographical dictionaries, English, French, German, and American, and reducing space to a common standard, selected the 1,000 persons who were allowed the greatest average space, inclusion in at least three of the dictionaries being regarded as an essential condition. The list was thus, so far as Professor Cattell was concerned, absolutely objective. Of Professor Cattell's 1,000 most eminent persons, 243, or nearly a quarter, appear to be British, or to have flourished in Great Britain. Of these, as many as at least 60 are not found on my list. As the names of Professor Cattell's list appears without dates, 
the identification is not always quite certain. Of these, 60, 33 were excluded from a list as royal personages, and 20 as belonging to the hereditary aristocracy. The remaining seven, who, since they thus figure among the 1,000 most eminent persons who ever lived, ought solely to appear in my longer list of purely British persons. One, Jeffreys, was excluded because, although he may not have been without legal ability, the space which he occupies in the minds of men is not due to his ability, but to the scandal which he caused. He lives rather as a bad man than as a man of genius. In a somewhat similar manner, Macpherson, who appears in Professor Cattle's list, but not in mine, was excluded because, although he occupies an important position in literary history, his contributions to literature have their main value from the traditions they embody. He is an insignificant character who accidentally aroused great controversies and showed little or no ability in his undoubtedly original literary work. Another Thomas Brown is a metaphysician who, at all events in the dictionary, is regarded as of little importance. Another Robert Hall was a Baptist preacher who left a reputation for pulpit oratory. The remaining three are Boothnot, Armstrong, and Akenside are minor literary men whose productions are now unread, though it is possible that one Armstrong is undeservedly neglected. I do not consider that the exclusion of these seven persons reveals a very serious defect in my list, even though it may well be that a few individuals have found their way into my list who showed intellectual ability, but that was of but little higher order. An examination of Professor Cattles suffices to show how extremely difficult it is to obtain a reliable estimate of intellectual eminence on a simple objective basis. A test which placed Napoleon III as the 11th greatest man that ever lived, before Homer, Newton, and Alexander the Great, and includes some unread minor poets, while it excludes Gilbert, the father of experimental science, is scarcely satisfactory. It is certainly better than a subjective method, but its results seem to justify such an attempt as I have made, however imperfectly to adopt a more complexly objective method of selection. In the final result, my selection yields 975 British men of a high degree of intellectual eminence, the eminent women number 55, being in proportion to the men about 1 to 18. A slightly lower standard of ability, it would appear, prevails among the women than among men. On account of the greater rarity of intellectual ability in women, they have often played a large part in the world on the strength of achievements which would not have allowed a man to play a similar large part. It seemed again impossible to exclude various women of powerful and influential personality, though their achievements were not always considerable. I allude to such persons as Hannah Moore and Mrs. Montague. Even Mrs. Somerville, the only feminine representative of science in my list, could scarcely be included were she not a woman, for she was little more than the accomplished popularizer of scientific results. In one department, and one only, the women seemed to be little, if at all, inferior to the men in ability. That is in acting. Professor Cattell finds the proportion of women in his list of the most eminent persons of history generally to be 3.2%, while in my British list is higher, being 5.3%. This is a difference which might have been anticipated, since my list refers only to post-classical times, includes persons of a lower degree of eminence, and is concerned with the people among whom the conditions have possibly been more than usually favourable to the development of ability in women. It may be asked how these 1,030 persons of eminent intellectual ability have been distributed through the course of English history. I find that from the 4th to the 10th centuries, inclusive, there are only 11 men of sufficient distinction to appear in my lists, nearly half of these belonging to the 7th century. From that date onwards, reckoning by the date of birth, we find that the 11th century yields 5, the 12th yields 11, the 13th 9, the 14th 16, the 15th 32, the 16th 161, the 17th 191, the 18th 372, the 19th 223. It is probable that the estimate most nearly corresponds to the actual facts as regards the 17th and 18th centuries. Before that time our information is too scanty, so that many men of notable ability have passed away without record. In the 19th century, on the other hand, the material has been too copious, and the national biographers have probably tended to become unduly appreciative of every faint manifestation of intellectual ability. The extraordinary productiveness of the 18th century is very remarkable. In order to realise the significance of the facts, however, a century is too long a period. 
Distributing our persons of genius into half-century periods, I find the following groups are formed. A table is displayed on the page with five columns in three rows, with each box signifying a 50-year increment in centuries and a corresponding number for the preeminent individuals noted. Only four individuals belong to the second half of the 19th century. It is scarcely necessary to remark that the record for the first half of the 19th century is still incomplete. Taking the experience of the previous century as a basis, it may be estimated that some 35% of the eminent persons belonging to the first half of the 19th century are still alive. This would raise that half century to the first place, but it may be pointed out that the increase on the previous half century would be comparatively small, and also that the result must be discounted by the inevitable tendency to overestimate the men of recent times. We have to accept the perspective by which near things look large and remote things look small, but we must not be duped by it. When we bear in mind that the activities of the individuals in each of these groups really fall on the whole into the succeeding period, certain interesting points are suggested. We note how the waves of humanism and reformation, when striking the shores of Britain, have stirred intellectual activity and have prolonged and intensified in the delayed English Renaissance. We see how this fermentation has been continued in the political movements of the middle of the 17th century, and we note the influence of the European upheaval at the end of the 18th century. The extraordinary outburst of intellect in the second half of that century is accentuated by the fact that, taking into account all entries in the dictionary, the gross number of eminent men of the low standard required for inclusion shows little increase in the 18th century. 5,789 as against 5,674 in the preceding century is the editor's estimate. The increase of ability is thus in quality rather than in quantity. It is curious to note that, throughout these eight centuries, a marked rise in level of intellectual ability has very frequently, though not invariably, been preceded by a marked fall. It is also noteworthy that in every century from the 11th to the 18th, with the exception of the 17th, the majority of its great men have been born in the latter half. That is to say that the beginning of a century tends to be marked by an outburst of genius which declines through the century. Admitted in the 19th century, 487 persons were born in the second halves of the centuries, only 323 in the first halves. This outburst is very distinct at the beginning of the 19th century. As we have seen reason to believe, it was probably succeeded by an arrest, if not a decline, in the production of genius. It would seem that we are here in the presence of two factors, a spontaneous rhythmical rise and fall in the production of genius, so that a period of what is improperly called decadence is followed by one of expansive activity, and also, at the same time, the stimulating influence of great historical events, calling out latent intellectual energy. These considerations, however, are merely speculative, and it is sufficient to record them this brief passing notice. It is noteworthy that the progress of European ability generally, as illustrated by Professor Cattell's results, has followed very much the same curve as I have found in the case of British genius. Following the extraordinary development of the two nations of antiquity, Professor Cattell writes, summarising his own diagrams, we have a decline, not sudden, but the light fails towards the 5th century. The curve shows a rise towards the 10th century, increasing rapidity as it proceeds. There are three noticeable breaks. Thus in the 14th century, there was a pause followed by a gradual improvement in the extraordinary fruition at the end of the 15th century. There was a pause in progress until a century later. The latter part of the 17th century was a sterile period followed by a revival culminating in the French Revolution. For Europe generally, as for Great Britain, the latter half of the 18th century represents the unquestionable climax of genius. 238 individuals belonging to the 18th century altogether, as against less than 100 for the previous century. Professor Cattell's curve also shows the same general tendency for genius to become productive towards the end of each century, with the same very marked exception in the case of the 17th century. The fall here, Professor Cattell finds, extending to nearly every department of intellectual ability. In England, we might have been tempted to attribute the fall to the social disturbance caused by the civil wars, but since it was a general European phenomenon, except in Germany, where the 18th century expansion began earliest, this is impossible. It represents a period of rest between the unparalleled activity of the late 16th and early 17th century, and the still more unexampled intellectual energy of the 18th century. When the list of eminent persons had at last been completed, my task had still scarcely begun. 
It is my object to obtain as large a mass as possible of biological data, anthropological and psychological, so that I could deal with these persons of eminent intellectual ability as a human group and compare them with other human groups, normal and abnormal. I had somewhat too innocently assumed that the national biographers would usually be able to furnish the elementary data I required, whenever such data were extant. I soon realised, however, that the biographers were, with a few notable exceptions, literary men unfamiliar with biological methods, and that they had seldom of realised that biography is not a purely literary recreation, and that it demands something more than purely literary aptitudes. Method was, for the most part, conspicuously absent. If, for instance, one wished to know if an eminent man had or had not been married, it was frequently necessary to read through the whole article to make sure that one had not missed a reference to this point. When found, one was still left frequently in doubt as to whether or not there had been offspring of the marriage, and when no reference to marriage could be found, one was left in doubt as to whether this meant that there had been no marriage, or that the point was unknown, or simply that the biographer had forgotten to refer to the matter. This failure of precision in regard to so elementary a biographical fact introduced into the consideration of a very important matter, a margin of error, which I have had much difficulty in controlling, and it still remains considerable. Again, much trouble has been caused by the persistent vagueness of the biographers in describing the eminent man's position in his father's family. There is the distinct interest in knowing the size of the family from which the great man sprang and his precise position in that family. But the biographers, in possibly the majority of cases, use such expressions as eldest son, second son, youngest son, which tells us almost nothing. A brief personal description of the eminent man, once more, is always very instructive for biological purposes. And when the great man lived several centuries ago, the biographer is usually careful to reproduce any scrap of information bearing on this point. But no such care is shown in the case of the more modern persons concerning whom the information obtainable is still copious. And even when the biographer has personally known his subject, he omits, almost as a rule, to give any information regarding his personal appearance. These and the like imperfections might easily have been avoided, and the value of the dictionary immensely increased, had the editors adopted the fairly obvious device of issuing a few simple instructions to their fellow workers on the question of method. The greatest part of my labour has been due to these defects in the Dictionary of National Biography in respect to those biological data which necessarily form the central and most essential part of biography. In order to supplement the information furnished by the dictionary, I have consulted over 300 biographies, as well as many other sources of information in memoirs, personal reminiscences, etc. In regard to some of the more recent persons included, I have been able to fill in various facts from my own knowledge. As concerns eye and hair colour, I have made a systematic examination of several picture galleries, more especially the National Portrait Gallery. Having thus explained the nature of the data with which we have to deal, and the methods by which it has been obtained, we may now proceed without further explanations to investigate it. We have to study the chief biological characteristics, anthropological and psychological, of the most eminent British men and women of genius, here using the word merely to signify high intellectual ability. End of section 1. Section 2 of A Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2 Nationality and Race. The Determination of Place of Origin. Birthplaces of Grandparents, the Best Available Criteria. Relative Productiveness in Genius of England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. The Group of Mixed British Origin. The group of mixed British and foreign origin. Importance of the French element. Origins of eminent British women. The distinction of English genius according to counties. The genius of Kent. The regional distribution of English women of ability. The probable predominance of Norfolk and Suffolk in relative amount of ability. The three great foci of English genius. The English Anglican focus. The apparent poverty of London in Aboriginal genius. The southwestern focus. The Welsh border. The Anglo-Danish district, the psychological characteristics of East Anglican genius, the characteristics of the South-Western focus, the characteristics of the Welsh border, the significance of the position of Kent, the distribution of genius in Wales, the distribution of genius in Scotland, 
the distribution of genius in Ireland, the regional distribution of various kinds of ability, the distribution of scientific ability, the regional variations of scientific aptitude, the distribution of eminent soldiers, the distribution of eminent sailors, the distribution of artists, the distribution of dramatic ability, the possible modification of racial factors by environmental conditions. It is scarcely necessary to remark that nationality and race, when used as distinguishing marks of people who all belong to the British Islands, are not identical terms and are both vague. The races, however we may describe them, constituting the people of Great Britain, are to be found in all the main divisions of the two islands, and the fact that a man is English or Scotch or Irish tells us nothing positive as to his race. Some indication of race, however, is in many cases furnished if we know the particular district to which a man's ancestors belonged, and this indication is further strengthened if we can ascertain his physical type. In determining on a large scale the place of origin of men of genius, the usual method hitherto has been to adopt the crude plan of noting the birthplace. I have so far as possible discarded this method. From man's birthplace, obviously it tells us nothing decisive as to his real place of origin. It has seemed to me that a man's place of origin can most accurately be determined by considering the district to which his four grandparents belonged. If we know this, we know with considerable certainty in what parts of the country he is really rooted, and in many cases we can thus form an estimate of his probable race. I have expended a very considerable amount of time and trouble over this part of my inquiry, yet so vague, confused, or conflicting is often the available evidence that probably none of my groups of data contain so many slight inaccuracies as this. It is only in a very small proportion of cases, if when the information derived from the dictionary is supplemented, that I have been able to determine the origins of all four grandparents. I have usually considered myself fortunate when I have been able to tell where the father and mother came from, and have often been well content merely to find out where the father came from. Only in a few cases have I admitted the evidence of birthplace. London as a birthplace has been ignored altogether. When the facts are available, it is nearly always found that the parents had migrated to London. We may reasonably assume that this is probably the case when the facts are not available. It very rarely occurs, as in the case of J. Bentham, that even one grandparent belonged to London. In order to represent the varying values of this evidence, I have adopted a system of marks. If the four grandparents are of known origin, an eminent man is entitled to four marks. These marks being divided among the counties to which he belongs. When the evidence is less explicit, the marks are correspondingly diminished. By this method, I am able to give due weight to the very numerous cases in which the parents or grandparents belong to different parts of the kingdom. Every one of the 1,030 persons included in this inquiry may be definitely classed with at all events a fair degree of probability in one part or another of the British Islands. When this is done, we obtain the following results. English, 659, Welsh, 28, Scotch, 137, Irish, 63, Mixed British, 97, Mixed British and Foreign, 46. Omitting for the moment the individuals of mixed ancestry, we find that 74.2% are English, 3.1 Welsh, 15.4 Scotch and 7.1 Irish. If we take the basis of the present population and regard the proportion of eminent persons produced by England as the standard, Wales has produced slightly less than her share of persons of ability, Ireland still less and Scotland decidedly more than her share. As regards Wales, we have to bear in mind the difficulty of a language not recognised as a medium of civilisation. As regards Scotland, we probably have to recognise that intellectual aptitudes are especially marked among the Scotch, and also that the tendency has been fostered by circumstances, since as is well known, the lowland Scotch are almost identical in racial composition with the northern English, and there are no artificial barriers of language. On the other hand, the Irish have been seriously hampered by geographical and to some extent by linguistic barriers, as well as by unfortunate political circumstances in contributing their due share to British civilization. Mr. A. H. H. MacLean has shown, where we got our best men, London, 1900, that of some 2,500 British persons of ability belonging to the 19th century, 70% are English, 18% Scotch, 10% Irish and 2% Welsh. We thus find that by taking a much lower standard of ability and confining ourselves to the most recent period, Scotland stands higher than ever, while Ireland benefits very greatly at the expense of both England and Wales. This is probably not altogether an unexpected result. It is on the whole conferred by the analysis of British men of the time, 
made by Dr. Now Sir Conan Doyle, 19th century, August, 1888. Both Mr. McLean and Sir Conan Doyle adopted the crude test of birthplace. The somewhat higher place which they give to the Irish is, however, really confirmed by the analysis of my results. At an earlier stage of my inquiry, when the standard of ability adopted was higher, and the most recent group of eminent persons, those included in the supplement to the Dictionary of National Biography, had not been added, I found that the English contribution was larger, that the Irish smaller, than I now find it. It appears evident that possibly, with some lowering of the standard of ability, and certainly with the advent of modern times, the Irish contribution tends to reach a large proportion. When we turn to consider the 143 persons who are of mixed British or mixed foreign and British race, we find that they may be divided as follows. English and Irish, 33. English and Scotch, 30. English and Welsh, 25. Mixed British, other than above, 9. British and foreign, 46. In percentages, these results are English and Irish, 23. English and Scotch, 20.9. English and Welsh, 17.4. Other British, 6.2. British and foreign, 32.1. We here reach the interesting result that notwithstanding the extreme frequency of English-Scotch marriages and the very high proportion of ability among the unmixed Scotch, the English-Irish group stands, even absolutely above the English-Scotch group, while the English-Welsh group is still more largely out of proportion with the small pure Welsh group, and is not far behind the English-Scotch group. It would appear that, so far as ability is concerned, the Irish and the Welsh are much better adapted for crossing with English than are the more closely related Scotch. There are 46 persons in whom one or more elements of foreign blood are mingled with one or more British elements. These do not, of course, include all the foreigners who have played a part in English civilization, since no person of purely foreign blood was taken into account in the preparation of my list. This has, for instance, led to the omission of numerous early Normans like Beckett, some later French Huguenots like Romilly, and several eminent Jews. Even though the purely French persons of eminence are omitted, the French elements remain distinctly the most important. At least 17 of our 46 individuals of partially foreign origin have had a French parent or grandparent. Some of these were Huguenots. No account has been taken of ancestors beyond the grandparents, but a Huguenot ancestral element seemingly more remote than the grandparents is certainly of very frequent occurrence. I have noted it in 17 cases, and it certainly occurs much oftener. Other remote Huguenot elements, especially Walloon, Flemish, and Dutch, occur with only less frequency. German parents and grandparents occur ten times, the Dutch and Flemish occurring eight times are but a little behind, while five of our eminent persons were partially Italian. The exact combinations, with a number of times of their occurrence, are as follow. English and French, twelve. English and German, eight. English and Dutch, five. English and Italian, three. English and Flemish, two. Scotch and French, two. English, Irish, French and Swiss, two. English and Russian, one. English and Danish, one. English, Irish and German, one. Irish and French, one. Irish and Italian, one. Irish and Spanish, one. English, Irish and Italian, one. Scotch and Dutch, one. Irish and Austrian, one. English, Scotch and German, one. Welsh and Swiss, one. Welsh and Italian, one. There is much interest in considering separately the places of origin of the 55 eminent women on our list. Of these, 29 are English, 4 Scotch, 4 Irish, and 18 of mixed origin. The obvious points to note here are the very remarkable prevalence of women of mixed race in the proportion of 32%, instead of only 13%, as in the case of our eminent persons generally, and the rise of Ireland to equality with Scotland. When we analyse the 18 mixed cases, the same prevalence of the Irish element appears in a very much more marked form. The various mixtures are as follows. English and Irish, 8. English and Scotch, 2. English and Welsh, 2. English and French, 2. English and Italian, 1. English, Irish and German, 1. English, Irish and Italian, 1. English, Irish, French and Swiss, 1. Here we see that while the English element enters into every combination, in not less than 11 of the 18 cases, it is combined with an Irish element. The Scotch element reaches no higher level than the Welsh, and is even inferior to the French. Among our eminent persons generally, not more than 1 in 15 is Irish. Among the eminent women, more than 1 in 4 is Irish. While Scotland, which has produced relatively the largest share of eminent men, has produced relatively the smallest share of eminent women.
So far, we have been concerned solely with the distribution of our eminent ability in the main divisions of the United Kingdom. There is, however, much interest in determining the distribution of ability within these main divisions. The obvious and indeed the inevitable basis for this part of the inquiry is the division into counties. It is, however, a very awkward and inconvenient basis. The counties are very unequal in size, usually too small, and in most cases they correspond to no ancient boundaries. They have neither the historical significance of the ancient French provinces, nor the practical convenience of the modern French departments. The ancient English dioceses furnish, on the whole, a better basis, and one that for the most part corresponds to real ancient divisions. But it was obviously inconvenient and inadvisable to fall back on an extinct division of the country. It was necessary to be content with the country basis and to seek so far as possible to minimise its disadvantages. In the first place, English counties may be presented in accordance with the absolute number of elements of ability which each possesses. With no attempt to show the significance of the numbers, it will of course be remembered, and may be clearly seen by reference to Appendix B, that in consequence of the imperfection of our knowledge, these elements are of disparate value, so that while one individual may be counted four times, i.e. once for each of his grandparents, another may only be counted once. Most individuals are counted twice. Yorkshire, 90. Norfolk, 67. Devon, 56. Kent, 51. Suffolk, 50. Lancashire, 43. Lincolnshire, 37. Somerset, 30. Cornwall, 30. Gloucestershire, 28. Essex, 27. Warwickshire, 26. Shropshire, 24. Staffordshire, 24. Wiltshire, 24. Northumberland, 20. Worcestershire, 20. Derbyshire, 19. Cheshire, 19. Dorset, 19. Hampshire, 19. Buckinghamshire, 19. Northamptonshire, 18. Hertfordshire, 18. Herefordshire, 17. Oxfordshire, 16. Cumberland, 16. Nottinghamshire, 16. Leicestershire, 15. Cambridgeshire, 15. Surrey, 14. Westmoreland, 11. Sussex, 10. Durham, 8. Bedfordshire, 8. Berkshire, 8. Rutland, 6. Middlesex, 5. Huntingdonshire, 5. Monmouth, 3. The significance of these results is not quite obvious to casual inspection. We see that the origins of English ability are to be found all over the country, and we see also, as we should expect, that the large counties have reduced much ability and the small counties little. How can we ascertain the real significance of these figures? There are two methods we may adopt for ascertaining the significance of our figures. We may determine the amount of ability in each country in relation to its area, or we may determine it in relation to its population. The method of comparison which rests on ascertaining the relative amount of ability per square mile for each county is not so absurd in the case of a country like England as it may possibly seem at the first glance. To compare the ability per square mile of a county, like present-day Lancashire, covered with great towns, to an agricultural country like present-day Norfolk or Suffolk, would be obviously unfair to the latter. But we may remember that East Anglia was a populous manufacturing centre for many centuries, during which Lancashire resembled modern Cumberland. During the long history of England, the various counties had passed through many economic vicissitudes, and while some have doubtless succeeded in remaining throughout at a fairly medium level of populousness, others have had some periods been great centres of population, and other periods denuded of their inhabitants. Thus, when we put one period against another, the differences between the counties in average density of population are probably small, and it is by no means so absurd as to ascertain the relative amount of ability per square mile for the whole period as it would be for a single century. An even approximate determination of the amount of ability in relation to the population is obviously impossible for the whole period. We can only obtain it with certainty for the 19th century. I have thought it of some interest and probably of real significance as an aid to determining the problem before us to consider separately the eminent persons born during the 19th century, nearly all in the first half, and to determine what relation the elements they supply us with bear to the population of the various counties as revealed by the census of 1841. The basis of comparison seems to be fairly sound. 
though unfortunately the numbers for each county are necessarily so small that we cannot consider the results as absolutely conclusive when they are not otherwise confirmed. It must be added further that there is another source of error, the existence of which probably might not be suspected. Apart altogether from the rise and fall in population, a county may still exhibit a very marked fluctuation in its genius producing power. A very interesting and decisive example of this is furnished by Kent. On account of its proximity to the continent, Kent has, from the earliest periods, been a highly civilized county, and it has always been a populous one. It remains a populous and flourishing county at the present day. It has also been, as we shall see, very prolific indeed and genius. Yet at the present day, its ability-producing powers have almost ceased. It is associated perhaps more than any other county with the Renaissance in England. Caxton belonged to Kent. It was the home of Marlowe and Lely the two teachers of Shakespeare, as well as of Lineker and Harvey, who represent the English Renaissance on the scientific side. As at that period it was prolific in administrators, diplomatists, and soldiers. It was strongly royalist, and suffered greatly in the cause of Charles I. When Charles fell, Kent fell so far as genius producing power is concerned, and however it may continue to flourish in population and general prosperity, it has never regained its power to add largely to English ability. In the 16th and 17th centuries, its contributions to the elements of English ability are represented by the figures 15 and 16 respectively, relatively a very large proportion. By the 18th century, so fertile in ability, Kent is only responsible for the relatively small contribution of 11 elements, and in the 19th century its contribution is sunk to 4 elements, which do not include a single individual who was wholly Kentish. Yet, as we shall see, Kent stands almost, if not quite, at the head of all the English counties in its total contribution to English genius. Although no other county could be found to furnish so remarkable an instance of great intellectual fertility followed by intellectual decadence, without decrease in population and prosperity, this case is enough to show that we can by no means assume that the intellectual fertility of a country in one century is any certain index to its general intellectual fertility. I now present, side by side, the order of decreasing intellectual fertility into which four the counties our eminent men belong to when we consider the relative amount of the total ability for the whole period on the basis of area taken as about one thousand square miles and also the order into which the elements for the nineteenth century fall on the basis of the population of the counties in eighteen forty one a plus sign after the figures in the first column indicates that as the modern population of the county in question is very decidedly below the average for the county Generally, we probably ought to add a few units to the figures given. A minus sign indicates that, as the modern population is much above the average for the country generally, we probably ought to subtract a few units to reach a fair estimate. The sign of equality means that the population of the county approximates to the average for the country generally. Those counties which contain a proportion of elements of genius equal to more than 19 of the 1,000 square miles more than two per one hundred thousand inhabitants must be considered prolific and genius. A table is displayed on the following pages with two main columns the amount of ability in ratio per one thousand square miles and the amount of ability during the nineteenth century in ratio per one hundred thousand inhabitants. 1841. Amount of ability in ratio per one hundred square miles. Rutland, 40 plus. Suffolk, 33 plus. Kent, 32 minus, Norfolk, 31 plus, Warwickshire, 29 minus, Hertfordshire, 28 plus, Worcestershire, 27 minus, Buckinghamshire, 25 plus, Cornwall, 22 plus, Gloucestershire, 22 equals, Lancashire, 22 minus, Devonshire, 21 plus, Oxfordshire, 21 plus, Herefordshire, 20 plus, Staffordshire, 20 minus, Nottinghamshire, 19 plus. Dorsetshire, 19 plus. Northamptonshire, 18 plus. Leicestershire, 18 plus. Somerset, 18 plus. Shropshire, 18 plus. Cambridgeshire, 18 plus. Derbyshire, 18 equals. Surrey, 18 minus. Cheshire, 18 minus. Essex, 17 plus. Wiltshire, 17 plus. Bedfordshire, 17 plus. Middlesex, 17. Westmoreland, 14 plus. Yorkshire, 14 equals. Huntingtonshire, 13 plus. Lincolnshire, 13 plus. Berkshire, 11 plus. Hampshire, 11 plus. Cumberland, 10 plus. Northumberland, 9 plus. Sussex, 7 plus. 
Durham, 7 minus. Monmouth, 5 plus. Amount of ability during the 19th century in ratio per 100,000 inhabitants, 1841. Norfolk, 5.3. Herefordshire, 4.3. Oxfordshire, 4.3. Hertfordshire, 3.8. Worcestershire, 3.8. Westmoreland, 3.6. Dorsetshire, 3.4. Cumberland, 3.4. Warwickshire, 2.7. Cornwall, 2.6. Buckinghamshire, 2.5. Shropshire, 2.5. Northumberland, 2.4. Wiltshire, 2.3. Cambridgeshire, 2.3. Lincolnshire, 2.2. Suffolk, 2.1. Nottinghamshire, 2.0. Berkshire, 1.8. Devonshire, 1.5. Yorkshire, 1.5. Derbyshire, 1.4. Cheshire, 1.2. Gloucestershire, 1.2. Hampshire, 1.1. Leicestershire, 0.9. Somerset, 0.9. Lancashire, 0.8. Staffordshire 0.8, Essex 0.8, Kent 0.7, Sussex 0.4, Surrey 0.3, Durham 0.3, Bedfordshire, Northamptonshire, Huntingdonshire, Monmouth, Rutland 0. Middlesex omitted. If we consider the eminent women separately, we find that 11 English counties have produced more than one unit of ability. The absolute numbers are as follows Norfolk 9, Suffolk 5, Yorkshire 4, Hereford 3. Kent, 3. Northumberland, 3. Lancashire, 2. Worcestershire, 2. Shropshire, 2. Devonshire, 2. Cornwall, 2. The numbers are too small to make it worthwhile to attempt to ascertain the relative value of these figures. It is sufficiently clear that Norfolk stands first, and that Suffolk, a much smaller country, follows very closely after. Although the estimate of ability on the basis of the area of the counties is obviously only roughly approximate, while the more reliable method of ascertaining the proportion of to population during the 19th century suffers from the defect that it by no means necessarily indicates the amount of ability in previous centuries, and while both methods are hampered by the very small size of many of the counties, we may still reach certain conclusions by considering the two lists together. The counties that stand high on both lists have probably been highly productive of intellectual ability, those that stand low in both lists have probably been markedly unproductive. We may probably believe that the counties that have contributed most largely to the making of English men of genius are Norfolk, Suffolk, Hertfordshire, Warwickshire, Worcestershire, Herefordshire, Buckinghamshire, Cornwall, Dorsetshire, Oxfordshire, and Shropshire. To these we must certainly add Kent, since its total output more than compensates for its intellectual decadence during recent centuries. But we are perhaps scarcely justified in including Rutland, which, by a curious anomaly, appears at the head of the first list by the smallest and one of the most thinly populated of English counties. It cannot hastily be assumed that while these counties rank properly at the head of English counties from the intellectual point of view, there are not others which perhaps on a perfectly sound basis ought not to rank almost on a level with them. This would especially be so if we were to take quality of genius as well as quantity into consideration. It is probable that Somerset, Devonshire, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire and Essex should be included among those of the first rank, although the two associated East Anglican counties of Norfolk and Suffolk have a fairly assured position at the head. It will be noted that the results here reached in regard to the distribution of ability amongst English counties involve very high, not indeed the highest place, for Suffolk. Possibly the reader may be inclined to view this conclusion with suspicion should he chance to learn that the present writer, though having no personal connection with this county, happens to have been ancestrally connected with Suffolk during many centuries. Personally, I hope I have no sympathy with the bias of patriotism, for I recognise that, however useful sometimes in practical affairs, it is an unfailing sign of intellectual ill-breeding. But there is always a temptation to view with suspicion, which is often indeed justified. Any investigation of the present kind as probably affected by local patriotism. It may therefore be proper to assist the reader to reach a personal equation in this case by stating that the present writer was born in Surrey, and that his hereditary may be expressed in the formula. Suffolk, Hampshire, Durham, Suffolk. It may be added that while I had not anticipated the higher place which Suffolk would take as a contributor to British ability, that position is to some extent supported by the results of other impartial inquiries. Thus Mr. Maclean finds that Suffolk is among the six English counties, which, on the basis of population, contributed the largest number of eminent men to the Victorian period and places Ipswich first among the towns, excluding the large cities, which have been prolific in ability. 
Sir Conan Doyle, investigating men of the time, finds that Suffolk is among the three English counties that stand first in production of intellectual ability on the basis of population, and remarks that its intellectual productivity is quite phenomenal. It must be remembered that these inquiries were on the basis of birthplace, and that the East Anglicans show a marked tendency to emigrate westwards, and especially to London. In a large number of cases, they are credited to other districts. On the basis of these results, and taking into consideration also the special quality of the individuals as may be done by studying Appendix B, we come, I believe, to the conclusion that there are two or rather three great foci of intellectual ability in England, the East Anglican focus, the South Western focus, and the focus of the Welsh border. The East Anglican focus may, for the present purpose, be said to include not only Norfolk and Suffolk, but also the adjoining counties of Essex, Cambridgeshire and Hertfordshire, which, though inferior both in the quantity and the quality of their journeys to East Anglica proper, are still high in intellectual ability, which is nearly always of distinctly East Anglican type. These five counties form a compact whole among the eminent men who, so far as our knowledge sometimes limited, extends belong wholly to this region of Bishop Andrews, the Bacons, Thomas Cavendish, Chaucer, Constable, Cockman, Cowper, Cranmer, Flaxman, John Fletcher, Gainsborough, William Gilbert, Ghost Tist, the Littons, Nelson, the Newmans, Corson, Pussy, Ray, the Vares, Robert Walpole, and Walsley. Among those who belong in part to this region are Airy, the Arnolds, Barrow, Bradlaugh, Collett, Gresham, Stephen Hales, Charles Lamb, the Martineaus, Sir Thomas More, Patter, Sir Thomas Smith, and Walsingham. Ethnologically, it may be remarked, this focus is most recent of the three. East Anglica is a region very open to invasion. Brythons, Romans, Angles, and Normans all seem to have come here in large numbers, and it differs from every other English district, except to some extent in Kent, a country closely allied to it, in continuing to welcome foreigners, Dutch, Flemish, Walloon, French, all through medieval times, down to the revocation of the Edict of Nantes and the end of the 17th century. Middlesex with London lies on the borders of the East Anglican focus, with which probably of all the folk of English genius it is most intimately connected. It can scarcely, however, be included within the focus. The metropolis itself is excluded from our inquiry, partially because we are not taking the accident of birthplace into account, and partially because it seems impossible to find any eminent person who belongs to London, or even to Middlesex, through all his grandparents. Middlesex is poor in Aboriginal ability, even for a small county, and if we were to class it psychologically at all, I believe it would fall into the predominantly Saxon group of counties which includes Berkshire, Surrey, Sussex and Hampshire, a group which, as we shall see, constitute a district remarkably poor in Aboriginal ability. The marked prevalence of merely native ability in London and the marked efficiency of really Aboriginal ability are phenomena alike easy of explanation. Among the crowds who drift into every great metropolis, there are always many clever and ambitious people. Hence the number of able persons who are merely connected with a metropolis by the accident of birth, but a great metropolis swiftly kills those whom it attracts. Canty, Degeneration Amongst Londoners, 1885, page 19, very probably defined a Londoner as one whose parents and grandparents were born and bred in London, but during the four years in which he investigated this question, he was unable to find a single Londoner in this true and definite sense. Even those who were Londoners back to the grandparents on one side only were usually stunted or feeble, and unlikely to propagate. Dr. Harry Campbell, Causation of Disease, page 245, among 200 London-born children, found two or three whose parents and grandparents were born and bred in London, and these children were very delicate. The southwestern focus of English genius is the largest, and although in proportion to the population ability is here less prevalent than in the East Anglican district, in absolute amount, and perhaps even in importance, this region may perhaps be said to be the most conspicuous centre of English intellectual energy. I regard it as comprising the counties of Wiltshire, Somerset, Dorset, Devon and Cornwall. These counties, together with part of Hampshire, make up the whole of the southwestern promontory of Great Britain. The population of this region is marked by very much darker hair, and therefore much higher index of negrescence than the population of counties to east of it. The district is defended by Wensdyke and Borkley Dyke, one of the most important structures of this kind in Europe, and this fact indicates that the region was once arrayed against the rest of Britain. Pitt Rivers, 
has shown that this wall is of Roman or post-Roman date, possibly Saxon. A great focus of British genius is, taken altogether, unquestionably the oldest of the three foci which we may detect in England. We may call it the Geodelic Iberian Centre. It is well known that this region was the last stronghold of the early British power in England, when finally its power was broken in war, the Saxon invaders had become Christianized and settled peacefully side by side with the Aboriginal inhabitants. The people of this region were still described by King Alfred as Welsh kin, and the predominance of the Aboriginal element may still be detected in the characteristics of the genies of this region. Among the more eminent individuals who seem to belong wholly to this region are Roger Bacon, Blackstone, Robert Blake, St. Boniface, Clifford Coldridge, Dampier, Drake, St. Dunstan, Ford, Grockin, Hawkins, Hobbes, Hooker, John of Salisbury, Keats, Locke, Pym, Radley, Reynolds, Rodney, Alfred Stevens, Sydenham, Trevithick, Thomas Young. Among those who belong to it in part are Matthew Arnold, Bradley, Browning, Byron, the Cannings, Fielding, C.J. Fox, Froud, the Kingsleys, Huxley. The third focus, that of the Welsh border, includes the counties of Gloucestershire, Warwickshire, Worcestershire, Herefordshire, Shropshire and Cheshire. This selection of counties may possibly seem a little arbitrary, but it will be found to be so on turning to the anthropological map of the British Islands, as given, for instance, in Ripley's Races of Europe, founded on Beddoe's observations of the Index of Negrescence. These six counties form a dark haired borderland in western England against Wales, and the eastern enfolding to Warwickshire cannot be disregarded. Monmouth is properly excluded, as contribution to English genius is extremely minute. It was not even normally English until the time of Henry VIII. It still remains anthropologically Welsh, and the study of its surname shows, as Gubby states in his homes of family names, that it is even more Welsh than Wales. The counties here included in the Welsh border are all much more thoroughly anglicised, but Welsh was spoken in most of them until comparatively recent times, even in Gloucestershire, undoubtedly a very mixed county. The language of Shropshire has been described as English spoken in a foreign language. In Herefordshire, Welsh appears to be not quite extinct even yet. The whole of the district represents the mingling on one side of Welsh elements, on the other of Saxon and Anglican elements. It is not difficult to account for this mingling. When in the 8th century, Offer extended the limits of Mercia westwards, changing the name of the British town of Penguin to Shrewsbury, he adopted the policy of leaving on the land all the Britons who wished to remain. In more recent times, there has been a Welsh reflux eastwards, and the result is a fairly thorough assimilation of Welsh and English racial elements. The Welsh elements we must certainly regard as predominantly Brythonic rather than Geodelic, the latter people being mainly confined to the northwest and southwest districts of Wales. It may therefore be said that this Anglo Brythonic district of the Welsh border is intermediate in age between the recent East Anglican focus and the ancient southwestern focus. Among the more eminent individuals who belong wholly to the Welsh border are Alexander of Hales, Samuel Butler, Warren Hastings, Sir Thomas Lawrence, Shakespeare, Purcell, William Tenday, and Wedgley. Among those who belong to it in part are Robert Boyle, John Bright, Sir Thomas Brown, Clive, Charles Darwin, Fielding, Kevill, the Herberts, the Campbells, Landor, Macaulay, Mapp, William Morris, the Pens, Wedgwood, Wesley's, Wren, Wetterly. It will be noted that all three of the great folk of English intellect belong mainly to the southern half of the country, the most anciently civilised part, although within recent centuries at least, prosperous, and the most thinly populated. It must be added that nearly the whole of the northern part of England, from Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, and Derbyshire, through Yorkshire, well into the lowlands of Scotland, constitutes a large region, which although its intellectual elements are of no great density, presents its own peculiar anthropological characters. It is a predominantly Anglo-Danish part of England, containing the fairest population of the country. Its intellectual fertility is greatest in its northern portions, which now form part of Scotland, and at its southern border, where it blends with East Anglica. To this last district belongs Sir Isaac Newton, the supreme representative of Anglo-Danish genius. Apart from exact science and from scholarship, the Anglo-Danish district, in proportion to its size, has not produced many men in purely intellectual fields. Its children have usually been more remarkable for force of character than for force of intellect. Their stubborn independent temper involves an aptitude for martyrdom. Many religious martyrs came from this region, 
and the meteorologist Folks also. East Anglia is productive of great statesmen and great ecclesiastics. It is also a land of great scholars. At the same time, nearly half the British musical composers and more than a third of the painters have come from this same region. It has no aptitude for abstract thinking, for metaphysics, but in concrete thinking, in the art of treating science philosophically, it is easily supreme. Its special characters seem to be its humanity, its patience, its grasp of detail, its deliberate flexibility, combined with a profound love of liberty and independence. The characteristic English love of compromise is rooted in East Anglia. So typically English a statesman is Walpole, with his sound instincts in practical affairs belong to Norfolk, and Walsley belong to Suffolk. In spite, however, of the marked sanity and self-possession of the East Anglican, it may be added that while East Anglia has produced many of the best Englishmen, it has also produced a considerable proportion of the worst. Those who figure in English history, chiefly by virtue of their villainy, do not appear in my list, but it is notable that many of the great men who have come down to us from a somewhat flawed reputation belong here. Bacon is a typical example of the first rank. When we turn to the southwestern focus of English genius, we find ourselves among people of different mental texture, but of equal mental distinction. In positive intellectual achievement, they compare with the slow and patient people of East Anglia. While as brilliant personalities, they are in the very first rank. They are sailors rather than scholars, and courtiers, perhaps, rather than statesmen. They are innovators, daring freethinkers, pioneers in the physical and intellectual worlds. Rayleigh on both sides, a Devonshire man, is the complete type of these people. They are above all impressive personalities, aggressive, accomplished, irresistible, breaking rather than bending, without the careful foresight of the laborious and self-distrustful people of the East Coast. This district alone has furnished a third of the great sailors of Britain, and the most brilliant group were Drake and Hawkins and Gilbert as well as Rayleigh. The expansive Elizabethan age gave the men of these parts their supreme chance, and they availed themselves of it to the utmost. Great Britain's most eminent soldiers have not usually been English, but one of the most famous of all, Marlborough, belongs to this region. In the arts of peace, this southwestern focus shows especially well in painting. It cannot indeed be compared to the East Anglican focus in this respect, but Reynolds belongs to Devon, and is a typical representative of the qualities of this region on the less aggressive side, just as Ridley is on the more militant side, both alike charming and accomplished personalities. Both in the material and spiritual worlds, there is an imaginative exaltation, an element of dash and daring, in the men of this southwestern district, which seems to carry them through safely. The southwestern focus is not quite so homogeneous as the eastern group. Somerset, which is the centre of the focus, seems to me to present its real and characteristic kernel, especially on the purely intellectual side. We do not find here the dashing recklessness, a somewhat piratical tendency nor quite the same brilliant personal qualities as at the western part of the peninsula. The Somerset group of men are superficially more like those of East Anglia, but in reality with a very distinct physiognomy of their own. Like the rest of this region, Somerset is a land of great sailors, but the typical sailor hero of Somerset is Blake, and the difference between Blake and Rayleigh is significant of the difference between the men of Somerset and the men of Devon. Somerset has produced the philosophers of this region, Roger Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, and in more recent days, Bagholt and Huxley have been typical thinkers of the group. Hooker, the judicious, is among the men of Devon. They are not often scholars, notwithstanding the presence of the ever-memorable Hales, being prone to rely much on their own native qualities. One recalls a remark of Hobbes when charged with an indifference to books. If I read as much as other people, I should know a little as other people. Well, less concrete than the East Anglicans, these eminent thinkers have not the abstract metaphysical tendencies of the North British philosophers. They reveal a certain practical sagacity, a determination to see things clearly, a hatred of Kant and shams, a positive tendency, which is one of the notes of purely English thought, and may be said to have its headquarters here. The representative scientific men of this region is a brilliant and versatile Thomas Young, his luminous intelligence and marvellous intuition render him a typical example of genius in its purest form. It is easy to define the nature of the genius of the Welsh border. It is artistic in the widest sense, and notably poetic. There is a tendency to literary and oratorical eloquence, frequently tinged with religious or moral emotion, and among those who belong entirely to this district, there are no scientific men of the first order. 
This region has the honour of claiming Shakespeare, and it may be pointed out that it is difficult to account for Shakespeare without assuming in him the presence of a large, though not predominant, Celtic element. Landor, one of the greatest of English masters of Rose, comes in part within the Welsh border, as does Fielding, while Purcell, the greatest of English musical composers, also probably belongs to this district. Sir Thomas Brown, though only a Welsh borderer on his father's side, is very typical. Macaulay is characteristic of the Celt as historian. The presence of Mrs. Siddons, although the genius of the Campbell family is attributed mainly to their Irish mother, helps to indicate the characteristics of this region, which although it has produced fewer great personalities than the two main foci of English genius, has certainly had its full share in some of the very greatest. The part of the Welsh border in Darwin was small, but though he was more characteristically a son of the Anglo-Danish and East Anglican regions, it was probably not without its influence. It has already been made clear that the county of Kent constitutes a remarkable, though small, centre of English genius. I was formerly inclined to regard this very interesting district as dependent on the important East Anglican focus. I am convinced, however, that this is a mistake. If we carefully contemplate the eminent persons produced by Kent, it will be seen that they can be more easily affiliated, on the whole, to the southwestern than to the East Anglican focus. Harvey, for instance, the greatest of the Kentish men, resemble the southwestern people as much in intellectual temperament as by a short stature, dark hair and eyes, choleric constitution, he resembled them anthropologically. This seeming affinity of the genius of Kent to that of the southwestern promontory, though it cannot be said to be complete identity, may perhaps be regarded as one of the numerous facts which tend to invalidate belief. Widely prevalent a few years under the influence of several eminent historians and ultimately resting on some rhetorical expressions of Gildas, that the Romano-British inhabitants of Kent were entirely exterminated by the Teutonic invaders. Undoubtedly, however, the Teutonic element is considerable in all the southeastern part of England, as far westwards as Wilts. One is indeed tempted to ask whether it may serve to explain another psychological phenomenon which is elevated by the distribution of English genius. The Jutes came to Kent, the Saxons occupied the regions to the west of Kent. This district, including, with Kent and Essex, the whole of the light-herd populations of southern England, is occupied by the counties of Sussex, Surrey, Hampshire and Berkshire. Except in so far as Surrey is suburban to London, and profits by this proximity in all regions is comparatively bare of Aboriginal genius, Mackintosh observed, in his notable study of the psychic characteristics of British peoples, that the unmixed English-Saxon, unlike the Angle, and possibly unlike the Jute, is marked by mental mediocrity. One is tempted to ask whether this fact, if it is a fact, may be invoked to explain the result of the present inquiry as regards this region. I do not propose to consider in detail the distribution of ability in other parts of the British Islands, for the figures are here too small to yield reliable results. The distribution of ability in Wales, Scotland and Ireland is, however, so definitely confined to certain districts that a mere inspection of the crude figures suffices to give us, for each of these countries, a fairly close conception of their intellectual geography. In the case of Wales, the elements of ability are distributed as follows. Glamorganshire, 7. Denbighshire, 7. Montgomeryshire, 6. Radnorshire, 6. Flintshire, 3. Cardiganshire, 1. Pembrokeshire, 1. Merionshire, 1. Carmarthenshire, 0. It is not difficult to understand why a large, fertile and populous district like Glamorganshire, even leaving out of account its commercial and mining activities, should stand high in actual numbers, though it stands lower in proportion to area and very low in relation to population. It is more remarkable than Carmarthenshire, the largest wealth county, should show no traceable elements of genius. The really productive intellectual regions of Wales is comprised in Denbighshire, Montgomeryshire and Radnorshire. This is a fact of some interest when we recall the, the ethnological history of this region. Wales is a geodelic country, that is to say a country inhabited by the earlier Celts mingled with Aborigines, which appears to have been subsequently invaded by the Brythonic Ordovices. These formed a wedge in the country reaching to Cardigan Bay, leaving the geodels in the northwestern district, and as we may still observe in the map founded on the index of Nicrescence, in the southwestern district. But later still, probably soon after the departure of the Romans, a very vigorous stock led by Cunida, and speaking a tongue very closely allied to Gaulish, came from what is now the south of Scotland, and established themselves in the centre of the Ordovician region, where their leaders became the acknowledged ancestors 
of the Gowan kings and the best-known Welsh saints. The land compromised Redenshire, Montgomery Shire and southwestern Denmigshire, which is precisely the land which we have found to be the focus of Welsh genius. It is very difficult not to see here one at least and perhaps the chief of the factors which of course is this comparatively unimportant and thinly peopled region to be so productive in ability. In accordance with the comparative poverty of Wales in intellectual achievements during the earlier periods of subjection to England is the statement of Rice and Byron Moore Jones, the Welsh people, page 471. That from the people as a whole, hardly a voice comes during the centuries from the Norman conquest to the middle of the 18th century. They tilled their land, attended to their flocks and their herds, married and died in complete obscurity, without being in any great degree touched by the intellectual movements of the 16th and 17th centuries. These authors have ably expounded the causes of the intellectual decadence of Wales during the long period. The absolute figures of the ancestral elements of ability in Scotland are as follows. Midlothian, 28. Aberdeenshire, 26. Ayrshire, 21. Lanarkshire, 21. Fife, 15. Dumfrieshire, 14. Fordfrieshire, 12. Perthshire, 9. Haddingtonshire, 9. Rossshire and Cromatyshire, 8. Berwickshire, 8. Stirlingshire, 6. Argyllshire, 5. Englishshire, 4. Roxburghshire, 4. Renfrewshire, 4. Dunbartonshire, 3. Sutherland, 2. Orkney and Shetland, 2. Kincardshire, 2. Invernessshire, 2. Nairnshire, 2. Clackmannanshire, 2. Selkirkshire, 2. Wingtonshire, 2. Banffshire, 2. Kinrosshire, 1. Butshire, 1. Kethness, 1. Lidlithgowshire, 1. Peebleshire, 0. Kirkhardbrightshire, 0. It will be seen that the genius of Scotland has been mainly produced by the tract between the Cheviots and the Grampians. While, however, the whole of this district is prolific in ability, a narrow central belt has proved pre-eminently able to breed men of intellect. This belt runs from Aberdeen in a southwesterly direction through Forfair, Fife, Midlothian, with the surrounding district, and Lanark, including Glasgow. On reaching Ayr and Dumfries, it widens out, not extending beyond the English border westward into Galway. Aberdeen and Edinburgh have always been the two great centres of Scotch genius. If, however, we were to take into consideration the proportions of genius according to area and population in the various counties, this geographical distribution would appear less decisively marked. The upland counties, whether in or out of the highlands proper, appear poor and genius, and the lowland counties rich. But it must be remembered that the upland counties are also poor in population, and the lowland counties rich. So far as a rough comparison of the total amount of genius with the recent population can be considered as any indication of the true distribution of genius in Scotland, it would appear that both Aberdeen and Edinburgh really are very prolific in ability, and that Ayr, Fife, and even Sutherland are little, if at all, inferior intellectual ability, while well, Haddingtonshire Berwickshire and Dumfrieshire would appear to stand probably at the head. It would seem that even on a population basis, the dark-haired populations show a somewhat less intellectual fertility than the fair-haired populations. This question is obviously complicated by the language question, but it is noteworthy that Sutherland, which is as fair-haired in population as any part of Scotland, would appear to show a very high proportion of ability relatively to its population while Inverness, which is the darkest part of Scotland, stands very low, and Galloway, which is a very dark region, stands very much lower than the border countries, which are very fair. If this tendency prevails in Scotland, it is the reverse of the tendency which prevails in England, the not in Wales, where the darker haired districts seem on the whole to be more prolific in ability than the fair haired regions. Another point about the distribution of genius in Scotland, which may be noted, is that the quantity and quality of its ability tend to go together. Knox, Burns, and Scott, the three most famous Scotsmen, it is unnecessary to say the greatest, all belong to counties which would appear to be among the most prolific in ability. Turning to Ireland, we find that, as in Scotland, certain regions appear to be rich in genius, others poor, or even absolutely bare. The distribution is as follows. Dublin, 15. Cork, 10. Antrim, 9. Down, 8. Waterford, 6. Londonderry, 6. Kilkenny, 5. Clare 4, Westmeath 4, Tyrone 4, 
Wexford 3, Limerick 3, Kildare 2, Tipperary 2, Kerry 2, Galway 2, Mayo 2, Donegal 2, Armagh 2, Cavan 1, Carlow 1, Wicklow 1, Queen's County 1, Longford 1, Meath, Louth, Kings County, Sligo, Roscommon, Latrium, Fermanagh, Monaghan, 0. The predominance of Dublin in Ireland, it will be seen, is more decisive than is that of Midlothian in Scotland. It is, however, possible that this is due to a great ignorance of the ancestry of eminent Irishmen. In any case, however, it will be observed that the region of Ireland's chiefly productive inability is Leinster, with the adjoining portion of Munster, and closely following it Ulster. Both these districts, for we may consider them as separate, though they adjoin, as they are anthropologically distinct, the people of Ulster being much darker, have long been racially mixed. In the first district, Geodels and Brithons were both numerous, and various minor foreign immigrations have taken place here since. In comparatively recent times, it was chiefly in Waterford and Dublin that the French Huguenots of Ireland settled. Ulster, as is well known, received a large infusion of English and Scotch blood in the 17th century, and this admixture has very largely affected the character of the ability it has produced. It is, however, a mistake to suppose that the temperamental, sometimes rather aggressive energy of Ulster men is due solely, or even perhaps mainly, to English and Scotch admixtures, influential as these have been. There is neither in Alban nor in Ireland, we read in Lady Gregory's recession of the Great Irish Saga, an army that can put down the men of Ulster when once their weakness is gone and their anger is kindled. Giraldus Cambrensis also bears testimony to the vigour of the Aboriginal Ulstermen. The Saxon outsider is sometimes tempted to think that in many respects the modern men of Ulster are more Irish than the Irish themselves, and such an opinion finds support in the fact that as measured by the index of Nigrescence, Ulster anthropologically approaches Connaught. There can be no doubt, however, that English and Scotch elements, however largely admixed with Aboriginal elements, play a very large part indeed in the manifestation of Irish genius. It would be of some interest to classify our eminent persons into groups according to their activities and to note the district in which each group tends to predominate. Appendix B will enable the reader to examine into this matter for himself, as might be expected, politicians, divines, and men of letters abound in all parts of the kingdom. It is curious to note that great lawyers are also scattered over the whole kingdom with notable impartiality. While poets are to be found everywhere, they are distinctly more predominant in the south of England, and to a less extent in Wales and the Welsh border counties. But when we consider the origins of those English poets who are unanimously recognised to stand first, we find them scattered over the whole county as widely apart as possible. Chaucer probably in Suffolk, Spencer in Lancashire, Shakespeare in Warwickshire, Milton in Oxfordshire, Wordsworth in Yorkshire, Shelley in Sussex, Keats in Devon or Cornwall. In science, Scotland stands very high, Ireland extremely low. The distribution of scientific men is as follows. English 84, Welsh 2, Scotch 21, Irish 1, Scotch English 7, Scotch Irish 2, English Irish 1, English German 1, English Dutch 1. In order to realise the extraordinary predominance of the Scotch over the Irish continent, it must be remembered that until the present century the population of Ireland has been much larger than that of Scotland, and it may be noted that the one purely Irish man of science, Tyndall, was of original English origin. If we proceed to consider the distribution of English men of science in the four district ethnological regions in which reference has already been made, we find that six belong more or less to the East Anglican focus, five to the southwestern focus, four to the Welsh border region, and seven to the large Anglo-Dutch district. It is of interest to compare these results with those obtained by Galton in the case of his modern English men of science. English men of science, page 1821, he found that three-fourths were English. Of every ten, there were five pure English, one Anglo-Welsh, one Anglo-Irish, one Scotch, one included Anglo-Scotch, Scotch-Irish, pure Irish, Welsh, Manx and Channel Islands, one unclassed including mixture of English, French, German, Creole, Dutch, Swedish, etc. On analysis of the scientific status of the men on my list of remarks, it appeared to me that their ability is higher in proportion to their numbers among those of pure race. This may be said to be in agreement with my results, which necessarily deal with men of higher average order ability, but which show a very 
much smaller proportion of individuals of mixed race, though in part this difference may be accounted for by the greater precision of Mr. Gowan's information in relation to his cases. He further points out that the birthplace of his men of science is usually in towns away from the coast, and he presents a geographical diagram which shows the distribution. This diagram is of interest, for it shows with great precision the fallacy of birthplace as any true indication of the real distribution of ability. Nearly the whole of both these Anglican and southwestern folk of genius are in this diagram left bare of scientific ability. The whole of the eastern counties, Mr. Galton remarks, and the huge triangle at whose angles Hastings, Worcester, Exeter, or rather Exmouth, are situated of very deficient in Aboriginal science. That the deficiency is very far from being Aboriginal becomes sufficiently clear when we are careful to ignore the accident of birthplace in determining the origins of men of science. Psychologically, it is not difficult to detect a distinct character in English scientific genius, according as it springs from the Anglo-Danish district, or the East Anglian focus, or the Southwestern focus, although I am not aware that this has been pointed out before. The Anglo-Danish district may here be fairly put first, not only on account of the large number of scientific men it has wholly or in part produced, but also on account of the very high eminence of some among them. The Anglo-Dan appears to possess an aptitude for mathematics, which is not shared by the native of any other English district as a whole, and it is in the exact sciences that the Anglo-Dan triumphs. Newton is the supreme figure of Anglo-Danish science. It will be noted that he belongs to the East Anglican border, and by his mother is claimed by Rutland, a little county which, I am inclined to think, really belongs psychologically, perhaps ethnologically, to East Anglica. The combination of the Anglo-Dan and the East Anglican seems highly favourable to scientific aptitude. The abstracting tendency of the Anglo-Dane and the exaggerated independence of his character, with the difficulty he finds in taking any other point of view than his own, are happily tempered by the more cautious and flexible mind of the East Anglican. Darwin, who also belonged to the Welsh border, belonged in part, like Newton, to the East Anglican border of the English Danish district, and also somewhat remotely to Norfolk, a county which contains many Danish elements. The science of the Anglo-Danish district is not exclusively mathematical, and geology especially owes much to the Anglo-Dane. It will be remembered that geology was one of the first sciences to attract Darwin. The East Anglian is in scientific matters drawn to the concrete, and shows little or no mathematical aptitude. He is a natural historian in the widest sense. He delights in the patient collection of facts, and seeks to sift, describe, coordinate and classify them. In his hands, science becomes almost an art. Gilbert illustrates East Anglian scientific methods in the inorganic world. Ray in the organic, and Francis Bacon, though he cannot himself be classed among men of science, has in the Novum Organum and elsewhere presented a picture of a scientific method, as it most naturally appears to the East Anglian mind. It is not easy to see anything specific or definitely brythonic in the scientific activities of the Welsh border, and most of it may be said that there is some tendency for science here to take on a technological character and to become associated with the artistic crafts. The scientific men found here often belong only in part to the district, and many of them seem to possess the psychological characters of the southwestern focus. The scientific characters of the southwestern focus are quite clear, and definitely distinct from those of either the Anglo-Danish district or the East Anglian focus. What we find here is a mechanical impulse, and more especially the psychological temper, the instinct to seek out the driving forces of vital phenomena. It is on this account that Harvey, though of Kandish family, may be said to belong psychologically to this focus, and also Stephen Hales, though he belonged partially to Kant and partially to East Anglia. The great scientific physicians belong here, the surgeons of the East Anglian, with Sydenham at the head of the Glisson, Huxley again is a typical figure. Inventors are numerous, for the scientific men of this region have frequently been enamoured of practical problems, and just as they have been pioneers in the physical world, so in science they have sought rather to make discoveries than to formulate laws. Thus in astronomy we have Adams, and one of the greatest and most typical scientific men of this region was Thomas Young. When we consider the distribution of great soldiers, we find the following results. English 22, Welsh 3, Irish 4, Scotch 13. English Scotch 4, English Irish 2, Scotch Irish 2. Within England, 7 belong to the Anglo Danish district, 6 to the East Anglican focus, 5 to the Southwestern focus, and 4 to the Welsh border. 
In England itself, it will be seen, military genius is relatively less pronounced than in any other part of the British Islands. And what absolute numerical preponderance the English element possesses seems to be due exclusively to the earlier periods of English history. The line of great English generals apparently ended with Marlborough. The Scotch stand easily at the head. The Irish would take a much higher place a week if we consider the 19th century separately. When, however, we turn to the distribution of great sailors, a very different result is shown, and the position of English ability is more than is asserted. While England has produced as many as 29 great sailors, and two are Scotch, one English Scotch, one English Welsh, and none Irish. Within England, 11 belong to the southwestern focus, 10 to the Anglo-Danish district, more especially to its southern border in Lincolnshire, 4 to the East Anglican focus, and 4 to the Welsh border. The distribution of artists, including sculptors and architects as well as painters, is as follows. English 51, Welsh 3, Scotch 10, Irish 5, English-Welsh 1, English-Scotch 2, Scotch-Irish 1, English-French 2, English-German 2, English-Italian 1, English-Russian 1. With England we find that 18 are scattered over the large Anglo-Danish district, more than a third of these, however, belonging to the small county of Nottinghamshire, 12 East Anglian, 8 belong to the southwest, 6 to the Welsh border. The fertility of Nottinghamshire, a county not otherwise notably productive of genius in artists, is a phenomenon of some interest in view of the fact that Nottinghamshire was a great art centre in the 14th century. When its alabasters sent retables, screens and figure panels to all parts of Western Europe, Architectural Review, April 1903, page 143, it would be idle to see here the influences of tradition. We cannot suppose that there was any continuity of this kind between the 14th century alabasters and 19th century painters, and possibly of such continuity have been absolutely destroyed by the Reformation. The reasonable supposition is that we see here a native bent to art showing itself at one time in one form, at another time in another form. I have elsewhere, monthly review, March 1902, discussed some interesting points in the distribution of British artists and have shown how the painters of the East Coast differ essentially from those of the West. A very definite case of special distribution of ability, differing markedly from the distribution of ability generally, is furnished by great actors and actresses. So far as it can be traced, this distribution is as follows. English 23, Welsh 1, Irish 6, English Welsh 1, English Scotch 1, English Irish 6, English French 1, Irish French 1, English Irish, French Swiss 1, English Danish 1. It will be seen that the Scotch virtually do not appear at all, and that the relative preponderance of the Irish is enormous. Our knowledge of the ancestry of actors is peculiarly vague and uncertain, and it is highly probable that if our knowledge on this point were more precise, the preponderance of the Irish element at the expense of the English element would be still greater. The distribution of actors within England, so far as we are able to trace, it further illustrates the poverty of the more specifically English districts and dramatic ability of the high order. Four of our great actors and actresses belong more or less to the southwestern focus, four to the Welsh border, three to the East Anglian focus, and only two to the whole Anglo-Danish district. I do not propose to discuss here the various causes which have led to the special distribution of genius in the British Islands, and to the variations in distribution shown by different kinds of genius. While many of the characters thus revealed are evidently due to racial characteristics, it will be rash to assume that they may all thus be accounted for. We have also to take into account the environmental conditions. It is not easy to make an exact comparison on the basis before the 19th century. Careful study of the condition of England made by Joseph Fletcher, Secretary of the Statistical Society on the basis of the census of 1841, conveniently enables us to make various comparisons for this period, and we may be fairly certain that the conditions then prevailing had existed during a considerably earlier period. When, on this basis, we examine the various counties, there would appear to be a tendency to correlation between fertility and genius and 1. Amount of real property per head of population, 2. Deficiency of persons of independent means, 3. Amount of ignorance, Norfolk is among the seven most ignorant counties, while Suffolk and Hertfordshire are also among the ignorant counties, 4. Committals for serious offences against the person, Norfolk, is at this period the most criminal country in this respect, being in relation to population 80%, above average, while Huntingdonshire, with little genius, has the least criminality, being 63% below average. 5. Bastardy, 
the four counties with largest proportion of illegitimate children being Cumberland, Hereford, Norfolk and Nottinghamshire. On the other hand, there appears to be no tendency to correlation between fertility and genius and one, offences against property, excluding the malicious group which are included in offences against the person, two, assaults, three, improvident marriages, four, pauperism, five, density of population, six, crime, general commitments, seven, amount of deposits and savings banks per head of populations. While well, such comparisons are at various points of much interest and possibly of real significance, it must be remembered that, though it is highly probable that there is a real connection between genius and the conditions prevailing in its environment, we must not here too hastily assume such a connection. It may be added that we should also have to take into consideration the conditions prevailing in the birthplaces of men of genius, which are not always the places of their origin. End of section 2. Section 3 of A Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3. Social Class. Status of parents of British men of genius, upper class, yeomen and farmers, clergy, medicine, law, army, navy, miscellaneous professions, commercial classes, crafts, artisans and unskilled, the parentage of artists, the parentage of actors. How far change has taken place in the social composition of the genius producing class? Comparison of the genius producing classes with the ordinary population. In considering to what social classes the 1,030 eminent British men and women on our list belong, we naturally seek to ascertain the position of the fathers. In 201 cases, it has not been easy to pronounce definitely on this point, and I have therefore omitted these cases as doubtful. The remainder may be classed with a fair degree of certainty. I find they fall into the following groups. Upper class or good family, 154, 18.5%. Yeomen and farmers, 50, 6%. Church, 139, 16.7%. Law, 59, 7.1%. Army, 35, 4.2%. Navy and sea generally, 16, 1.9%. Medicine, 30, 3.6%. Miscellaneous professions, 65, 7.8%. Officials, clerks, etc., 27, 3.2%. Commercial, 156, 18.8%. Crafts, 77, 9.2%. Artisans and unskilled, 21 2.5%. In some 30 cases, the status of the father is entered under two heads, but as a rule, it has seemed sufficient to state what may be presumed to be the father's chief occupation at the time when his eminent child was born. In the order in which I have placed the groups, they may be said to constitute a kind of hierarchy. I place the yeomen and farmers immediately after the upper class group, although at one end, this group includes the peasant farmer. Until recent years, the man who lived on the land which had belonged to his family for many centuries, occupied a position not essentially different from that of the more noble families, with somewhat larger estates around him. Even at the present day, in remote parts of the country, it is not difficult to meet men who live on the land on farms which have belonged to their ancestors through several centuries. Such aristocrats of the soil, thus belonging to old families, frequently have all the characteristics of fine country gentlemen, and in former days the line of demarcation between them and the upper class must often have been difficult to draw. I have formed my upper class group in a somewhat exclusive spirit. I have not included in it the very large body of eminent men who are said to belong to old families. These I have mostly allowed to fall out as doubtful, but there is good reason to believe that a considerable proportion really belong to the class of small country gentlemen on the borderland between the aristocracy in the narrow sense and the yeoman and farmer class. To this class, therefore, must be attributed a very important part in the production of the men who have furnished the characteristics of British civilization. The same must be said of the clergy, who may place next, because they are largely drawn from the same racks and have the whole led very similar lives. With the clergy I have included 32 ministers of religion belonging to various denominations. The religious movements of the past century have, altogether, transformed the lives of the clergy, but until recent years, the parson was usually simply a country gentleman or farmer somewhat better educated and more in touch with intellectual tastes and pursuits. The proportion of distinguished men and women contributed from among the families of the clergy can only be described as enormous. 
In mere number, the clergy can seldom have equaled the butchers or bakers in the parishes. Yet only two butchers and four bakers are definitely ascertained to have produced eminent children, as against 139 parsons. Even if we compare the church with the other professions with which it is most usually classed, we find that the eminent children of the clergy considerably outnumber those of lawyers, doctors, and army officers put together. This preponderance is the most remarkable when we remember that, although I have certainly included eminent illegitimate children of priests, it is only within the last three and a half centuries that the clergy have been free to compete in this field. It is of interest to note that genius is not the only form of mental anomaly which is produced more frequently by the clergy than by any other social class. The clerical profession, as Lagodon Down pointed out in many years ago, also produces more idiots than any other class. Law, medicine, the army, and navy furnish contingents, which, though very much smaller than that of the church, are sufficiently important to be grouped separately, but all the remaining professions I have thrown into a single group. These are artists, painters, sculptors, engravers, architects, 20, actors, etc., 16, musicians, composers, etc., 9, men of letters, 6, schoolmasters, 7, engineers, surveyors, and accountants, 4, men of science, 3. Although so few of the fathers of eminent men can be described professionally as men of letters or men of science, it must be added that in a considerable number of cases, literary or scientific aptitudes were present in the parents. We now reach a group of altogether different in character. Trade is a group of great magnitude, but its size is due to the inevitable inclusion of a very large number of avocations under a single heading. These avocations range from banking to innkeeping. The bankers evidently form the aristocracy of the trading class, and a remarkable number, considering the smallness of the class, not less than twelve, may have been the father's eminent sons. Under the rather vague heading of merchants we find twenty-five, and there are at least nine manufacturers, wine merchants, brewers, vinters, publicans, and other connected with the sale and production of alcoholic liquors, have yielded as many as sixteen distinguished sons, who have often attained a high degree of eminence, from Chaucer to Joel. Tea and coffee are only responsible for one each. There are eight drapers, mercers, and hosiers, and six tailors and hatters. Grocers and a great number of other shopkeeping trades count at most three or four eminent men each. It is perhaps noteworthy that at least four Lord Mayors of London have been the fathers of distinguished sons. Only one of them, Gresham, attained fame business, the others becoming men of letters and scholars. It must be added in regard to this group that in a certain number of cases the particular trade or business for the father is not specified. The group which I have denominated crafts is closely related to that of trade, and in many cases it is difficult or impossible to decide whether an occupation should be entered under one or the other head. But speaking generally, there is a very clear distinction between the two groups. For success in the essentially commercial avocations is involved, above all financial inability. The crafts are essentially manual, and success here involves more in the qualities of the artist than of the tradesman. Just as the banker is the typical representative of commercial transactions, so the carpenter stands at the head of the crafts. There seems to be something peculiar in the life or aptitudes of the carpenter, especially favourable to the production of intellectual children. For this association has occurred as many as thirteen times, while there are four builders, no other craft approaches the carpenter in this respect. There are five shoemakers, five cloth workers, five weavers, all belonging to the early phase of industrial development before factories, five goldsmiths and jewellers, four blacksmiths while many other handicrafts are mentioned once or twice. Finally, we reach the group of parents engaged in some unskilled work, and therefore belonging to the lowest social class. It is the smallest of all the groups, and though including some notable persons, it can scarcely be said to be a pretty eminently distinguished group. As many as eight of the parents were common soldiers, the rest mostly agricultural labourers. It may be interesting to inquire whether our eminent men, when grouped according to the station and vocation of the fathers, show any marked group characters. Whether, in other words, the occupation of the father exercises an influence on the nature and direction of the intellectual aptitudes of the son, to some extent, it does exercise such an influence. It is true that there are eminent men of very various kinds in all these groups, but there is yet a clearly visible tendency for certain kinds of ability to fall into certain groups. It is not surprising that there should be a tendency for the son to follow the profession of the father. Nor is it surprising that a great number of statesmen should be found in the upper-class group. 
Men of letters are yielded by every class, perhaps especially by the clergy, but Shakespeare, and it is probable, Milton, belong to the families of yeomen. The sons of lawyers, one notes, even to a greater extent than the eminent men of upper-class birth, eventually find themselves in the House of Lords, and not always as lawyers. The two groups of army and medicine are numerically close together, but in other respects very unlike. The sons of army men form a very brilliant and versatile group, and include a large proportion of great sailors. The sons of doctors do not show a single eminent doctor, and if it were not for the presence of two men of the very first rank, Darwin and Landor, they would constitute a comparatively mediocre group. Painters and sculptors constitute a group which appears to be of very distinct interest from the point of view of occupational hereditary. In social origin, it may be noted, the group differs strikingly in constitution from the general body, in which the upper class is almost or quite predominant. Of 63 painters and sculptors of definitely known origin, only two can be placed in the aristocratic division. Of the remainder of seven are the sons of artists, 22 the sons of craftsmen, leaving only 32 for all other occupations, which are mainly of lower middle-class character, and in many cases trades that are very closely allied to crafts. Even, however, when we omit the trades, as well as the cases which the fathers were artists, we find a very notable predominance of craftsmen in the parentage of painters, to such an extent, indeed, that while craftsmen only constitute 9.2% among the fathers of eminent persons, generally, they constitute nearly 35% among the fathers of the painters and sculptors. It is difficult to avoid the conclusion that there is a real connection between the father's aptitude for craftsmanship and the son's aptitude for art. To suppose that environment adequately accounts for this relationship is an inadmissible theory. The association between the crafts of builder, carpenter, tanner, jeweller, watchmaker, woodcarver, rope maker, etc., and the painter's art is small at the best, and in most cases non-existent. Nor, on the other hand, is there any reason, whatever, to conclude that the fathers have acquired manual dexterity which their sons have inherited and put to finer use. Without reverting to the hypothesis of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, we may well suppose that among craftsmen there is a natural selection of individuals possessing special dexterity of hand, and this tendency to manual skill would tend to be inherited. Such a supposition would adequately account for the phenomena which made us in the present investigation, that there is physical selection in occupation we know to be the case, so that, as Bido has shown, butchers tend to be fair and shoemakers to be dire. It may be noted that Ariat, Psychologie de Pientier, 1892, Chapter 11, in investigating the hereditary of 200 eminent European painters, reached results that are closely similar to those I have reached in my smaller, purely British group. He found that very few were of upper-class social rank, and these not usually among the most important, while nearly two-thirds of the whole number were found to be the sons either of painters or of workers in some art or craft. He refers to the special frequency of jewellers among the fathers. I may remark that in my list, working jewellers and watchmakers occurred twice, a small number, but relatively large considering that there are only three fathers of this occupation in the total parentage of British men of ability. The group of painters and sculptors differs widely, as we have seen, so far as the social and occupational status of their fathers is concerned. From the general composition of the whole group of eminent persons, the group of actors and actresses, however, reverses altogether the conclusions we reach from contemplating the entire group. While good social class and literally cultivated life among the parents would seem on the whole to be of deciding advantage for the production of eminent offspring, among actors and actresses, low and obscure birth would seem to be a positive advantage. At least three or four were illegitimate children, while in numerous other cases we are led to infer that this was probably the case. Of the thirty whose origin is known, four and probably more, a very large proportion considering the smallness of the unskilled class can be set down as the children of unskilled labourers or common soldiers. Eleven are the children of actors, while the rest mainly belong to miscellaneous often somewhat unskilled occupations. Only six can be assigned to the whole group of professions, excluding the actor's profession, and only one can be said to belong to the upper class. Booth being the son of an impoverished squire with aristocratic connections, it is not difficult to account for this state of things. The somewhat unbalanced and excessively impressionable nervous system, which is apt to result from illegitimate birth or birth under abnormally bohemian conditions, the poverty, irregularity, and manifold changes of occupation to which so many great actors and actresses have been subjected in early life, 
usually among varied and often low social strata the absence of training and education and formal knowledge and conventional conduct combined with the abundant opportunity of becoming familiar with the most naturally dramatic section of the community all these and other characteristics which have tended to mark the early lives of great actors and actresses would tend to fit them for the histrionic profession and to unfit them for any other field in which natural ability may be shown there is some interest in considering separately the eminent persons in my list any one in number who died in the period during which the dictionary of natural biography was being produced and are therefore included in the supplement these may be expected to give us some indication as to the direction in which we may now look for our eminent men so far as can be judged however from so small a group the social composition remains exactly the same the aristocratic element is still very large the most notable difference is that commerce represented by eighteen individuals has gained on the church which is represented by only eleven the church has fallen to the proportion of less than fourteen per cent the general proportion of the church for the whole period being sixteen point seven per cent and commerce has risen to over twenty two per cent as against eighteen point eight wherever the relative ability producing powers of the clergy and the commercial classes have changed or whether as is possible the clergy now constitute a smaller and the commercial classes a larger element in the general population is a question i do not undertake to answer the quota produced by the medical profession has relatively risen and that produced by the legal profession fallen barely represented by one individual most significant is the fact that the crafts instead of producing over nine per cent they have not produced one of this latest group of eminent men while unless the reticence of the national biographers is at fault the artesian and unskilled classes have been equally unproductive it would appear that the ability producing powers of the community are being narrowed on what is mainly a mixed aristocratic and commercial basis in order to realize the significance of our results it is necessary to bear in mind the class constitution of the ordinary population in great britain according to the anthropological committee of the british association this may be stated as follows professional classes 4.46 per cent commercial classes 10.36 per cent industrial classes 10.9 per cent artesians 26.82 per cent laborers 47.46 per cent the comparison with the class of ability producing persons is interesting we have two pyramids but the base of the one corresponds with the apex of the other the same inverted relationship existing harmoniously throughout the aristocratic class which forms the foundation of the ability producing pyramid though this fact is slightly disguised by the omission from my list of hereditary peers forms the fine and invisible apex of the pyramid constituted by the ordinary population the professional class which often in close association with the artistic class forms the great bulk of the one pyramid still merely appears as the apex of the other the commercial class also bulks more largely in the ability producing pyramid but to a much less extravagant extent the industrial class or craftsmen which comes in the middle furnishes about the same proportion in each case while the artisans and laborers who form nearly three-quarters of the general population appear among the ability producing persons as a vanishing point almost as negligible as the aristocratic class is among the general population this is not altogether an unexpected result though it has not before been shown to hold good for the entire field of the intellectual ability of a country maclean's statistical study of the origins of british men of ability during the nineteenth century shows that twenty six per cent of those of known origin were sons of aristocrats officials etc sixteen per cent were sons of clergymen fifteen per cent sons of farmers tradesmen artisans etc nine per cent of military and naval officers nine per cent of businessmen five per cent of medical men four per cent of lawyers etc the results was almost identical when the one hundred men of preeminent ability were considered separately c h cooley annals of american academy may eighteen ninety seven investigated the point in regard to a group of distinguished european poets philosophers and men of letters and found that forty five belonged to the upper and upper middle classes twenty six to the lower middle class and only two to the lower class odin in a laborious though not always very illuminative study of french genius genes des grands hommes volume two table thirty one found that six hundred twenty three talented people of letters so far as the position of their parents was known could be classed as nobility twenty five point five per cent magistrature thirty per cent liberal professions twenty three per cent middle class eleven point six per cent industrial class nine point eight per cent 
Galton, among 107 English men of science. English men of science, 1874, page 22, found, as might be anticipated, that the aristocratic element was smaller, only 8.4%, by the allied professional class, army, navy, civil service, church, medicine, law, etc., accounted for as much as 48.5%, while the commercial class furnished nearly all the rest, 40.1%. One is tempted to ask how far the industrial progress of the 19th century, the growth of factories, the development of urban life, will alter the conditions affecting the production of eminent men. It seems clear that, taking English history as a whole, the conditions of rural life have, from the present point of view, produced the best stocks. The minor aristocracy and the clergy, the gentlemen of England, living on the soil in the open air, in a life of independence at one laborious and leisurely, have been able to give their children good opportunities for development, while at the same time they have not been able to dispense them from the necessity of work. Thus, at all events, it has been in the past. How it will be in the future is a question which the data before us is in no way help to answer. So far as can be seen, the changing conditions of life have as yet made no change to the conditions required for producing genius. Life in the old towns, formerly fertile in intellectual ability, towns like Edinburgh, Norwich, Ipswich and Plymouth, was altogether unlike life in our modern urban centres, and there is yet no sign that the latter will equal the former in genius producing power. Nor is there any sign that the education of the proletariat will lead to a new development of eminent men. The lowest class in Great Britain, so far as the data before us show, has not exhibited any recent tendency to a high yield of genius, and what production it is accounted for remains rural rather than urban. End of section 3section 4 of a study of british genius by havelock ellis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter 4 hereditary and parentage the tendency to hereditary and intellectual ability inheritance of ability equally frequent through the father and mother mental abnormality in the parents size of the families to which persons of eminent ability belong Normal standards of comparison. Genius producing families tend to be large. Men of ability tend to be the offspring of predominantly boy producing parents. Women of ability perhaps tend to belong to girl producing parents. Position in the family of the child of genius. Tendency of men of ability to be youngest or more especially eldest children. The age of the parents of eminent persons at their birth. Tendency to disparity of age in the parents. The hereditary of intellectual genius has been very fully discussed, with special reference to eminent persons by British birth, by Mr. Francis Galton, especially in his hereditary genius. With perhaps even an excess of zeal, for persons of somewhat minor degree of ability have sometimes been taken into account, Mr. Galton has shown that intellectual ability has frequently tended to run in families. If this hereditary tendency is by no means omnipresent, the present data prove conclusively that it is a very real factor. Notwithstanding that the effects of hereditary position have been so far as possible excluded, and that our lists only contain persons of pretty eminent ability, distributed over fifteen centuries, it is yet found that among these one thousand thirty persons there are forty one groups, or two or three individuals in each group, who are closely related. The recognized relationships of father and son, the Arnolds, Bacon, and his two sons, the Boyles, the Cannings, the Coleridges, the Copleys, the Grenvilles, the Littons, the Matthews, the Mills, the Pens, the Pitts, the Wellpoles, the Wilberforces, brother and brother, the Herberts, the Lawrences, the Napiers, the Nasmiths, the Newmans, the Scots, the Veres, the Wesleys, the Wordsworths, brother and sister, the Arns, the Carpenters, the Kembles, the Martinos, Rossettis, sister and sister, the Bronts, the relationship between grandchildren and grandparents, between uncles or aunts and nephews or nieces, is best shown in a table. A table is displayed on the page with three columns. The first column descending a list of names, the second column titled Maternal Grandfather, and the third column Maternal Grandmother. It will be observed that Darwin has a unique distinction of possessing within the narrow degrees of relationship here recognised both a paternal and a maternal ancestor of the high degree of eminence required for inclusion in my list. 
The table just presented is of considerable interest because it helps us to answer the question as to the degree in which genius may be inherited in the female line. A consideration of direct hereditary has no bearing on this question. A man inherits genius from his father more often than from his mother, for the simple reason that genius is rare in women. We reach a juster conclusion if we consider those cases in which the hereditary is one degree removed, and then note whether it is transmitted more often in the male or in the female line. All such cases in my list are included in the table just given, and we are thus enabled to see that, considering the smallness of the numbers with which we are dealing, the sexual petition of the hereditary is as equal as we could possibly hope to expect. A man is just as likely to inherit ability through his mother as through his father. It will be noted that in the case of the four poets included in this table, Don, Sidney, J, Bailey, Beddoes, the hereditary was in every case maternal. This would at first sight seem to confirm the conclusion of Mobius that a poet's hereditary is from his mother. It must be added, however, that in most of these four cases there was also an unusual degree of ability in the father, while only in one case was the eminent maternal relative a poet. It is held by some that artistic genius is very rarely inherited in any high degree. Thus Max Muller wrote, Autobiography, page 34, It seems almost as if the artistic talent was exhausted by one generation or one individual, and he specially instances of the rarity of eminent musicians who are the children of eminent musicians. The case of the Bucks been no true exception since music before J.S. Bach was usually simply a kind of craft. It is true that not a single eminent musical composer, not a large group, be it noted, occurs in the list of related persons given above, but there are representatives of other arts, though not to a notably large extent. It is probable that whatever truth lies in the statement that high artistic ability is not inheritable may be reproduced to the larger statement that talent is more inheritable than genius. The distinction between genius and talent is, however, one that is extremely difficult to make, and we shall not be concerned with this question in the present volume. It is scarcely necessary to remark that in a very large number of cases, the pre-eminent persons in our list were nearly related to eminent persons who have not reached the degree of distinction entitling them to appear in the list. Here an objective test is less easy to apply. The test I have adopted is the statement of the national biographers in referring to such relationship. The results of an inquiry on this basis distinctly confirm the results already reached as the equal inheritance of intellectual ability on the paternal and maternal sides. Avoiding any summation of the results until the two lists of eminent relations were finally completed, it was found that the numbers on each side were exactly equal. On the father's side, there were 44 intellectually eminent relations, not including the father himself, and an exactly equal number on the mother's side. It is scarcely necessary to point out that these numbers do not even approximately represent the total number of eminent relations, for relationship to one eminent person often involves relationship to a whole family of eminent persons. They merely serve to show that when the eminent near relations of an eminent man are impartially noted, such relations are just as often through the mother as through the father. I have also noted every case in which it is stated or implied that one or other, or both of the parents, possessed an unusual amount of intellectual ability by no means necessarily involving any degree whatever of eminence. These cases are very numerous, and as such ability may often have been displayed in very unobtrusive ways, it must frequently have escaped the attention of the natural biographers. In 150 cases the father showed such ability, in 89 cases the mother is noted as of unusual ability, or else has been closely related to some person of eminent ability presumed to have transmitted intellectual aptitude, whether or not she showed marked signs of such aptitude herself. In 21 of these cases, both the father and the mother probably transmitted intellectual aptitudes. Over 20% of our 1,030 eminent persons have certainly inherited intellectual aptitudes. Bearing in mind that in many cases the aptitudes of the parents are unknown or have passed unnoticed, and that in other cases the natural biographers have failed to record known facts, it is not improbable that the proportion of cases in, in which one or other of the parents of our 1,030 eminent persons displayed more than average intellectual ability may be at least doubled. A more probable estimate of the real frequency of hereditary may be obtained by considering separately the very recent and better known individuals who appear in the supplement of the Dictionary of National Biography. Of the 81 eminent persons thus incorporated in my list who died while the dictionary was in progress, it is found that in the case of 33, 
the father, the mother, or both are noted as being persons of unusual ability. This is equal to a proportion of about 40%, or the proportion in which, on independent grounds, I have already suggested as representing the probable amount of inherited ability. Even for the modern group, however, we must still suppose the data to be incomplete. From another point of view, the consideration of this modern group is of interest in the light it throws on the question of hereditary. I find that among the 38 able parents of the 33 eminent persons who may be supposed to have inherited ability, the sexual division comes out as exactly equal. That is to say, that there are 19 able persons and 19 able mothers. This would seem to indicate very clearly that although that superlative degree of ability which is commonly termed genius is rare in women, Yet a more than average degree of ability in the mother is just as important, from the point of view of intellectual hereditary, as a more than average degree of ability in the father. Among modern English scientific men, Galton, Englishman of Science, page 72, has also found that ability is just as likely to be inherited through the female as through the male line. Among 100 scientific men, on the paternal side, he found 34 grandfathers and uncles of ability, on the maternal side, 37. As in my results, there would seem to be an excess if any, on the maternal side. In determining the parents who possessed ability, I have taken no note of the cases in which it is merely said that the father or the mother possessed poetic tastes, musical tastes, etc., but only of those cases in which it is clearly stated or implied that there was unusual ability. Such ability, in most cases, by no means involved recognised distinction. As a matter of fact, only one of the 81 had a parent of the same degree of eminence as himself, i.e., sufficiently eminent to be included in my list. So while the proportion of eminent persons with an able parent approaches one in two, the proportion of eminent persons possessing a parent equally distinguished with themselves is only one in 81. This proportion of eminent parents is shown not to be very far astray by reference to the whole body of individuals on my list, among whom there are 15 possessing a parent of sufficient eminence to be included in the list, or about one in 70. If we lowered the standard distinction demanded in the parents, the proportion would of course be raised. It would be interesting to inquire into the moral and emotional qualities, the character of the parents. This, however, is extremely difficult, and I have not attempted it. In a great many cases, the mother was a woman of marked pity, and we are frequently led to infer an unusual degree of character, sometimes on the part of the mother, sometimes of the father. Moral qualities are quite as essential to most kinds of genius as intellectual qualities, and they are, perhaps, even more highly transmissible. They form the basis on which intellectual development may take place, and they may be transmitted by a parent in whom such development has never occurred. The very frequent cases in which men of eminent intellectual ability have declared that they owed everything to their mothers have sometimes been put aside as the expressions of an amiable weakness. It requires some credulity, however, to believe that men of preeminent or even less than preeminent intellectual acuteness are unable to estimate the character of their own parents. The frequent sense of adeptness to their mothers expressed by eminent men may be taken as largely due to the feeling that the inheritance of moral or temperamental qualities is an even more massive and important inheritance than definite intellectual aptitudes. Such inheritance coming to intellectual men from their mothers may often be observed, where no definite intellectual aptitudes have been transmitted. It is not, however, of a kind which can well be recorded in biographical dictionaries. I have not therefore attempted to estimate its frequency in the group of preeminent persons under consideration. I have, however, attempted to estimate the frequency of one other form of anomaly in the parents besides intellectual ability. The parents of persons of eminent intellectual power may not themselves have been characterized by unusual intellect, but they may have shown mental anomaly by a lack of aptitude for the ordinary social life in which they were placed. In at least 57 cases, or over 5%, we find that the fathers were extravagant, unsuccessful in business, shiftless, idle, drunken, brutal, or otherwise fell into bad habits and neglected their families. In such cases, we may conclude the father has transmitted to his eminent child an inaptness to follow the beaten tracks of life, but he has not transmitted any accompanying aptitude to make new individual tracks. This list could easily be enlarged if we included milder degrees of ineffectiveness. A certain degree of inoffensive eccentricity, recalling Parson Adams, seems to be not very uncommon among the fathers of men of eminent ability, and perhaps furnishes a transmissible temperament on which genius may develop. It may be noted that six of the near do well fathers, a very large proportion, belong to eminent women. This may be simply due to the fact that the near do well father, by forcing the daughter to leave home or to provide for the family, furnishes a special stimulus to her latent ability. 
In 403 cases, I have been able to ascertain with a fair degree of certainty the size of the families to which these persons of eminent ability belong. A more than fair degree of certainty has not been attainable owing to the loose and inexact way in which the national biographers frequently state the matter. Sometimes we are only told that the subject of the article is the child or the son. This may mean the only child, but it is impossible to accept such a statement as evidence regarding the size of the family, and the number of families with only children may possibly thus have been unduly diminished. Again, the biographers, in a very large number of cases, ignore the daughters, and from this case again, their statements become valueless. In estimating the natality of the families producing children of ability, I have never knowingly reckoned the offspring of previous or subsequent marriages so far as possible. We are only concerned with the fecundity of the two parents of the eminent persons. So far as possible, also, I have reckoned the gross fecundity, i.e. the number of children born, not the number of children surviving. In the case of a large number of eminent men, this gross fertility is known from the inspection of parish registers. In a certain proportion of cases, it is probable, however, that we are only dealing with the surviving children. On the whole, the ascertainable size of the family may almost certainly be said to be under the mark. It is, therefore, the more remarkable that the average size of genius-producing families is found to be larger than that of normal families. The average size of our genius-producing families is 6.5. In order to effect an exact comparison with normal families, I have looked about for some fairly comparable series of figures, and am satisfied that I have found it in the results of an inquiry by Mr. F. Howard Collins concerning 4,390 families. These families furnish an excellent normal standard for comparison. They deal mainly with Anglo-Saxon people in England and America. Of the middle and upper classes, they represent, with probably but very slight errors of record, gross fertility. They are apparently not too recent, and they betray little evidence of the artificial limitation of families. The main size of Collins' group of fertile families is found by Pearson to be 4.52 children. This conclusion as to the abnormally large size of the families from which genius tends to spring may be criticised in two directions. It may be argued that there has been no recognition of the possibly larger size of the normal family in the earlier periods, which my list covers. It may be said further that even the size of the modern normal family has been underestimated. It is unnecessary to speculate concerning the average size of the normal family in former days until definite evidence is brought forward, but I may point out that the large size of genes producing families holds good even when we only take into account the 19th century persons on my list. If, for instance, we consider separately 39 individuals from the supplement to the dictionary concerning whom I have definite data, it is found that the average size of the families is 5.7, and 9 out of the number belong to families containing from 9 to 17 children. I may add that an earlier stage of my inquiry, see Popular Science Monthly, April 1901, page 598, I found that the size of the families from which British men of genius spring was still larger than the present average of 6.5, being nearly 7, 6.96. The reduction in size is due in part, it would seem, to the large number of persons of comparatively minor ability who have since been added, and perhaps in part to a tendency to slightly decreased size among the families from which have spun the quite recent individuals contained in the Dictionary of National Biography. In regard to the correct estimation of the average size of the normal family, it must be said that while my results for British genius-producing families are without doubt distinctly too low on account of the imperfection of the data, yet every estimated the average size of the normal family, although found on much more complete data, it was an average decidedly below 6.5. Thus and so found, the average size of the family counting all children born alive among the English professional classes to be about 5, more precisely, clergy, 5.25, legal 5.18, medical 4.82. See Ansel on the rate of mortality and other statistics of families, 1874. Galton found the mean of 204 marriages, 4.65 children. Pearson, the mean of 378 fertile marriages, 4.7 children. A very interesting table is given in Mrs. Henry Sigwick's Health Statistics of Women Students of Cambridge and Oxford and Their Sisters, 1890. Mrs. Sidgwick found that these students, 566 in number, belonged to families of which the average size was as high as 6.8 children. It must be said that this result is slightly fortiated by the inclusion of 70 half-brothers and sisters. 
One is inclined to look upon the result as necessarily presenting the normal average for the families of the class for which these students spring. It must, however, be borne in mind that these figures refer largely to the early days of the higher educational women. We may be fairly certain that a considerable portion of these students were women of unusual intellectual ability, and that in numerous other cases they belonged to families in which the brothers showed high ability. The result, therefore, represents not the average fertility of the professional and other classes which these students spring, but is complicated by the considerable admixture of the special ability producing group of the population with its high fertility. This interpretation is clearly supported by Mrs. Sedwick's tables. She has presented separately the results of a large group containing the honours students, and we are hereby enabled to discern the notable fact that the honours students belong to decidedly larger families than do the students generally. In students generally, the six children families constitute the largest group. For the honours division, the eight children group is the largest, while very large families are relatively much more frequent among the honours division than among the division of other students. So that, for instance, while among honours students exactly the same number belong to 11 children families as do two children families, among the other students, more than twice as many belong to two children families as to 11 children families. Mr. Sidwitz's results may therefore be said to confirm the results reached in the present investigation. It may be added that the greater fertility which has been shown to mark the families from which British persons of ability in general have sprung has already been shown by Galton to mark the special group of families from which modern British men of science spring. Galton found, English men of science, that the average number of brothers and sisters, excluding for the most part those who died in infancy, was 6.3. This indicates, as we should expect, a decidedly higher fertility than in the families producing the women's students, though probably not higher than would have been shown by the British ability producing families generally, had my data been more complete. Yoder, in studying the early lives of fifty eminent men of various nationalities belonging to the 18th and 19th centuries, A. H. Yoder, Boyhood of Great Men, Pedagogical Seminary, October 1894, found the average number of children in the families from which they sprang, excluding half-brothers and sisters, was six plus. This approximates to the results here reached as regards British eminent men only. It will be seen that the high fertility which we have found among the ability producing families stands in opposition to the well-known tendency to small families among the higher human races, and to the universal tendency, well marked at the present day, for a falling birth rate to be associated with a rising level of civilization and well-being. Within the same nation also, the families of the poorer classes are larger than those of the richer classes. Thus, in Holland, at the present day, both in town and country, the average number of children per marriage in the poorest class is 5.19 against 4.5 for the rich class. It would, however, be a mistake to suppose that our results can properly be regarded as unexpected. They are, on the contrary, in harmony with all that we know concerning the fertility of the families producing the nervously abnormal classes, which is on the whole decidedly high. Toulouse, Casas de la Folle, 1896, page 91, has summarized the evidence accumulated by Boyle and Ries, as well as by Marandon de Montel, showing that the size of the families on which the insane spring is decidedly larger than the usual average. Professor Magri, Li Famigli del Quali Disen Contono, e Delinquenti, Arc di Psychiatria, 1896, Fes 6 to 7, has further shown that this abnormally great fertility is by no means confined to insanity producing families, but also characterizes the progenitors of numerous other mentally abnormal groups, as he found that criminals in the majority of cases spring from large families, and that although the average size of the normal family in Italy is three or four, it was very rarely possible to find a criminal who belonged to a family of only two or three children. Magri also found that hysteria and neurasthenia are notably frequent in large families. Langdon Down had previously pointed out mental afflictions of childhood, then imbeciles and weak-minded children tend to belong to large families. He found the average number of living children in the families containing idiots to be as high as seven. In Berlin Kassel was lurked the Unterschung der Geistig Minderwinkten Schalkinder, 1901, found that the average size of the families from which defective children spring is over seven. Comparing in more detail the composition of our genius producing families with the normal average, we obtain the following results. The graph is displayed on the page with two tables, with two rows and eight columns each. 
explain the size of the family compared to normal families and genies producing families. Unless, as is scarcely probable, the mental eccentricities of biographers lead to a very frequent selection of definite lines, it will be seen that in genies producing families, there is an invariable deficiency of families below the average normal size, and a gradually increasing excess of families above that size. In the larger size group of 14, the excess becomes extravagantly large. This, however, may be partially accounted for. Probably the biographers have here less seldom failed to record the size of the family, so this group may have been more carefully recruited from the families of our 1,030 eminent persons. Even on this basis, however, it remains extremely large. Ansel found that in 2,000 marriages there was no family of more than 18 children, and in Denmark it is stated a family of 22 children only occurs once in 34,000 marriages. An interesting point and one which can scarcely be affected at all by any twist in the biographical mind, is the fact that our men of ability, the women are here excluded, are the offspring of predominantly boy-producing parents. Taking the 180 families in which the number of boys and girls in the family is clearly stated, excluding those 29 in number, which are known to consist only of boys, we find that there are about 6 boys to 5 girls, or more exactly 121 boys to 100 girls. The normal proportion of the sexes at birth at the present time in England is about 104 boys to 100 girls. It is in accordance with this predominantly boy-producing tendency of families yielding men of genius that the families yielding women of genius should show a predominantly girl-producing tendency. Here indeed, our cases are too few to prove much, but the results are definite enough as far as they go. Putting aside the families consisted only of girls, the sexual ratio is almost reversed. There are about 6 girls to 5 boys or more exactly the ratio of 79 boys to 100 girls. We find that among the children of parents producing an eminent man, there are 55% boys to 45% girls. Among the children of parents producing an eminent woman, there are only 45% boys to 54% girls. Putting the matter another way, we may say that, while in every 10 families from which men of genius spring, the boys predominate in 6 families, and the families from which women of genius spring, the boys predominate only in about 3. Ansel found in England, as has Gessler in Saxony, that there are normally a larger number of boys in large families than in small families. In families of one to five children, he found the proportion of males to females, 1,033 to 1,000. In families of six to ten children, 1,075 to 1,000. In families of 11 children over, 1,083 to 1,000. It will be seen, however, but that this tendency is by no means sufficiently marked to furnish a sufficient explanation a large predominance of boys in the families producing eminent men, nor will it account for all but their apparently large excess of girls. This, however, being based on only a small number of cases in the families producing eminent women. I may add that while not an all-sufficing explanation, the tendency pointed out by Ansel is evidently a real factor in this peculiarity among the families producing men of ability. I have found it holds good within the limits of the families producing men of ability, Taking at random 25 families with five or fewer children, I find that the girls are in an absolute and decided majority, while in another series, taken equally at random, of 25 families containing eight or more children, males are to females to the proportion of 130 to 100. It is possible that some light is thrown on the prevalence of boys in large families by the facts observed among animals. It is believed by many authorities that excess of maternal nourishment tends to produce females and it has also been found that mares over 14 years of age tend to produce colts. Veterinarian, 1st of August, 1895. In large families, maternal nourishment would tend to be decreased by much childbearing. It is noteworthy, although I have not systematically investigated this point, that the interval between the birth of the eminent person and the previous child is often very short. Yoder, who was specially attended to this point, found that in the 26 cases in which the point could be ascertained, the interval was 22.87 months while the average time in the family for 30 cases was 25.36 months. This suggests that it is possible that the maternal exhaustion which tends to produce males also tends to produce children of eminent ability. It may be said on the whole that this excessive boy-producing tendency of the families which produce men of genius is really the result of the combined action of a number of factors, each of which, occurring separately, tends to produce a slighter but still abnormally large excess of boys. Not only would it appear that large families, and families which the children follow very rapidly, tend to yield a large excess of boys, but observations on man and other animals indicate that an undue excess of males is also found when the age of the father is unduly advanced. See, e.g., A.J. Wall, Lancet, 1887. 
when the age of the mother is unusually advanced, when the disparity of age between the parents is unusually great, and when the parents live in the country and are occupied in country pursuits. All these conditions which favour the production of boys have also, as we have seen or shall see, favour the production of genius in Great Britain. For a study of the facts and theories bearing on the excessive male births, see A. Rauber de Ubuschus and Neighbour Burton, unsigned biologisch Bedu Tung, 1900. I have made a tentative effort to ascertain what position in the family the child of genius is most likely to occupy. In a large number of cases, we are only told of his position as a son, not as a child. These are, of course, excluded. In order to investigate this point, I considered the families of at least eight children, and subsequently those of at least seven children, and noted where the genius child came. This showed a very abnormally large proportion of eminent first children, and also abnormally few second and third children. Suspecting that certain peculiarities of the biographical mind, needless to enter into here, since we are not investigating the psychology of biographers, may have somewhat affected this result. I have confined myself to a simple inquiry less likely to be affected by any mental tendencies of the biographers. In families of different sizes, what relation do eldest genius children and youngest genius children bear to genius children of intermediate position? The results are very decisive, and are shown in the following table. A table is displayed on the page, with four columns, with the size of the family, and the position of eminent child as eldest, intermediate, and youngest. It would appear that there is a special liability for eldest and youngest children to be born with intellectual aptitudes, the liability being greater in the case of the eldest than of the youngest, for there are altogether 94 eldest children to 67 youngest children, the intermediate children numbering 148 or 30% are eldest children, 21% youngest children, and 47% intermediate. It will be seen that while the eldest and youngest children of ability absolutely outnumber those of intermediate position, notwithstanding the large average size of the families producing children of ability and the consequently much greater number of chances possessed by the intermediate children as a group, the chances of the eldest attaining eminence as compared with the chances of the youngest are not the same throughout. In the small and medium sized families, it is the oldest who most frequently achieves fame. In large families, it is the youngest. It may be added that if we were to take into consideration the survivors of a family only, or the net fertility of the youngest children, would occupy a still more conspicuous position. The predominance of eldest children and youngest children among persons of genius accords with the results reached by Yoder in studying the international group of 50 eminent men. American Journal of Psychology, October 1894, page 146. He found the youngest sons occurred oftener than intermediate sons and eldest sons oftener than youngest. Galson and his inquiries as to the recent British men of science reached the same result, finding 36 intermediate sons, 15 youngest sons and 26 older sons. Galton, English men of science, page 33 to 34. It must be added that this result is absolutely in accordance with what a consideration of other mentally abnormal groups would lead us to expect. Sir Arthur Mitchell appears to have been the first to point out many years ago, Edinburgh Medical Journal, January 1866, that among idiots the youngest born and especially the oldest born largely predominate over the intermediate children. He found that among 433 idiots and imbeciles, 31% were first born children and 20% last born. It will be seen that the proportion of eldest and youngest children among Mitchell's idiots and imbeciles is almost identical with the proportion found among British persons of genius. Langdon Down, Mental Affections of Childhood, confirmed this conclusion. As regards the tendency of both eldest and youngest children to be imbecile and Shuttleworth, British Medical Journal, 17th November, 1900, page 1446, has confirmed it so far as youngest children are concerned. Criminals have also been found to be in undue proportion first-born children. L. Winter, States Hospital Bull, 1897, page 463, as quoted by Nake. And Dugdale found that the first-born child tends to be a criminal, and the last-born a pauper. It would appear, C. E. G. Moll, under Schussenchen, Iber die Libido Sexualis, B. D. I. Page 19, that there is some ground for believing that sexual inversion tends especially to appear among eldest and youngest children. It may be added that, according to Sir J. Humphrey, in Racing Stable's opinion, is not favourable as regards first things. It is interesting to find that the same points have been brought out as regards normal school children, 
This question was specially studied in its wider bearings at Professor Starbuck's suggestion by Mr. G. S. Wells among a large number of children at San Jose, California. G. S. Wells, a study of the order of the birth of children, 1901. I am indebted to Professor Starbuck for enabling me to see this study in MS. The children were investigated by trained observers, and their position notices regards weight, height, weight discrimination, reaction time, voluntary action, ability, endurance, mental ability, neatness, and deportment. In nearly all these respects, it was found that eldest children tend to show best, and the youngest children, while inferior to eldest, were superior to intermediate children. Out of numerous curves, 14 show the first group highest, 6 the last group highest, and only 2 the intermediate group. The tendency to nervous abnormality in first-born children would seem to be further indicated by the observations of Miss Carmen. American Journal of Psychology, AP, 1899, that first-born boys are more sensitive as estimated by the Temple Algometer than second or subsequent children, and also found the first-born boys are strongest with the Dynometer. MacDonald, Boston Medical and Surgery Journal, 1st of August, 1901, found that first-born men and women are more sensitive to pain than second-born. I may remark that I had been impressed 25 years ago by the tendency of men of genius to be oldest-born children though I was not then acquainted with Galton's investigations. It appears to be a popular belief. H. Campbell, Causation of Disease, page 262, combats this belief, that the first-born child is inferior. Shandy said the eldest son is the blockhead of the family. On the other hand, there are popular beliefs in the other directions, thus in Northern Iceland, Zeitschrift für Ethnologie, 1900, Heft. 2 and 3, page 74, it is believed that the first-born child, whether boy or girl, surpasses the others in strength, stature, beauty, wisdom, virtue, and good fortune, and in olden times, the oldest child possessed certain privileges not accorded to the others. These conflicting popular beliefs are fully accounted for by the actual facts. The eldest-born represents the point of great variation in the family, and the variation thus produced may be in either direction, useful or useless, good or bad. Whenever it has been possible, I have noted the age of the father at the birth of his eminent child. It has been possible to ascertain this in 299 cases, and the data thus obtained may be considered as, as fairly free from fallacy, so far as the biographical mind is concerned, though we may be sure that the biographers would not neglect to mention the two or three known cases in which the age was extremely youthful or advanced. The range of age is considerable, from 16, the age of Napier, of Murchison's father, at his son's birth, to 79, the age of Charles Leslie's father, the periods of potency in the case of the fathers of persons of eminent ability, thus ranging over 63 years. The 299 cases may be grouped in five-year average periods as follows. A table is displayed on the page with four columns, with the age of the fathers, under 20, 20 to 24, 25 to 29, 30 to 34, and 35 to 39. 40 to 44, 45 to 49, 50 to 54, 55 to 59, 16 over, and is compared with the number of fathers and the percentages. It will be seen that the most frequent age of fatherhood is from 30 to 34, but there are two separate years of maximum frequency, 34 and 36, each with 19 cases. A prevalence of elderly fathers seems indicated by the fact that the general average falls later than this maximum, being 37.1 years. For one father who begets an eminent child before the age of maximum paternity, which is also, we may assume, the age of maximum general vigour, there are nearly three who beget an eminent child when that age is past. This result is a more significant when we remember that we are chiefly dealing with the upper social classes, for it is in their cases that these facts are most easily ascertained, and that we must probably exclude the recent tendency to retardation of the age of marriage. I have thought that it may be of interest to separate from the main body the 100 most recent of the eminent persons on my list, all born in the 19th century, and to consider how the ages of their fathers are distributed. The result is as follows. A table is displayed on the page. We have columns of our age and number. The most frequent age is 34, but the average age is 37, being almost equal to the average for the fathers of the whole group. So that this factor in the biographical constitution of the genus group would appear to be fairly uniform throughout, and independent of social and economic changes, except that the age of the fathers has perhaps tended, in the course of time, 
to become slightly lower. Although this decrease in age is very trifling, it appears to be confirmed by the results yielded if we make a separate group of the 71 individuals born before the 18th century, the age of whose fathers I have been able to determine. The distribution is as follows. The table is on the page with the age and the number. The most frequent age here, taking the years separately, is as low as 25, but on the other hand, the average age is slightly higher than that for the general group, being 37.2. It is possible that the slightly higher age, very trifling as it is, indicates a real tendency. Further we go back, the higher becomes the intellectual average of the individuals we are dealing with, and there is some reason to suppose that with such an average intellectual level, the average age of the fathers is also higher, and the range of variation is greater. Such trifling fluctuations would be negligible if they did not at all point in one direction. I may refer to another indication which helps to confirm the conclusion that when we are dealing with a group of men of very high intellectual eminence, the average age of fathers is slightly higher than when we are dealing with a group of lower eminence. On separating into a distinct group, all those eminent men on my list are also included in the first 300, i.e. the most eminent section of Professor Kettel's 1,000 most eminent persons in history. See Ant, page 8. We obtain a group of 37 individuals who are without doubt of a higher level of intellectual ability than the general average of the British group. The age of the fathers of the preeminent men in this special group is as high as 37.7 years. The ages of the fathers of Galton's recent British men of science, in 100 cases, were distributed as follows. 20, 1, 25, 15, 30, 34, 35, 22, 40, 17, 45, 7, 50, 4. The average was 36. The results as regards this group may very fairly be compared with the results reached concerning the contemporaneous group of 100 from my list, which has been severally calculated. It will be seen that in the more mixed and more in a British group, as might be anticipated, the variations are greater. There are a larger proportion alike of younger and of elderly fathers. In Yoda's group of 39 fathers, the men of various nationalities, whose average eminence was of higher degree than mine, are much higher than Galton's. The numbers are too small to bear much weight. They were distributed as follows, with an average age of 37.78 years. Another table is displayed on the page, with an age range of 20 to 60. The most notable point here, as compared with either Galton's results or mine, is the marked efficiency of fathers under 30. It will be noted that the average age of the fathers in Galton's, mine, and Yoder's groups rises progressively, 36, 37.1, 37.78, with the intellectual eminence of the group. It may well be that this is not a casual coincidence. The tendency of all the fathers of men of genius to be elderly had, as Yoder points out, already been noted by Lombroso. Man of Genius, page 149. According to Ansel, on the Brood of Mortality, etc., 1874, the average age of fathers of the professional allied classes, estimated as a length of a generation, i.e. the difference between the age of the father and son, is 36.6. The average tells us nothing concerning the range of variation, but it may be observed that this normal average approximates to that obtained in the most nearly normal groups of ability we are here able to compare. I have no other data concerning the normal age of the fathers of the professional and upper classes in modern New England and in any case, we could not be sure how far such data could be comparable with that presented by our group of eminent persons, which is spread over many centuries. The influence of the age of the fathers in various normal and abnormal groups of the population has been most carefully and elaborately studied by Marrow in North Italy, in his Caratteri di Delinquenti, and more recently in La Puberta. Mandel regards fathers below the age of 26 as belonging to the period of immaturity. The period of maturity is from 26 to 40, and the period of decadence from 41 onwards. He found among the normal population that 9% fathers belong to the first period, 66% to the second, and 25% to the third. Among the fathers of criminals, there was an increase both the immature and decadent fathers at the expense of the mature, while among the insane fathers there was a similar but more marked increase of immature and decadent fathers. In studying the age of the fathers of school children, Marrow found that while children of good intelligence are mostly the offspring of young fathers, those of the highest grade of intelligence are mostly the children of middle-aged and elderly fathers. 
we found also that the highest proportion of the very defectively intelligent children belonged to elderly fathers aristotle had long said before that the children of very young or very old people are imperfect in mind or body we may slightly modify that ancient dictum by saying that the children of such people tend to be abnormal i have only been able to ascertain the age of the mother in eighty-six instances in these cases it is distributed as follows a table displayed on a page of the age of the mother the number of cases and the percent the average age of the mothers is thirty one point two years taking the years separately we find that there are only three mothers at the age of twenty five and only two at twenty six or there is a sudden rise to ten at the age of twenty seven representing the chief maximum there is however a secondary maximum of eight cases at thirty and again also of eight cases at thirty three on the whole it will be seen the ages of the mothers exhibit the same tendency to late parenthood which marks the fathers instead of falling earlier as we should expect the age of maximum frequency for the mothers falls in the same five years as for the fathers and the number of mothers who have reached the sexually advanced age of forty is nearly as large as a number as those below the age of twenty five this is the more remarkable since the predominant tendency of our men of ability to be first-born children will lead us to expect a corresponding predominance of young women among their mothers in Gelden's one hundred cases of mothers of modern british men of science the average age was thirty and the distribution was as follows tables displayed on the page with the age groups for under twenty 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 five thirty thirty five forty and forty five it will be seen that in my list of mothers of british persons of ability the intellectual eminence being greater than in galton's there is a comparative deficiency of young mothers indeed for all ages under thirty five and a very marked excess of elderly mothers while the average age also is higher than in galton's he would have found the average age of the mothers in his group to be twenty nine point eight but he is only able to bring forward twenty cases marrow in his study of the ages of the mothers of north italian criminals insane school children etc found that the relations that existed between the different groups were very much the same as in the cases of the fathers the influence of the age of the parents on their children as regards various kinds of mental and nervous ability has been investigated in california by mr r s Holloway, and i am indebted to professor starbuck for enabling me to see mr Holloway's study in m s the age of parents its effects upon children a thesis presented at the department of education leland stanford junior university nineteen o one it was found that while in most physical quantities the children of mature parents tend to come out best in mental ability the children of young parents tend to show that at an early age but rapidly lose their precocity the older children who show best tend to be the parents of mature and old parents the exceptionally brilliant children show a tendency to be the offspring of old parents the children of elderly mothers show a tendency to superiority throughout ansell found that the normal age of mothers in british professional and allied class estimated as length of a generation is as high as thirty two point three years but in the absence of information as to distribution we cannot determine the significance of this result among the general population of poor class collins practical treatise of midwifery found the most frequent age of maturity in ireland where early marriages are common was between twenty five and twenty nine the average age being twenty seven in edinburgh and glasgow however matthews duncan fecundity fertility stability and allied topics second edition eighteen seventy one found the average age in a similar class of the population to be above twenty nine the distribution being as follows tables played on the page with the age groups and percentages with age grouped as below twenty then twenty to twenty five to thirty to thirty five to forty to forty five and fifty it will be seen that this distribution closely corresponds with that the mothers of galton's men of science but shows much fewer cases as the higher ages than does my group the conclusion then among the parents of our men of genius there is an abnormally large proportion of elderly mothers is confirmed by the normal data furnished by robertson j robertson essays and notes on the physiology and diseases of women eighteen fifty one page one hundred ninety three he found that among ten thousand pregnant women in manchester only four point three per cent were over forty i e were at least in their forty first year from a consideration of these various groups of data among the mothers of highly intellectual children there would certainly appear to be the same deficiency of very young mothers and there is a side excess of elderly mothers if as we may conclude from the marked prevalence of first-born children among our british people of ability this tendency to a somewhat average age of the parents is associated with late marriages we perhaps have here one of the factors of the prevalence of an excess of boys in the families producing eminent men 
since, as Alfield has shown, Arc 1, Gynach, 1876, B.D., 9, page 448, there is a gradual, though not altogether regular, increase with age in the proportion of boys among primipair between the ages of 28 and 36. So, that while for the earlier age there were at Leipzig 110 boys to 100 girls, at later age there were 190 boys to 100 girls. It may be noted that in at least 44 cases the mother was a second or third wife. This group is a somewhat distinguished one, including F. Bacon, R. Boyle, Bunyan, Byron, Chaucer, S. T. Coleridge, and Rayleigh. The list is certainly very incomplete. In at least nine cases, the father was a second husband. It is instructive to compare the ages of the parents and to ascertain the degree of disparity. I have only been able to do this in 71 cases. There is a marked tendency to disparity which ranges up to 49 years. In 55 cases, the father was older. The distribution of the various degrees of disparity may be seen in the following table. A table displayed on the page with two rows, amount of disparity, and number of cases. The average amount of disparity for the whole of the 71 cases is as high as 7.7 .7 years. It will be seen that the number of cases in which the disparity was at least 10 years is equal to a proportion of over 26%. According to Ansel, the main difference in ages of husband and wife among the professional classes in England during the 19th century was 4.16 years. Before 18, it was only 3.89 years, rising to 4.42 years after 1840. This rise is doubtless connected with the accompanying rise in the age of marriage. It will be seen that the degree of disparity in the case of the parents of eminent British persons is nearly double that of the normal average before 1840, with which only it can be compared. The distribution of the different degrees of disparity is not seen from Ansel's tables but the frequency of high degrees of disparity in age among the parents of eminent British persons is evidently extreme. In Budapest, the table given by Kororsky, though not strictly comparable with the present data, shows that if we take men at ages between 26 and 30, covering the most frequent normal age of marriage in only 3% cases is a discrepancy of age as much as 10 years. A similar tendency to unusual disparity of age in the parents is found among the nervously abnormal groups. It is so, for instance, among idiots. Some fifteen years ago, the late Dr. Langdon Down, at my suggestion, kindly went through the notes of one thousand cases of idiots who had been under his care, and found that in twenty-three percent cases there was a disparity of age of more than ten years in the parents of the idiot child. The disparity in many cases being more than twenty-five years. Disparity of age in the parents is also, as Marrow has found, the Puerta, page 259, unusually prevalent among criminals. Among the parents of North Italian school children, he found that the normal proportion of parents, both belonging to the same stage of development, immature, mature, decadent, is 70%. Among the parents of North Italian criminals, it is only 63%. It has occurred to me as possible that the tendency to disparity of age may be one of the factors in the marked prevalence of boys. As, however, it has only happened that in a comparatively small proportion of cases, I have exact data regarding the respected number of boys and girls in the families of parents in whom the exact amount of disparity is known. It has not been possible to test this point with any certainty. So far as figures give any indication, they indicate that if disparity is a factor in the sexual proportion of the offspring, it can only be so in a very slight degree. On the whole, it will appear, so far as the evidence goes, that the fathers of our eminent persons have been predominantly middle-aged and to a marked extent elderly at the time of the distinguished child's birth while the mothers have been predominantly at the period of the greatest vigour and maturity, and to a somewhat unusual extent elderly. There has been notable deficiency of young fathers, and still more notably of young mothers. End of section 4 Section 5 of A Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5. Childhood and Youth. The Frequency of Constitutional Delicacy in Infancy and Childhood. Tendency of those who were weak in infancy to become robust later. The Prevalence and Precocity. University Education. The Frequency of Prolonged Residence Abroad in Early Life. 
the first significant fact we encounter in studying the life histories of these eminent persons is the frequency with which they have shown marked constitutional delicacy and infancy in early life a group of at least six joanna bailey hobbes keats newton smart charles wesley with perhaps look and stern were seven months children or at all events notably premature at birth it is a group of very varied and preeminent ability not including the above who were necessarily weakly at least fourteen are noted as having been very weak at birth and not expected to live even given up as dead in several cases they were on account of supposed imminent death baptized on the same day altogether as many as one hundred and ten are mentioned as being extremely delicate during infancy or childhood and the real number is certainly much greater for this is a point which must frequently be unknown to the biographers or be ignored by them in addition to these we are told of a hundred and three others ten per cent of our eminent british persons that their health was delicate throughout life so that we may reasonably assume that in most cases their feeble constitutions were congenital thus at the lowest estimate two hundred and thirteen of the individuals on our list a very large proportion of those for whom we have data on this question were congenitally of notably feeble physical constitution professor a h yoder encountered this fact in the course of his interesting study of the early life of a small group of men of genius pedagogical seminary october eighteen ninety four but failed to realize its significance he put it aside as due to a desire on the part of the biographers to magnify the mental at the expense of the physical qualities of their subjects there is no evidence whatever in support of this assumption the significance of such early delicacy has however already been recognized by other writers thus sir w g simpson journal of mental science october eighteen ninety three points out that illness in children is followed by increased mental development it may be noted that a tendency to die at birth is also noted among idiots who often require resuscitation matthews duncan sterility in women page sixty one although it may fairly be assumed that this proportion at least of our eminent persons showed signs of physical inferiority at the beginning of life it must be assumed that in all cases such inferiority was marked throughout life the reverse of this is notably the case in many instances this is not indeed absolutely proved by longevity frequently noted in such cases for men of genius have sometimes lived to an advanced age though all their lives suffering from feeble health but there is a large group of cases probably much larger than actually appears in which the delicate infant develops into a youth or a man of quite exceptional physical health and vigour bruce the traveller is a typical example very delicate in early life he developed into a man of huge proportions athletic power and iron constitution jeremy bentham very weak and delicate in childhood became healthy and robust and lived to eighty four burke weak and always ailing in early life was tall and vigorous at twenty seven constable not expected to live at birth became a strong and healthy boy dickens a puny and sickly child was full of strength and energy at the age of twelve gelt a delicate and sensitive child developed herculean proportions and energy Hobbes, very weak in early life, went on gaining strength throughout the life and died at eighty-four. Lord Stowell, with a very feeble constitution in early life, became robust and died in ninety-one. It would be easy to multiply examples, though the early feebleness of the future men of robust constitution must often have been forgotten or ignored, and it is probable that this cause of development is not without significance. I have noted that in a very large number of cases, one or both parents died soon after the birth of their eminent child, one small but eminent group including blackstone chatterton cowley newton adam smith and swift had lost their fathers before birth we may trace here the frequent presence of inherited delicacy of constitution the chief feature in the childhood of persons of eminent intellectual ability brought out by the present data is their precocity this has indeed been emphasized by previous inquiries into the psychology of genius but its prevalence is very clearly shown by the present investigation it is certainly to be said that the definition of precocity requires a little more careful consideration than it sometimes receives at the hands of those who have inquired into it and that we have carefully defined what we mean by precocity it is its absence rather than its presence which ought to astonish us in men of genius judging from the data before us there are at least three courses open to a child who is destined eventually to display preeminent intellectual ability he may one show extraordinary aptitude for acquiring the ordinary subjects of school study he may too on the other hand show only average or even much less than average aptitude for ordinary school studies but be at the same time engrossed in following up his own preferred lines of study or thinking he may once more three 
be marked in early life solely by physical energy, by his activity in games or mischief, or even by his brutality, the physical energy being sooner or later transformed into intellectual energy. It is those of the first group, those who display an extraordinary aptitude for ordinary school learning, who create most astonishment, and are chiefly referred to as proving the precocity of genius. There can be no doubt whatever that even in the very highest genius such extraordinary aptitude at a very early age is not infrequently observed. It must also be said that it occurs in children who, after school or college life is over, or even earlier, display no independent intellectual energy whatever. It is probable that here we really have two classes of cases simulating uniformity. In one class we have an exquisitely organized and sensitive mental mechanism which assimilates whatever is presented to it and with development ever six more complicated problems to grapple with. In the other class, we merely have a sponge-like mental receptivity, without any corresponding degree of aptitude for intellectual organisation, so that when the period of mental receptivity is over, no further development takes place. The second group, comprising those children who are most indifferent to ordinary school learning, but absorbed in their own lines of thought clearly contains a very large number of individuals destined to attain intellectual eminence. They by no means impressed people by their precocity. Scott, occupied in building up romances, was a dunce. Hume, the youthful thinker, was described by his mother as uncommon weak-minded. Yet the individuals of this group were often, in reality, far more precocious, further advanced along the line of their future activities than the children of the first group. It is true that they may be divided into two classes those who from the first had divined the line of their latter advance, and those who were only restlessly searching and exploring. But both alike really have entered into the path of their future progress. The third group, including those children who are only noted for their physical energy, is the smallest. In these cases, some powerful external impression, a severe illness, an emotional shock, contact with some person of intellectual eminence, serves to divert the physical energy into mental channels. In those fields of eminence, in which moral qualities and force of character account for much, such as statementship and generalship, this course of development seems to be a favourable one, but in more purely intellectual fields it scarcely seems to lead very often to the finest results. On the whole, it is evident that precocity is not a very valuable or precise conception as applied to persons of intellectual eminence. The conception of physical precocity is fairly exact and definite. It indicates an earlier than average attainment of the ultimate growth of maturity, but we are by no means warranted in ascertaining that the man of intellectual ability reaches his full growth and maturity earlier than the average man. And even when, as a child, he is compared with other children, his marked superiority along certain lines may be more than balanced by his apparent inferiority among other lines. It is no doubt true that, in a vague use of the word, genius is very often indeed precocious, but it is evident that this statement is almost meaningless unless we use the word precocity in a carefully defined manner. It would be better if we asserted that genius is in a large number of cases mentally abnormal from the first, and if we were, were to seek to inquire precisely wherein the mental abnormalities consisted with these preliminary remarks, we may proceed to note the prevalence among British persons of genius of the undefined conditions commonly termed precocity. It is certainly very considerable, although we have to make allowance for ignorance in a large proportion of cases, and for neglect to mention the fact that in many more cases, the national biographers note that 292 of the 1,030 eminent persons on our list may in one sense or another be termed precocious, and only 44 are mentioned as not precocious. Many of the latter belong to the second group, as defined above. Those who are already absorbed in their own lines of mental activity and are really just as precocious as the others. Thus Cardinal Wiseman, as a boy, was dull and stupid, always reading and thinking. Byron showed no aptitude for schoolwork, but was absorbed in romance. And Landor, though not regarded as precocious, was already preparing for his future literary career. In a small but interesting group of cases, which must be mentioned separately, the mental development is first retarded and then accelerated. Thus Chatterton, up to the age of six and a half, was said his mother little better than an absolute fool. Then he fell in love with the illuminated capitals of an old folio, at seven was remarkable for brightness, and at ten was writing poems. Goldsmith again was a stupid child, but before he could write legibly, he was fond of poetry and rhyming. And a little later, he is regarded as a clever boy, while Fanny Birdie did not know her letters at eight, but at ten was writing stories and poems. Probably the greatest prodigies of infinite precocity among these eminent persons were Cowley, Sir W. R. Hamilton, Wren and Thomas Young. 
Three of these, it will be seen, being men of the first order of genius. Jerry Barry and Thurwall were also notable prodigies, and it will be easy to name a large number of others whose useful proficiency in learning was of extremely unusual character. While, however, this is undoubtedly the case, it scarcely appears that any actual achievement of note date from early youth. It is only in mathematics, and to some extent in poetry, that originality may be attained at an early age, but even then it is very rare. Newton and Keats are examples, and is not notable until adolescence is completed. The very marked prevalence of an early bent towards those lines of achievement in which success is eventually to be won is indicated by the fact that in those fields in which such bent is most easily perceived it is most frequently found. It is marked among the musicians, and would doubtless be still more evident if it were not that our knowledge concerning British composers is very incomplete. It is specially notable that in the case of artists, it is reported of not less than 40 out of 64 that in art they were precocious, only four noted as not being specially precocious. A certain proportion of eminent persons on our list have followed the third course of early development as defined above. That is to say, they have been merely noted for physical energy and youth. Sir Joseph Banks was very fond of play till 14, till he was suddenly struck by the beauty of Elaine. Isaac Barrow was chiefly noted for fighting at school. Chalmers was full of physical activity, but his intellect awoke late. Thomas Cromwell was a ruffian in youth. Thurlow, even at college, was idle and insubordinate. Murchison was a mischievous boy, full of animal spirits, and was not interested in science till the age of thirty-two. Perkins was reckless and drunken till his conversion. It can scarcely be said that any of these remarkable men, not even Barrow, achieved very great original distinction in purely intellectual fields. In order to go far, it is evidently desirable to start early. The influence of education on men of genius is an interesting subject for investigation. It is, however, best studied by considering in detail the history of individual cases. Generalized statements cannot be expected to throw much light on it. I have made no exact notes concerning the school education of the eminent persons at present under consideration. It is evident that, as a rule, they received the ordinary school education of children of their class, and very few were, on account of poverty or social class, shut out from school education. A small but notable proportion were educated at home, being debarred from school life by feeble health. A few also, like J.S. Mill, were specially educated by an intellectual father or mother. The fact of university education has been very carefully noted by the national biographers, and it is possible to form a fairly exact notion of the proportion of eminent men who have enjoyed this advantage. This proportion is decidedly large. The majority, 53%, have in fact been at some university. Oxford stands easily at the head. 41% of those who have had a university education received it at Oxford, and only 33% at Cambridge. An interesting point is observed here. The respective influence of Oxford and Cambridge are due to geographical considerations. There is a kind of educational watershed between Oxford and Cambridge, running north and south. And so place that Northamptonshire is on the eastern side. Cambridge drains the east coast, including the important East Anglican district and the greater part of Yorkshire, while Oxford drains the whole of the rest of England as well as Wales. This at once accounts both for the greater number of eminent men who have been at Oxford and for the special characteristics of the two universities. Due to the districts that have fed them, the more literary character of Oxford, the more scientific character of Cambridge. The Scotch universities are responsible for 14% of our eminent men. Trinity College, Dublin, shows 5%. The remaining 4% have studied at one or more foreign universities. Paris, the Sorbonne, stands at the head of the foreign universities, having attracted as many English students as all the other European universities put together. This is doubtless mainly due to the fact that Paris was the unquestioned intellectual centre of Europe throughout the long period of the Middle Ages, though the intimate relations between England and France may also have had their influence. With the revival of learning, Italian universities became attractive and Padua long retained its pre-eminence as a centre of medical study. During the 17th century, the Dutch universities, Leiden and Utrecht, began to attract English students, and continued to do so to some extent throughout the greater part of the 18th century. It was not until the 19th century that English students sought out the German universities. Douai might perhaps have been included in the list as a chief substitute for university education for the eminent English Catholics who have appeared since the Reformation. Stated somewhat more precisely, it may be said that of our 975 eminent men, 217 were at Oxford, 232 if we include those who had also been at some other university, 177 were at Cambridge, 
191 if we include those who had also been elsewhere. 76 came from Scotch universities. Edinburgh, 28. Glasgow, 21. St Andrews, 16. Aberdeen, 11. From Trinity College, Dublin, have come 27 men. 23, or 47 if we include those who had previously been at some British university, have been to one or more foreign universities. Paris, 23. Leiden, 9. Padua, 6. Utrecht, 3. Louvain, 3. Gottingen, 2. Bonn, 2. Heidelberg, 2, etc. It may be interesting to compare these results with those obtained by Mr. Maclean in his study of 19th century British men of ability. He found that among some 3,000 eminent men, 1,132 or 37% are recorded as having had an English, Scotch or Irish university education. Of these 1,132, 37% were at Oxford, 33% at Cambridge, 21% at Scotch universities, 7% at Dublin, and the small remainder were scattered among various modern institutions. It will be seen that university education plays a comparatively small part in this group. This may be in part due to the lower standard of eminence, but it may also be due to the wide dissemination of the sources of knowledge. In no previous century would so encyclopedic a thinker as Herbert Spencer have been able to ignore absolutely the advantages of university centres. In America, also, as might be expected, a college education has not been received by the majority of able men. Thus, Professor E. Dexter, high-grade men in college net, for Popular Science Monthly, March 1903, shows that not more than 3,237 of the 8,602 eminent Americans of the 19th century or 37%, exactly the same proportion as Mr. McLean found in Great Britain, are college graduates. Those who reach a higher grade of scholarship are, however, more likely to become eminent than those of low grade. While the fact of university education is easily ascertained, it is less easy to define its precise significance. The majority of our men of pre-eminent intellectual ability have been at a university, but it would be surprising were it otherwise, considering the majority of these men belong to the class which in ordinary course receives a university education. It would be more to the point if we knew exactly what influence the universities had exerted, but on this our present investigation throws little light. In a considerable number of cases, at least, the university exerted no favourable influence whatever. The eminent man subsequently declaring that the years he spent there were the most unprofitable of his life. This was so even in the case of Gibbon whose residence at Oxford might have been supposed to be very beneficial, for at the age of 14 he had already been drawn toward the subject of his life task. In a large number of cases again, the eminent man left the university without a degree, and in not a few cases he was expelled. It is evident, however, on the whole, that a university life had not been unfavourable to the development of intellectual ability, and that while our eminent men do not appear to have been usually subjected to any severe educational discipline, they have been in a good position to enjoy the best educational advantages of their land and time. Professor Sully, in a study of the influence of educational genius, with special reference to men and women of letters, The Education of Genius, English Illustrated Magazine, January 1891, had already reached conclusions in harmony with those years set forth. It cannot be said that the boys who afterwards proved themselves to have been the most highly gifted shone with much luster at school, or found themselves in happy harmony with their school environment. The record of the doings of genius at college is not greatly different. No doubt a number of the ablest men have won university distinctions. In a few cases, indeed, a thoroughly original man has carried everything before him. At the same time, it may safely be said that a very small proportion of the men of genius who have visited our universities have presaged thereafter fame by high academic distinction. Thus, it has been computed that, though Cambridge has been rich in poets, only four appear in her honours lists. See article on senior wranglers, Cornhill Magazine, volume 45, page 225. In many cases, we have two clear signs of a disposition to rail against discipline and routine of college life. We find further that more than one distinguished man have expressed in later life their low esteem of university training. The conclusion that seems to be forced on us by the study of the lives of men of letters is that they owe a remarkably small proportion of their learning to the established machinery of instruction. If this is not a very decisive result to reach, there is another less recognised method of educational development which occurs so frequently, though I am disposed to attach very decided significance to it. I refer to residence in a foreign country during early life. 
The eminent persons under consideration have indeed spent a very large proportion of their whole lives abroad, whether from inclination, duty, or necessity, persecution or exile, and it might be interesting to ascertain the average period of life spent by a British man of genius in his own country. I have not attempted to do this, but I have invariably noted the cases in which a lengthened stay abroad has occurred during the formative years of childhood or youth. I have seldom knowingly included any period of less than a year. In a few cases I have included lengthened stays abroad which were made about the age of thirty, but in these cases those periods of foreign residence exerted an unquestionable formative influence. I have included soldiers and sailors altogether, as well as explorers, for in their case absence from England at a very early age has been an almost invariable and invariable incident in their lives, and has not always been of a kind of conductive to intellectual development. Nor have I included the very numerous case in which transference from one part of the British Islands to another has sufficed to exert a stimulating influence of the greatest importance. With these exemptions we find that as many as 371 of the eminent persons on our list, nearly as large a proportion has received a university education during early life, and all but a few cases before the age of 30 have spent abroad periods which range from about a year and in very many cases have extended over seven years, up to extreme cases like that of Caxton, who went to Rutgers in early life and stayed there for thirty years, or Buchanan, who went to France at the age of fourteen and was abroad for nearly forty years. It is natural that France should be the country most frequently mentioned as the place of residence, but France is closely followed by other countries, and a familiarity with many lands, including even very remote and scarcely accessible countries, is often indicated. It may further be noted that this tendency to an association between high intellectual ability and early familiarity with foreign lands is by no means a comparatively recent tendency. It exists from the first, the earliest personages on our list. St. Patrick was kidnapped in Scotland at the age of 16 and conveyed over to Ireland. It seems indeed that in the 19th century the tendency became less marked, yielding to the average modern Englishman's hasty and unprofitable method of travelling. In any case, however, it is evident that there has been a very marked tendency among the men of pre-eminent ability to familiarise themselves in the most serious spirit with every aspect of nature and life. It is equally marked among the men of every group, among poets and statesmen, artists and divines. It is not less marked in the case of men of science from the days of Ray onwards. If it had not been for the five years under the Beagle, we should scarcely have had a Darwin, and Lyell's work was avowedly founded on his constant foreign tours. In a notable number of cases, this element comes in at the earliest period of life, the eminent person having been born abroad and spent his childhood there. The presence of so large a number of our eminent men at a university may be in considerable measure merely by accident of their social position. The persistence with which men of the first order of intellect have sought out and studied unfamiliar aspects of life and nature, or have profited by such aspects which presented by circumstances, indicates a more active and personal factor in the evolution of genius. End of chapter 5。Section 6 of A Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Section 6 Marriage and Family. Celibacy. Average age at marriage, tendency to marry late, age of eminent women at marriage, apparently a greater tendency to celibacy among persons of ability than among the ordinary population. Fertility of marriage, fertility and stability of eminent persons are like pronounced. Average size of families, proportion of children to each sex. We have some information concerning the status as regards marriage of 988 of the eminent persons on our list. Of these, 79 being Catholic priests or monks, 12 of them since the Reformation, without celibates. Of the others, 177 never married. We thus find that 25.9% never married, or if we exclude the vowed celibates, 19.4%. It must, of course, be remembered that a certain though not considerable proportion of the unmarried were under 50 at death, as some of these would certainly have married had they survived. It may be added that of the women considered separately about two-thirds were married, though several of them, especially actresses, who were unmarried, formed liaisons of a more or less public character, and in a few cases had several children. It must not be supposed that all of these eminent men who lived long lives in celibacy 
were always so absorbed in intellectual pursuits that the idea of matrimony never occurred to them. This was not the case. Thus we are told of Dalton that the idea had crossed his mind, but he put it aside because he said he never had time. In several cases, as in that of Cowley, the eminent man appears really to have been in love, but was too shy to avow this fact to the object of his affections. Reynolds is supposed only once to have been in love. With Angelica Coffin, the lady waited long and patiently for a declaration, but none arrived, and she finally married another. Reynolds does not appear to have been overmuch distressed, and they remained good friends. These cases seem to be fairly typical of a certain group of the celibates on a list. A passionate devotion to intellectual pursuits seems often to be associated with a lack of passion in the ordinary relationships of life, while excessive shyness really betrays also a feebleness of the emotional impulse. In the case of many poets who have adored their mistresses with passionate fervour in verse, it would appear that there has often been no accompanying fervour in the love-making of real life. Sir Philip Sidney, even though he was counted the paragon of his time, with all his sweet sonnets, never shook the virtue of his stiller, Lady Penelope Rich, who yet eloped some years later with another man who was not a poet. Even in many cases in which marriage occurs, it is easy to see that the relationship was rooted in the man's intellectual passion. The average age of marriage among the 503 men on the list concerning whom I have information on this point is 31.1 years. The most frequent age being 26 years. The distribution is as follows. The table is displayed on the page with age, number of cases, and present. I have ascertained the ages of marriage of the fathers of the eminent persons on my list, not including the fathers who are themselves of sufficient eminence to be included on the list, in 73 cases. They are distributed as follows. A table is displayed on the page with the age groups and the numbers between them. The most frequent age of marriage of the fathers is 25, but the average is 30 years. It would thus appear that while both British men of genius and their fathers tend to marry at an abnormally late period, the former marry of anything even later than their fathers. If, however, in the 54 cases in which data are forthcoming, we compare the age of marriage of the individual man of genius with that of his not eminent or less eminent father, the results are not quite concordant. It is found that five married at the same age as their fathers, while 29 were younger and only 20 older. The deviations from the paternal example are often very considerable in either direction, and it can scarcely be said that the data before us suffice for the conclusion that our British men of genius have married later than their fathers. If we compare the distribution of the frequency of the marriage age among British men of genius and their fathers with the general population, the contrast is very striking. In England, generally, 57% of the men who marry before the age of 30 marry between the ages of 20 and 25, a larger proportion than in any other European country. The curve for the British men of genius much more nearly resembles that for the general population in Sweden or in France, where of all the European countries marriage is latest. It is, however, of more significance to compare British men of genius with the professional classes of their own land, avoiding also the fallacy of including second or subsequent marriages. Ansel found that the average age of marriage for clerical, legal, and medical bachelors in the 19th century before 1840 was about 28 years. There is thus a small but distinct delay in the age of marriage among men of genius, a delay which would still more be marked if we can assume that the general tendency, noted by Ansel as in progress during the 19th century, for marriage to take place later among the professional classes may be pushed back to the previous century. It would be further marked if the comparison were made more strictly between professional class of men of genius and ordinary professional class men by admitting from the men of genius those of aristocratic and plebeian class, among both of whom I find that marriage has frequently taken place very early. This seems highly improbable. It is much more likely that while there have been fluctuations from time to time, the age of marriage has not on the whole greatly changed, so far as professional classes are concerned for many centuries past. I am confirmed in this opinion by an examination of the age of marriage which prevailed in various branches of my own ancestry, belonging to the middle and upper middle class, during the 17th and 18th centuries. The general average was 29, and taking the 17th century figures severally, though here the numbers are few, it was decidedly higher. The average age, it will be seen, lies between that which I have found for the fathers of our eminent British persons and that found by Ansel for the British professional classes generally before 1840. 
I find in the marriage allegations of the Archdeacon of Essex for the years 1791 to 97, where the age about is given, that the average for 20 bachelors is 26 years. The exact social class is not, however, obvious. It remains probable that when we take a sufficiently high standard of intellectual eminence, the age of marriage is somewhat later than that of the professional classes generally, but it would scarcely appear that the difference is considerable. The married women among the British people of intellectual eminence concerning whom we have definite information form but a small group of 26 persons, a group too small to generalise about. Their average age at marriage was 28 years, and the most frequent ages of marriage were 22 and 40. The distribution is as follows. A table is displayed on the page with age and the number of persons. Under 20, 3, 20, 9, 25, 40, 30, 3, 35, 3, 40, 4. Although the numbers are so small, it is probably not an accident that the most frequent ages of marriage should be 22 and 40 years. If we take into account the ages before 30 only, we note a marked tendency to early marriage, more marked than among English women of the professional classes, more marked even than among the general population. But after the age of 24, there is a sudden and extraordinary fall. The ages of 26 and 27 are unrepresented altogether, and still more remarkable, a slight rise which eventually takes place is postponed to the ages of 40 and 41, towards the end of sexual life. The interpretation of this curious curve is, however, fairly obvious. The claims of the reproductive and domestic life are in women too preponderant and perious to be easily conciliated when the claims of a life of intellectual labour. Women who marry at the period of greatest general and sexual activity between 25 and 30 tend either to have their intellectual activities stifled or else to be seriously handicapped in attaining eminence. The women, on the other hand, who have either married very early and then escaped from or found a momus vivendi with domestic and procreative claims, or else have been able to postpone the sexual life and its domineering claims until comparatively late in life, enjoy a very great advantage in attaining intellectual eminence. Thus, it is that among British women of genius, very few marriages take place during the period of great reproductive energy. The large majority of such marriages fall outside the period between 23 and 34 years of age. In the majority of cases, marriage took place before this period, the relationship, from one reason or another, being very often dissolved not long afterwards. But in a very considerable portion of cases, marriage never took place until after this period. Thus Fanny Burney married at 41, Mrs. Browning at 40, Charlotte Bront at 38, while George Eliot's relationship with Luz was formed at about the age of 36. These names include the most eminent English women of letters. It would thus appear that there is a tendency for the years of greatest reproductive activity to be reserved for intellectual development. By accelerating or retarding the distributing emotional and practical influences of real life, this tendency might still be beneficial even when the best work was not actually accomplished until after a late marriage. Ansel found the age of marriage of English spinsters belonging to the professional classes previous to 1840 to be 24.75 years, while after 1840 it was 25.53. Mrs. Sidgwick found the age of marriage of the Sisters of Oxford and Cambridge women students in exact agreement with Ansel to be 25.53 years, while the age of marriage of the students themselves was 26.7. Among the general population in England, the chief age of marriage for women is between 20 and 25. At the end of the 18th century, the average age, about, of 19 spinsters in the marriage allegations of the court of the Archdeacon of Essex was 23.5 years. We have now to consider more minutely the status as regards marriage of our British men and women of eminent intellectual ability. When we estimate the 79 individuals who had taken vows of celibacy and the 177 others, who are definitely known not to have married, we have 774. Of these, 732 are definitely known to have married, while the remaining 42 are doubtful. It is probable that the doubtful may be equally divided between the married and the unmarried. We cannot assume that the same proportion of married and unmarried prevails among them as among the known group, for it would appear that in many cases the omission of the mention of marriage is to be regarded as a tacit statement on the biographer's part that the subject was not married 
If this is admitted, we must conclude that in the whole body of 1,030 persons, including the veiled celibates, 277 never married. This is to say, a proportion of 26.8%. If we omit the veiled celibates, the proportion is reduced to 20%. We leave out of account alike the veiled celibate group and the small, dubious group, and consider only those remaining persons, 909 in number, of whom we have definite knowledge. The percentage of those who never married is found to be 19.4. We consider separately the most recent group, i.e. those whose names are contained in the supplement to the Dictionary of National Biography. The results are not widely different. The proportion of the unmarried being in the ratio of nearly 18%. It is natural to ask the question whether the tendency to remain unmarried is greater among our men of ability than among the general population. It is, however, obviously difficult to answer the question with any precision, because we must, of course, compare the men of ability with normal persons, not only of the same class, but the same period. A consideration of the results seems to suggest that there is a somewhat greater tendency to celibacy among men belonging to the very highest class of genius than there is among the rank and file of able men. But that, so far as the letter are concerned, the tendency to celibacy is not notably greater than among the ordinary population in the same social class. We see the most recent group of our eminent British persons, which probably shows a somewhat lower general level of eminence, also shows a somewhat slighter tendency to celibacy. It is probable that among men of eminent ability, the tendency to celibacy has always been slightly, but only slightly greater than among the general population of the same social class. This conclusion is confirmed by an inquiry made by Professor E. L. Thorndike, Marriage Among Eminent Men, Popular Science Monthly, August 1902. He sought to ascertain the proportion of married individuals among the 1,000 most eminent men in a biographical compilation of contemporary Americans entitled, Who's Who in America? The standard of ability here demanded is necessary, very much lower than that of the persons on my list. It was found that of those who had reached the age of 40, 12% were celibate as against 15% for the most recent group excluding the women on my list, nearly all of whom had far past the age of 40. For the whole male population over the age of 40 in the United States, Professor Thorndike states, the proportion of celibates is from 11 to 7%, decreasing with age. Of the 753 persons who we may reasonably suppose to have married, 548 are definitely stated to have had children, 112 are definitely stated to have been childless, the remaining 93 are doubtful. If we assume that two-thirds of this doubtful remainder may be included among the fertile group, we may say that 19% of eminent British men and women who married have remained sterile. If, however, we only take into consideration those cases concerning which we have definite information, we find that proportion of the sterile is about 17%. This is certainly less than the real proportion for the whole married group. For there can be little doubt that in a large number of cases the biographers have made no mention of children simply because there were no children to mention. In many cases I have been able to verify this statement that the merely negative absence of information meant a positive absence of children, as this is not invariably the case. We may assume that the real proportion of individuals whose marriages were sterile for the whole of our married group is more nearly 19 than 17 per cent. If we consider the 55 women separately, we find that one was a vowed celibate and 19 others remain unmarried, while of the 35 who were married, 14 certainly had children, and 21 apparently had no children. A few of the actresses occupy an uncertain borderland between the married and the unmarried. They have here, however, according to the same rule as has been adopted with the men, been regarded as unmarried, even though they had a recognised family, whenever they were not generally recognised as married. The number of sterile persons, like the number of unmarried persons, among our eminent men and women, must be regarded as, in all probability, an abnormally large proportion in comparison with the general population of the same period in class. It must be borne in mind that the figures which have been given do not represent the proportion of fertile and sterile marriages, but the proportion of persons who have proved fertile and sterile in marriage. As many of our eminent persons entered into two or more marriages during life, and very frequently only proved fertile in one or in none, it is evident that if we were to consider the ratio of fertile and sterile marriages instead of the ratio of fertile and sterile persons in marriage, the prevalence of sterility would be much more marked. Simpson found that the proportion of sterile marriages in two Scotch seafaring and agricultural villages was about 10%, while in British peerage he found that it was about 16%. J.Y. Simpson, Obstetric Works, 
volume 1, page 323, et sec. Professor Carl Person, manipulating the data furnished by Howard Collins, has found that during the early part of the past century, among the middle and upper classes chiefly of British race, or belong to the United States, a class very comparable to those in the present group, the total sterility was about 12 or 13 percent, rather less than half of this, i.e. about 6 percent, being due to what may be termed natural sterility, while the remainder, i.e. 6 or 7 percent, must be set down to artificial restraints on reproduction. At the present day in the United States, sterility has greatly increased, and Dr. Engelman finds it to exist in 20 percent of marriages, in St. Louis and Boston, in dispensary practice, and in 23 percent among the higher classes in private practice. Although among the foreign elements, the population of abortion is very much lower. In New Zealand also, at the other side of the world, sterility is at the present day very marked. Here the methods of registration enable us to form an approximate estimate of the proportion of childless marriages among a population of somewhat mixed British race with a high standard of living, and the proportion of marriages in which there is no surviving child at the father's death is about 16%. But it must be borne in mind that we have to allow for the early death of the children in some cases, as well as for the early death of the father. We have also to remember that this increase in sterility is a modern phenomenon, and that the artificial restraint of reproduction to which it is in large part, if not mainly, due is of recent development. All the indications point to the conclusion that the sterility of our eminent men is greater than that of their contemporaries of the same social class. I may add that among the 62 eminent married men on my list who appear in the supplement of the Dictionary of National Biography, and therefore constitute the most recent group, the proportion who are sterile appears to be in about the ratio of nearly 20%, which very closely approximates to the general average. In Galton's group of modern British men of science, the proportion of sterile marriages was higher. There were no children in one out of every three cases. It is somewhat remarkable that although the number of infertile marriages is so large, the average fertility of those marriages which were not barren is by no means small. We have fairly adequate information in the case of 281 of these eminent men. I have not included those cases in which the biographer is only able to say that there were at least so many children, nor have I knowingly included the offspring of second or subsequent marriages. Wherever the number of children represent gross on its fertility, it is unfortunately, in a very large proportion of instances, quite impossible to say. It is probable that in a certain proportion of cases only the net fertility, i.e. the number of children who survived infancy and childhood, has been recorded. It is therefore probable that the average number of children in these fertile families, which is 4.8, must be considered slightly below the real gross fertility. The average reached is not far from the normal average, and very decidedly below that of the families from which the men of genius spring. With regard to the distribution of families of different sizes, the results as compared with the figures already given are as follows. Two tables are displayed on the page. With a columns listing size of family, normal families, genius producing families, and families of men of genius. Allowing for certain irregularities due to the insufficient number of cases, the interesting point that emerges is the return towards the proportions that prevail in normal families. It will be seen that in all but a few cases, the families of men of genius differ from genius producing families by approximating to normal families. It must be remembered that in neither of our groups are the data absolutely perfect, but as they stand, they confirm the conclusion already suggested that the men of genius belong to families in which there is a high birth rate, a flaring up of procreative activity, which in the men of genius themselves subsides towards normal proportions. The families of the men of genius seem to differ chiefly from normal families in showing a greater tendency to variation. There are more very small families. There are more very large families. It will be noticed that the families of sizes range between 3 and 6, both inclusive or unduly few. It might be supposed that this is due to the artificial limitation of families, more especially since in Professor Pearson's opinion, the normal families themselves show a deficiency in those groups probably due to this cause. I am, however, inclined to doubt whether that is so in the case of families of men of genius. Although, to a small extent it may be so, it is possible that from the present point of view, the group may not be homogeneous, but made up in part of men with feeble vitality and a tendency to sterility, and in part of men with a tendency towards unusual fecundity, thus leading to a deficiency in medium-sized families. The relationship which has been found to exist between our British genius-producing families and the families which the men of genius themselves produce, 
i.e. the increased fertility followed by the next generation by diminished fertility, does not represent a novel result. It had already been found by Gyalton, Englishman of Science, page 38, in his group of modern British men of science. In eliminating sterile marriages, he found that the average size of the families of the men of science was 4.7 children, almost exactly the same size as we have found for the whole group of British men of genius. Gyalton, however, only took living children to account. There would appear to be a considerable resemblance between the fertility of genius-producing families and of insane families. We see that our eminent British persons belong to families of probably more than average fertility, that they themselves produce families of probably no more than average size, and with an abnormal prevalence of sterility. In France, Ball and Regis, confirmed by Marindon de Montreal, appear to have found reason for a similar conclusion regarding the insane. They state that natality is greater among the ascendants of the insane than in normal families. But afterwards, it is the same as in normal families. While they also note the prevalence of sterility in the families of the insane, the question, however, needs further investigation. Tolux, Courses de la Folie, page 91. In the case of 278 families of our British men of genius, it has been possible to ascertain the number of children of each sex. This is found to be over 105 boys to 100 girls, a somewhat higher proportion of boys, and has prevailed in Great Britain during the past century. But in accordance with the results we have reached concerning the size of the families of our men of genius, very much closer to the normal average than are the sexual proportions prevailing among the families from which the men of genius spring. If, however, I am right in supposing that in a certain proportion of our cases, biographers have stated not the gross fertility, but only the net fertility, or the surviving children, we are not entitled to expect so close an approximation of the proportions at birth since the preponderance of boys begins to vanish immediately after birth. The figures thus suggest that the families of men of genius show the same tendency to excess of boys, which we have already seen to be clearly marked in the case of the families producing men of genius. The data are too few to indicate whether there is any corresponding excess of girls in the families of women of genius. End of chapter 6《Of a Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 7. Duration of Life. The fallacy involved in estimating longevity of eminent men. The real bearing of the data. Mortality at different ages. It has long been a favourite occupation of popular writers on genius to estimate the ages at which famous men have died, to dilate on their tendency to longevity, and to conclude or assume that longevity is the natural result of a life devoted to intellectual evocations. The average age for different groups, found by a number of different inquirers, varies between 64 and 71 years. One writer who finds this highest age for certain groups of eminent men of the 19th century argues that here we have a test from which there is no appeal, proving the preeminence of the 19th century over previous centuries and its freedom from degeneration. It did not occur to this inquirer to ask at what age the famous men of earlier centuries died. I have done so in the case of a small group of ten eminent men on my list, dying between the 4th and the end of the 13th centuries, including, I believe, nearly all those in my list, of whose dates we have a fairly definite information during this period, and I find that the average age is exactly 74 years. So that, if this test means anything at all, the freedom of the 19th century from degeneration is by no means proved. In reality, however, it means nothing. If genius were recognisable at birth, there would be some interest in tracing the course of its death rate. But it must always be remembered that when we are dealing with men of genius, we are really dealing with famous men of genius, and that though genius may be born, fame is made. In most fields, very slowly made. Among poets, it has generally been found longevity is less marked than among other groups of eminent men, and the reason is simple. The quality is that the poet requires often develop early. His art is a comparatively easy one to acquire and exercise, while its products are imperishable, and of so widely appreciated character that even a few lines may serve to gain immortality. The case of the poet is, therefore, somewhat exceptional, though even among poets, only a few attain perfection at an early age. In nearly every other field, the man of genius must necessarily take a long period to acquire the full possession of his powers, and a still longer period to impress his fellow men with a sense of his powers, thus attaining eminence. In the case of the lawyer, for instance, the path of success is hemmed in by tradition and routine. Every triumph is only witnessed by a small number of persons. 
and passes away without adequate record. Only by a long succession of achievements through many years can a lawyer hope to acquire the fame necessary for supreme eminence, and it is not surprising that the eminent lawyers on my list only 560 at death. Much the same is true, though in a slightly less marked degree of statesmen, divines, and actors. It is therefore somewhat an idle task to pile up records of the longevity of eminent men of genius. They live a long time for the excellent reason that they must live a long time or they will never become eminent. It is doubtless true that men of genius, mostly belonging to the well-to-do classes, and possessing the energy and usually the opportunities necessary to follow intellectual ends of a comparatively impersonal and disinterested character, are in a far more favourable position for living to an advanced age than the crowds who struggle more or less desperately for the gratification of personal greeds and ambitions, which neither in the pursuit nor the attainment are conductive to peaceful and wholesome living. This may well be believed, and it is highly demonstrated by longevity of eminent men. At the same time, it is of some interest to note the ages of the eminent persons on our list at death. Though the facts may have little significance in themselves, they have a bearing on many of the other data here recorded, excluding women and including only those men whose dates are considered by the national biographers to be unquestionable. The ages of eminent British men at death range from Chatterton, the poet, at 17 to Sir A. T. Cotton, the man of science, at 96. They are distributed as follows in, in five-year age periods. A table is displayed on the page with the ages at death and the men of genius totaled. If we consider the number for each year separately, certain points emerge which are distinguished by the five-year age period, though the irregularities become frequently marked and inexplicable. A certain order, however, seems to be maintained. There is scarcely any rise from 27 to 38, and even at 45, only three individuals died. But on the whole, there is a slow rise after 38, leading to the first climax at 49, when 16 individuals died. This climax is maintained at a lower level to 53, when there follows a fall to a level scarcely higher than that which prevailed 10 or more years earlier. This lasts for three years. Then there is a sudden rise from 7 deaths at 56 to 25 deaths at 57, and this second climax is again maintained at a somewhat lower level to the age of 67, when the highest climax is attained. We have 34 deaths. Thereafter, the decline is extremely slow but steady, not becoming accelerated until after 80. Each climax is sudden and preceded by a fall. A noteworthy point here seems to be the very low mortality between the ages of 53 and 57. It seems to confirm Galton's conclusion, based on somewhat similar data, that a group of men of genius is in part made up of persons of unusually feeble constitutions and in part of persons of unusually vigorous constitutions. Again, the first climax at 49, the feeble have mostly died out. The vigorous are then in possession of the best powers and working at full pressure. 57 appears to be a critical age at which exhaustion and collapse are especially liable to occur. The presence of these two classes, the abnormally weak and the abnormally vigorous, would be in harmony with the explanation I have already ventured to offer of the deficiency of medium-sized families left by our men of genius. The age of the women at death is ascertainable in 51 cases. The average is slightly over 62 years. As among the men, there would seem to be among them a small group tending to die early. The age distribution arranged in periods of five years is as follows. Tables displayed on the page, with age of death and women of genius in totaled. Age of death range from 30 well over to 90 and over. From the ages of 30 to 34, 2. 35 to 39, 4. 40 to 44, 2. 45 to 49, 2. 50 to 54, 2. 55, 59, 5. 60 to 64, 4. 65 to 69, 7. 70 to 74, 4. 75 to 79, 4. 80 to 84, 8. 85 to 89, 4. 90 and over, 3. End of chapter 7. Section 8 of A Study of British Genius by Avalog Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 8 Pathology. Relative ill health, consumption, psychology of consumptives, gout, its extreme frequency of men of ability, the possible reasons for the association between gout and ability. Other uric acid diseases, asthma and angina pectoralis, insanity, the question of its significance, apparent rarity of grave nervous disease, 
frequency of minor nervous disorders, stammering, its significance, high-pitched voice, spasmodic movements, illegible handwriting, short sight, awkwardness of movement. It has already been noted, page 134, that at least 10% of our eminent British persons suffered from a marked degree of ill health, amounting to more than minor discomfort during the years of their active lives. It is of some interest to observe how these persons are distributed among the various chief classes of ability. This distribution appears to be as follows. Soldiers and sailors, 3%. Statesmen, etc., 7%. Men of science, 11%. Lawyers, 13%. Men of letters, 15%. Artists, 16%. Poets, 16%. Divines, 17%. This marked prevalence of ill health among divines has already been noted by Galton, Hereditary Genius, page 255, et sec. He analyzed 196 biographies contained in Middleton's Biographica Evangelica and came to the conclusion that there is a frequent correlation between an unusually devout disposition and a weak constitution. He found that over 13%, at least, were certainly invalids, while a large number of the others were ailing. He found that of the twelve or thirteen who were alone stated to be decidedly robust, five or six were irregular in their youth, while on the other hand, only three or four divines are stated to have been irregular in their youth, who were not also men of notably robust constitutions. In a large proportion of cases, no reference is made by the national biographers to the diseases from which their subjects suffered, nor to the general state of health. This, however, we could scarcely expect to find except in those cases in which the state of health had an obvious influence on the life and work of the eminent person. In most of these exceptional cases, it is probable that the biographers have duly called attention to the facts, and though the information thus attained is not always precise, in part owing to the imperfection of the knowledge transmitted, in part to the medical ignorance of the biographers, and in part to a deliberate vagueness of their reference to a painful malady, etc., it enables us to reach some very instructive conclusions concerning the pathological conditions to which men of genius are most liable. Putting aside the cases of delicate health in childhood, with which I have already dealt in a previous section, the national biographers state the cause of death or mention serious disease conditions during life in some 400 cases. It is natural to find that certain disease conditions, which are very common among the ordinary population, are also very common among men of preeminent intellectual ability. Thus a lesion of the vessels in the brain, a condition commonly described as paralysis, apoplexy, effusion of the brain, etc., is a very common cause of death among the general population. And we also find that it is mentioned 44 times by the national biographers. Consumption, also so prevalent among the general population, occurred in, in at least 40 cases. While many of the consumptive men of genius lived to pass middle age, or even reached a fairly advanced age, the disease is responsible for the early death of most of the more eminent of those men of genius who died young, of Keats in poetry, of Bonington and Girton and Beardsley in art, of Purcell probably in music. Some appear to have struggled with consumptive tendencies during a fairly long life. These have usually been men of letters, and have sometimes shown a feverishly literary activity, their intellectual output being perhaps as remarkable for quantity as for quality as we may observe in Maxter and in J. A. Simmons, but Stern in literature and Black, Presley, Clifford and other eminent men of science are to be found among the consumptives. It is evident that the disease by no means stands in the way of any but the very highest intellectual attainments, and it is not indeed actually favourable to mental activity. There is, however, a pathological condition which occurs so often in such extreme forms, and in men of such preeminent intellectual ability that it is impossible not to regard it as having a real association with such ability. I refer to gout. This is by no means a common disease, at all events to the present day. In ordinary English medical practice at the present time, it may safely be said that cases of typical gout are seldom for more than 1% of the chronic disorders met with. Yet gout is, of all diseases, the most commonly mentioned by the national biographers. It is noted as occurring in 53 cases, often in very severe forms. We have indeed to bear in mind that gout has been recognised for a long time, and that it is moreover a disease of good reputation. Yet even if we assume that it has been noted in every case in which it occurs among our 1,030 eminent persons, an altogether absurd assumption to make, we should still have to recognise its presence in 5% cases. Moreover, the eminence of these gouty subjects is as notable as their number. They include Milton, Harvey, Sydenham, Newton, Gibbon, Fielding, Hunter, Johnson, 
Congreve, The Pitts, J. Wesley, Landor, W. R. Hamilton, and C. Darwin. While the Bacons were a gouty family, it would probably be impossible to match the group of gouty men of genius, for varied and preeminent intellectual ability by any combination of non-gouty individuals on our list. It may be added that these gouty men of genius have frequently been a centre of often very irascible. Choleric is a term applied by their contemporaries and occasionally insane. As a group, they are certainly very unlike the group of eminent consumptives. These latter, with their febrile activities, their restless versatility, their quick sensitiveness to impressions, often appear the very type of genius. But it is a somewhat feminine order of genius. The genius of the gouty group is emphatically masculine, profoundly original. These men show a massive and patent energy which proceeds without rest. It may be, but also without haste, until it has dominated its task and solved its problem. Sydenham, the greatest of English physicians, who suffered from gout for 34 years and wrote an unsurpassed description of its symptoms, said in his treatise De Podagara that it may be some consolation that those sufferers from the disease, who, like myself and others, are only modestly endowed with fortune and intellectual gifts, to know that great kings, princes, generals, admirals, philosophers, and many more of like eminence have suffered from the same complaint and ultimately died of it. In a word, gout, unlike any other disease, kills more rich men than poor, more wise and simple. And another ancient writer, the Jesuit Father Bald, who in 1651 wrote a work which he called Solatidum Podacricorium, called Gout Dominus Morbarum et Morbus Dominorum. I may remark that a much earlier ancient Eretus indicates that superior intelligence of the Gaudi in his statement that they are specially skilled in the knowledge of the drugs that suit them. In more recent times, a long series of physicians have testified to the intellectual eminence of their Gaudi patients. Cullen said that gout especially affected men of large heads. Watson stated that gout is peculiarly incidental to men of cultivated mind and intellectual distinction. So Spencer Wells believes that, in the absence of hereditary predispositions, gout is not easy to produce except in men endowed with a highly organized condition of the nervous system. And again remarks, Practical Observations on Gout, 1856, page 23, a reference to statesmen, those who are known to be subject to gout are among the most distinguished for an ancestry, rendered illustrious by high thoughts and noble deeds, for their own keen intelligence, for the assistance that they have afforded to improvements in arts, science and agriculture, and for the manner in which they have led the spirit of the age. I never met with a real case of gout. In other classes of the community, in a person not remarkable for mental activity, unless the tendency to gout was clearly inherited. This association of ability with gout cannot be a fortuitous coincidence. I have elsewhere suggested, Popular Science Monthly, July 1901, that the secret of the association may possibly, to some extent, lie in the special pathological peculiarities of gout. It is liable to occur in robust, well-nourished individuals. It acts in such a way that the poison is sometimes in the blood, and sometimes in the joints. Thus, not only is the poison itself probably an irritant and stimulant to the nervous system, but even its fluctuations may be mentally beneficial. When it is in the victim's blood, his brain becomes abnormally overclouded, yet not intoxicated. When it is in his joints, his mind becomes abnormally clear and vigorous. There is thus a well-marked mental pericodicity. The man liable to attacks of gout is able to view the world from two entirely different points of view. He has, as it were, two brains at his disposal. In the transition from one state to another, he is constantly receiving new inspirations, and constantly forced to gloomy and severe self-criticism. His mind thus attains a greater mental vigour and acuteness than the more equitable mind of the non gouty subject. Though the latter is doubtless much more useful for the ordinary purpose of life, for the gouty subject is too much the victim of his own constitutional state to be always a reliable guide in the conduct of affairs. It is, however, possible only to speak tentatively of the nature of the pathological relationship between genius and gout, because the true nature of gout itself is not yet definitely known. Some years ago, the theory that gout is caused by uric acid was very vigorously promulgated by Gadod and others, and very widely accepted. This theory, however, no longer receives such wide acceptance, and there is a tendency to regard the uric acid produced in gout as a symptom rather than a cause. According to another view, which has already been maintained by Woods Hutchinson in a very able discussion of this question, the meaning of uric acid and the urates, Lancet, 31st of January, 1903, gout is certainly a taxoema. 
but chiefly of intestinal origin, the uric acid produced by the disease being comparatively harmless. Whence it is that the drugs good in gout are such as either prevent intestinal fermentation or absorb its products. This theory does not, however, clearly answer the question why it is that some persons and not others are liable to gout. A theory which has been upheld by a long series of distinguished clinical physicians regards gout as primarily and preeminently a neurosis. This was a belief of Sal, Cullen, Laycock, Dice, Duckworth, Dice Duckworth, a plea for the neurotic theory of gout. Brain, April, 1880. I should not be going beyond my proper province if I were to state that the facts were brought forward may be regarded as an argument in favour of the existence of a neurotic element in the factors producing gout. That, however, my data confirm the belief in the prevalence of gout among men of high intellectual ability can scarcely be doubted. I have sometimes found that physicians who readily accept a special association between intellectual ability and gout are inclined to accept for it easily by an unduly sedentary life probably associated with excesses in eating and drinking. This explanation cannot be accepted. Many of the most gouty persons on my list have been temperate in eating and drinking to an extreme degree, and while it is true that the gouty have often written much, the general energy, physical and mental, of the gouty may almost be said to be notorious. Sir Spencer Wells, in questioning the influence of sedentary habits, referred to the remarkable activity of gouty statesmen. More recently, Dr. Burney, EO, remarks, British Medical Journal, 15th of June, 1901, the gouty patients that I have seen, I should say, in the majority of instances, been extremely active and energetic people, and it is often difficult to get them to take sufficient rest. I may note that in much earlier age, Aratia speaks of a gouty person who, in an interval of the disease, won the race in the Olympic Games. It may be of interest to point out in relation to the connection between genius and gouty conditions that Marrow, La Puberte, page 256, has observed a very constant relation between advanced age to parents at conception and lithiasis in the child. We have already seen that there is a marked tendency among some of our men of genius for the parents to be of advanced age at the eminent child's conception, and it is possible that the connection between gout and genius may thus be in part due to a tendency of some of the gouty producing influences to be identical with some of the genius producing influences. If this is so, we might probably expect to find that the age of the parents of those of our men of genius who belong pathologically to the lithiasis group would be higher than the general average. I find that the average age of 19 fathers of men of gouty men is 37.4, and of 7 mothers 33.2 years, while the average age of fathers of 8 eminent men who suffer from stone or gravel is 37.2. These averages are slightly, but very slightly indeed, higher than those for our men of genius generally. It must of course be remembered that the general averages are higher than those for the normal population. It must not, in any case, be supposed that in suggesting a real connection between gout and genius, it is thereby assumed that the latter is in any sense a product of the former. It is easy enough to find severe gout in individuals who are neither rich nor wise, but merely hard-working manual labourers of the most ordinary intelligence. It may well be, however, that given a highly endowed and robust organism, the gouty poison acts as a real stimulus to intellectual energy, and a real aid to intellectual achievement. Gout is thus merely one of perhaps many existing causes acting on a fundamental predisposition. If the man of genius is all the better for a slight ferment of disease, we must not forget that if he is to accomplish much hard work, he also requires a robust constitution. It may be added that the other diseases usually ascribed as of the uric acid group are common among our men of genius. Rheumatism, indeed, is not mentioned a large number of times, 11, considering its prevalence among the ordinary population. But stone and closely allied conditions are mentioned 25 times, sometimes in association with gout. And as we may be quite sure that this is a very decided underestimate, it is certain that the condition has been remarkably common. There are two disorders allied to gout, and at the same time distinctly neurotic in character, which are decidedly common among our eminent persons, and we must, I believe, regard them as of considerable significance. I refer to spasmodic asthma and angia pectoris. Asthma is distinctly connected with gouty conditions, and occasionally also it alternates with insanity. It is a disorder common in individuals of high nervous temperament. I have noted it in 14 cases, often as beginning in early life. And Gina occurred in about nine cases, certainly a large proportion considering the disease is one which has only been recognised in quite recent times. 
It is probable that one or two cases were not true angina, but that simulated angina, which sometimes occurs in neurotic individuals. On the other hand, several of the cases mentioned as our disease would certainly, had they been more definitely described, be set down as angina. One other grave pathological state remains to be noticed in this connection, insanity. To the relationship of insanity with genius, great importance has by some writers been attached. That such a relationship is apt to occur cannot be doubted, but it is far from being either so frequent or so significant as is assumed by some writers to rate together cases of insane men of genius without considering what proportion they bear to sane men of genius, nor what relation their insanity bears to their genius. The interest felt in this question is so general that we may be fairly certain that the national biographers have rarely failed to record the facts bearing on it. Although in some cases these facts are dubious and obscure, they may often have passed over guilt without mention, but they have seldom failed to mention insanity whenever they knew of its occurrence. It is therefore possible to ascertain the prevalence of insanity among the persons on our list with a fair degree of approximation to the truth, as it was known to the eminent man's contemporaries. We thus find that thirteen were, during a considerable portion of their active or early lives, thoroughly and unquestionably insane, in most cases with a clearly morbid hereditary which frequently showed itself in early life. In most cases also they died insane. These were J. Barry, Clare, William Collins, Cowper, Denham, Ferguson, Gilray, Lee, Patterson, Pugwin, Ritson, Romney, Smart. We further find a second group consisting of individuals who may be said with a fair degree of certainty to have been once insane, but whose insanity was either slight of brief duration or quickly terminated by death, sometimes by suicide. These were Borrow, Chatham, Cotman, O. Cromwell, G. Fox, J. Harrington, Hayden, Mrs. Jordan Kane, Lamb, Lancier, Lever, Rodney, D. G. Rossetti, Ruskin, Tillotson, Sir H. Trollope, Whitebread, Sir C. H. Williams. A third group consists of men who were perfectly sane during the greater part of long lives filled with strenuous intellectual activity, although in two or three cases there was morbid mental hereditary or eccentricity in earlier life. These cases, twelve in number, which may usually be fairly regarded as senile dementia, are H. Cavendish, Coleman, Marsh, Newton, J. Pearson, Sabine, Southey, Stephen, Swift, Warburton, S. Ward, T. Wright. It would be possible to add a fourth group of Portland cases in which the existence of actual insanity was in most cases dubious, but marked eccentricity not amounting to insanity was unquestionable. Such were Boswell, and R. Brown, and Lawrence Olipant. William Blake clearly lived on the waterland of insanity, and Dr. Maudsley indeed declared many years ago that if the story of his sitting naked with his wife in his summer house is to be believed, he was certainly insane. This, however, one may be permitted to doubt. Blake had strong opinions regarding the action of the sun on the skin, and in a day in which the sun bathes are regarded as beneficial, we may view more intelligently the action of a man who was in many respects a pioneer. I leave this group out of account, nor are the cases of suicide, at least ten in number, necessarily to be regarded as cases of insanity. If we count every case of probable insanity, which may be inferred from the data supplied by the national biographers, and if we include that decay of the mental faculties which in predisposed subjects is liable to occur before death in extreme old age, we find that the ascertainable number of cases of insanity is 44, so that the incidence of insanity among our 1,030 eminent persons is 4.2%. It is perhaps a high proportion. I do not know the number of cases among persons of the educated classes living to a high average age in which it can be said that insanity has occurred at least once during life. It may be lower, but at the same time it can scarcely be so very much lower that we are entitled to say that there is a special and peculiar connection between genius and insanity. The association of genius with insanity is not, I believe, without significance, but in face of the fact that its occurrence is only demonstrable in less than 5% cases, we must put out of court any theory as to genius being a form of insanity. It may be said that although the proportion of insane men of genius is so small, a different result would be attained if we took account of those who sprang from insane stocks or showed their neuropathic unsoundness by producing insane stocks. It is no exaggeration to say, Dr. Maudsley once pulled the road, 
that there is hardly ever a man of genius who has not insanity or nervous disorder of some form in his family. It is nearly twenty years since that statement was made, yet neither Dr. Maudsley nor anyone else had yet brought forward any sound evidence in support of it. So far as the present inquiry bears on the point, it may be said that the number of those men of genius who are noted as having a father or mother who became insane, or children who became insane, is very small indeed. The cases of insanity in the descendants being about equal to those of insanity in the ascendants, less than 2%, of our eminent persons are stated to have had either insane parents or insane children. We may certainly believe that the records are incomplete, but there is clearly no ground for believing that an insane hereditary is eminently productive of intellectual ability. Notions sometimes put forward that in discouraging the marriages of persons belonging to mentally unsound stocks, we eliminate the production of genius is without support. While I cannot compare with any precision the liability of persons of genius to insanity with a similar liability of corresponding normal classes, there is one comparison which it is interesting to make. We may compare the liability of persons of genius to insanity with the similar liability of their wives or husbands. It is noted by the national biographers that in 16 cases the wives or husband, and there is only one in case the latter, became insane. We may be fairly certain that this is a decided underestimate, for while the biographers would hold themselves bound to report the insanity of their subjects, they would not consider themselves equally bound to give similar information concerning the wives, while in other cases it may be well that for the record of the fact has been lost. If now, in order to make the comparison reasonably fair, we omit the second group of slight cases of insanity, and only omit the first and third groups, we find that the proportion of cases of insanity among the persons of genius is 2.4%. Among the conjugal partners, on the other hand, I have not made any allowance for second marriages, it is 2.2. Thus we see that on a roughly fair estimate, the difference between the incidence of insanity on British persons of genius and on their wives or husbands is a negligible difference. It is scarcely hazardous to assert that British men of genius have probably not been more liable to insanity than their wives. At the first glance, it might seem that this may be taken to indicate that the liability of genius to insanity is exactly the normal liability. That, however, would be a very rash conclusion. If the wives of men of genius were chosen at random from the general population, it would hold good. But there is a well-recognized tendency to observe among all the mentally abnormal classes for abnormal persons to be sexually attracted to each other. That this tendency prevails largely among persons of eminent intellectual ability, many of us may have had occasion to observe. What we see, therefore, is not so much the conjugation of an abnormal and a normal class of persons, but the presence of two abnormal classes. With regard to the significance of insanity, it must be pointed out that even if there is a slightly unusual liability to insanity among men of genius, there is no general tendency for genius and insanity, even when occurring in the same individual, to be concomitant. Just as it is rare to find anything truly resembling genius in an asylum, so it is rare to find any true insanity in a man of genius when engaged on his best work. The stimulation of it may occur, either the divine mania of the artistic creator, or a very high degree of eccentricity, but not true and definite insanity. There seem to be very few certain cases, mostly poets, in which the best work was done during the actual period of insanity. Christopher Smart's one masterpiece may be said to be actually inspired by insanity, and much of Cowper's best work was written under the influence of insanity. Periods of insanity may alternate with periods of high intellectual achievement, just as gout may alternate with various neurotic conditions, but the two states are not concomitant, and genius cannot be accurately defined as a disease. It must also be pointed out, in estimating the significance of the relationship between genius and insanity, that the insane group is on the whole not one of commanding intellectual preeminence. It cannot compare in this respect with the gouty group, which is not much larger, and the individuals of greatest eminence are usually the slightest or the most doubtful cases. Among poets and men of letters of an order below the highest, insanity has been somewhat apt to occur. Marked eccentricity, almost or quite amounting to insanity, has been prevalent among antiquarians. But the intellectual eminence of antiquarians is often so devious that the question of their inclusion in my list has been a frequent source of embarrassment. If we turn from insanity to other grave nervous diseases, we are struck by their rarity. It is true that many serious nervous diseases have only been accurately distinguished during the past century, and we could not expect to find much trace of them in the dictionary. But that cannot be said of epilepsy, which has always been recognised, and in a well-developed form cannot easily be ignored. 
Yet epilepsy is only mentioned twice by the national biographers, once as occurring in early life. Lord Herbert of Cherbury, at an old age, so W. R. Hamilton. Even these two cases, however, could not be admitted. In Lord Herbert of Cherbury's case, the national biographer has simply misunderstood a passage in Lord Herbert's autobiography, in which he tells us how, as he believed, he escaped the epilepsy, which he says is common in his family by acquiring a minor disorder in childhood, a defection of the ears, which purged his system. In Sir W. R. Hamilton's case, the epileptoid fits occurred in old age, most certainly cannot be regarded as true epilepsy. There appears to be nothing whatever in the records of British genius fatal to to Lombroso's favourite theory that genius tends to occur on an elliptoid basis. While, however, grave nervous diseases of definite type seem to be rare rather than common among the eminent persons with whom we are dealing, there is ample evidence to show that nervous symptoms of vaguer and more atypical character are extremely common. The prevalence of eccentricity I've already mentioned, that irritable condition of the nervous system which in its protein forms is now commonly called neurasthenia, it is evidently very widespread among them, and probably a large majority have been subject to it. Various definite forms of minor nervous derangement are also common. Among the minor forms of nervous derangement, stammering is of very great significance. I may ascertain that at least 13 of the eminent persons on my list, 12 men and 1 woman, stammered. These were Bagot, R. Boyle, Curran, Crocker, Erasmus Darwin, Dodson, Mrs. Inchbold, C. Kingsley, Lamb, Megan, Priestley, Scheele, Sidgwick. Seven others are noted as having defects of speech, which are sometimes stated as to amount to a stamina, but in other cases were doubtless ordinary stammering. When it is remembered that the normal occurrence of stammering among adults is much below 1%, and also that my record is certainly very incomplete, it will be seen that there can be no doubt whatever as to the abnormal prevalence of stammering among British persons of ability. It may be added that 25 persons are described as having a high, shrill, feminine, small, or weak voice. This also is certainly very decidedly less than the real number. Stammering may be defined as a functional disturbance of the central nervous system, congenital or acquired, characterized by involuntary disorderly spasms in certain muscles concerned in vocal utterance. In other words, it is a specific neurosis of muscular coordination. Hartwell, following Marshall Hall, describes it as a synthetic dance of the finer, more peripheral muscles of speech. Stammering is frequently distinguished from stuttering, but it is unnecessary to preserve any distinction here, as our knowledge of the precise nature of the voice defects found among our men of genius is often imperfect. We may with wily regard stammering as the general term. Klaus and his neurosis or development regards stammering as specially associated with rapid brain growth and most likely to occur between birth and the seventh year. In his careful investigation among Boston school children, Hartwell found that stammering became more prevalent at the beginning of accelerated growth, just before or just after such growth culminates, and again after its cessation. And he concludes that the irritability of the nervous system of which stammering is an expression is correlated with the most marked upward and downward fluctuations of the power of the organism to resist lethal influences. Stammering is much less common in adults than in children, and is three or four times more frequent in men. Among male adults, its frequency has been most carefully investigated in recruits, and its prevalence found to be according to the standard adopted three to six per thousand in France. Chevron, as well as among French recruits in the American War of Secession. Baxter, 1.2 per thousand among Native American recruits during the same war. Baxter, and exactly the same in Russia. Sikorsky. In persons of neuropathetic inheritance, stammering is especially liable to occur. Even in the very intelligent, Wiley remarks, Disorders of Speech, page 22, it may be found associated with nervousness and excitability, as well as sometimes with more distinct indications of irritability of the nervous system. Among the nervously abnormal classes, stammering and allied speech defects occur with especial frequency. This is notably the case among mental defectives. Thus, in Berlin, Castle found that 33.5% of defective children showed infirmities of speech, and Dr. Eccles, a London school inspector, states, The Treatment of Feeble-Minded Children, British Medical Journal, 6 September 1902, that quite 75% of defective children speak imperfectly, ranging from complete aphasia to a mere indistinct thickening, including stammering, halting, lisping, word-clipping, mispronunciation, and the mainly purely vocal imperfections. 
Most of the minor speech defects mentioned would seem to have been specially prevalent among our British men of genius. The tendency to very high-pitched voice, which is so remarkably common in men of intellectual ability, may possibly be due to a slight paralysis of the vocal cords, such as is apt to occur in more marked degrees in general paralysis. Observed by number 1, British Medical Journal, 24th November, 1894. Unless is caused by a general arrest of the laryngeal development. Involuntary spasmodic twitching movements, or a tick, of the smaller muscles, especially of the face, would appear to occur with very unusual frequency among our British men of genius. Although I have no figures of the prevalence of such convulsive movements among the ordinary population, I have noted the prevalence of this nervous disorder in seven cases. Browham, W. Hook, Dr. Johnson, C. Kingsley, Marshall, J. S. Mill, and Paley. In other form, a tendency to nervous incoordination is shown, by no means necessary, by any actual tremors in the tendency to bad handwriting. Illegible handwriting is mentioned in nine cases which certainly need to be largely increased. A tendency to squalling or illegible handwriting has been frequently noted among the men of genius of many countries, and is by no means due to too much writing, for it is often traceable in early age. It must be remembered that the handwriting is a very delicate indication of the nervous balance, and as such has been carefully studied during recent years by Kreblin and his pupils, while alienists have long been accustomed to attribute significance to the remarkable changes in handwriting which often occur under the influence of insanity. As Goodhart has truly remarked, Lancet, 6 July, 1889, eligibility is a disease, and he compares it to the defects of speech. Writer's cramp, to which illegible handwriting is occasionally due, is also, it must be remarked, not the mere result of excessive writing. As Fieri points out, professional neurosis, 20th century practice of medicine, Volume 10, page 707, it occurs more frequently in high officials than in the subordinates who write more, and is associated with mental overwork and neurasthenic and neuropathic conditions. Short sight, another condition frequently occurring on the basis of hereditary nervous defect, is known as existing in extreme degree, 16 times, and in 12 cases, some other sense was defective or absent. A condition to which I am inclined to attribute considerable significance from the present point of view is clumsiness on the use of the hands and awkwardness in walking. A singular degree of clumsiness and awkwardness is noted many times by the national biographers. Although they have certainly regarded it merely as a curious trait, they can scarcely have realized its profound significance as an index to the unbalanced makeup of the nervous system. This peculiarity is very frequently noted as occurring in persons who are tall, healthy, or robust, full of energy. As boys, they are sometimes not attracted to games, and cannot, if they try, succeed in acquiring skill in games. As they grow up, all sorts of physical exercise present unusual difficulties to them. They cannot, for instance, learn to ride, even if fond of shooting. They may be unable to hit anything, in walking they totter and shovel unsteadily. They are always meeting with accidents. Priestley, though great in experiment, was too awkward to handle a tool. Macaulay could not wield a razor or even tie his own neckcloth. Shelley, though lithe and active, was always tumbling upstairs or tripping on smooth lawns. It would be easy to fill many pages with similar examples. It is noted of at least 55 eminent men and women on a list that they displayed one or more such inaptitudes to acquire properly the muscular coordinations needed for various simple actions of life. In numerous cases, this clumsiness was combined with voice defect. The reality of the connection between Clumsiness of muscular coordination and mental anomaly is clearly shown by the fact that in idiocy, the most extreme form of mental anomaly, this clumsiness is seen at its maximum. In general, remarks, Dr. W. W. Ireland, The Mental Affections of Children, 1898, page 319. Idiots or children are awkward in their motions and slow to learn to walk. No doubt the cause of this lateness in learning to walk is in some cases owing to weakness and others to nervous diseases. But there are still cases where the child always appeared strong and healthy. Their gait, too, is awkward. Idiots in general have a bad balance. The same awkwardness applies to the hand. The awkwardness in the case of idiots is doubtless largely due to absence of mental power. In genius, the same result is brought about not by absence of mental power, but by the streaming, not only functionality, it is probable, but organically, of the mental energy into other channels, a cause which we may even consider opposite leads to a like defect in the muscular machinery. End of chapter 8
Section 9 of A Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 9. Stature. Nature of the data. Tendency of British men of ability to vary from the average in the direction of short, more especially of tall stature. Apparent efficiency of the medium-sized. As regards stature. I have succeeded in obtaining information in 362 cases. In 276 cases, the information is indefinite. In 86 cases, definite. In the first and larger group, which includes women, 119 are said to be tall, 74 of average or medium height, while 83 are short. There is frequently some difference of opinion regarding the eminent person's height, and selecting the most probable estimate, I have borne in mind the common tendency to regard a man who is really of average height as short, and to regard a tall man as of average height, our standard of height, in other words, tend to be above that of the general population. There still results, however, in abnormally small proportion of medium-sized persons. Although these form the bulk of the population, this discrepancy may be accounted for in part by a tendency among biographers to ignore stature when it shows no exceptional deviations from the average. A smaller group of men of genius, whose height is definitely known, furnishes evidence of a more reliable character. The distribution of height in this group is as follows. A table is displayed on the page with heights in feet and inches. It will be noted that here, and in the other group, we still have a marked efficiency of medium-sized persons, and a predominance of the tall over the short. It may be said that here also there has been a tendency to ignore the height of the average-sized man of genius, and such a tendency may be admitted as, in the past at all events, accounting for this deficiency. The very marked preponderance of the tall over the short still remains. If we take five foot nine inches as the average of the class producing men of ability, this was the average height of the fathers of Galton's English men of science, we find that fifty of our men of genius are above that height and only twenty nine below it. It will be observed that there is a very considerable proportion of individuals over six feet in height, and as various other persons on our list are described as gigantic, although their precise stature is not known. We must conclude that there really is an excess of such abnormally tall persons. It is noteworthy that the men of genius who spring from the lower social classes tend to be abnormally tall. The lower social classes are always shorter on the average than the upper classes. But it is remarkable that among the very small number of our British men of genius we have, who have sprung from the lower social strata, a considerable portion are not only tall but excessively tall. Of the 17 British men of genius who are known to have been 6 foot 1 inch or over in height, at least seven sprang from the peasantry or lower the middle class social group. These include Cook, Cobbett, Trevithick, and Barrow. It would appear, although I do not propose to discuss the question here, that the organic impulse to intellectual predominance most clearly seen in those individuals on our list whose social environment has been against the development tends in some degree to be associated with a corresponding energy and physical growth. There may well be in men of genius a tendency to physical variation in both directions deficiency as well as to excess, but is predominantly in the direction of excess. The average height of a Cambridge student is nearly 5 feet 9 inches, centimetres 174.8. Nearly all of the classes of the community in England are below this height. Porter among St. Louis children, publications, American Statistical Society, 1894, found that superior intellectual capacity is associated with superior stature, and inferior intellectual capacity with inferior stature. Christopher Journal of the American Medical Association, 15 September 1900, found the same result among Chicago school children. This result was severely criticised and cannot be accepted without qualification. Gilbert at Iowa found no such correlation but rather the reverse. It must be remembered that there were various kinds and degrees of ability and various ways of testing it. Nor can it be assumed that the results that hold good of average school children, even we have definitely ascertained what those results are, necessarily hold good also of men of genius, who are an extremely exceptional class. Pepe Bolt, Bull Society de Anth de Paris, 1899, page 446, has found that giganticism is sometimes associated with infantilism, more or less glabrous conditions of body, defective pigmentation, more or less underdevelopment of sexual organs and impulse, etc. Although infantile persons have no necessary tendency to become giants, he believes that there is some deep underlying but yet undermined connection between the gigantism and the infantilism. 
This is interesting in view of the frequent association of some degree of infantilism with some degree of giganticism in men of extraordinary intellectual ability. Combs stated that individuals born in summer tend to be taller than those born in winter. Although the numbers are far too small for any decisive statement, our British men of genius possibly show such a tendency. Unless we take the extremely low heights, there is not indeed an absolute majority of winter-born, October-March, over summer-born, April-September, among the short. But it certainly appears that while among those whose height is below five feet five inches, there are as many as four winter-born to six summer-born. Among those who are over six feet one inch, there is only one winter-born to six summer-born. It was found by Arthur MacDonald that in America, first-born children of school age tend to be larger than later children. This is not in accordance with the results found at birth, nor can it be said to hold good as regards the very meager data furnished by the British men of genius on my list. A strict comparison is not possible, but it may, and all events be said, that the preponderance of eldest children among British men of genius below five feet seven inches of height is somewhat greater. If indeed there can be said to be any real difference, than among those who are of five feet ten inches. End of chapter nine. Section ten of a study of British genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or a volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter ten. Pigmentation. Hair color and eye color. Method of classification. Sources of data. The index of pigmentation, its marked variation in the different intellectual groups, some probable causes for this variation. If we turn to a further anthropological character, pigmentation, or the colour of the hair and the eyes, I am able to bring forward a larger body of evidence, and it is not difficult to supplement the data furnished by the dictionary with the help of portraits, more especially those in the National Portrait Gallery. I have information on this point concerning 424 of the eminent persons on our list. In classifying by pigmentation, I have relied on the first place on the eye colour, but have allowed hair colour a certain influence in modifying the classes in those cases in which there was marked divergence between the two in lightness and darkness. I have sorted the eminent persons into three classes, according as their eyes were unpigmented, blue, highly pigmented, brown, or occupy an intermediate position combination of the blue with yellow, orange, or brown. This intermediate class has necessarily been large, and I have comprised within it three subdivisions, a fair medium, a dark medium, and between these two, a doubtful medium. I found that the 424 individuals might be thus classed as regards eye colour, unpigmented 71, light medium 99, doubtful medium 54, dark medium 85, fully pigmented 115. The question arose as to how the results thus obtained might be conveniently formulated so as to enable us to compare the different groups of eminent persons. I finally decided to proceed with each of these groups as follows. The doubtful medium persons in each of these classes were divided equally between the fair medium and the dark medium. Then two-thirds of the fair medium persons were added to the fair class, the remaining third to the dark class, and likewise two-thirds of the dark medium were added to the dark class, the remaining third to the fair class. The five classes were thus reduced to two, and on multiplying the fair by 100 and dividing by the dark, we obtain what may be called index of pigmentation. This method of notation is really simple and is quite sufficiently accurate for the nature of the data dealt with. It will be seen that by its use an index of 100 means that fair and dark people are equally numerous in a group, while indices over 100 mean in excess of fair persons, and indices under 100 in excess of dark persons. I may remark concerning this index of pigmentation that, while the yields results which are strictly comparable among themselves in the hands of a single observer, proceeding in a uniform manner, it is doubtful whether two observers would carry it out in a strictly identical manner. Beto's index of nicorescence, founded on hair colour and applied directly to living subjects, is a convenient formula for indicating the degree of pigmentation, but in my observations, largely made in portals, in which the hair was often whitened by age, absent, concealed beneath a wig, or obscured by the darkening of the paint, it was necessary to accept eye colour as a primary basis of classification. I have been able to obtain the index of pigmentation in the case of 14 groups. I present them with their index of pigmentation in the order of decreasing fairness, noting also the number of individuals in each group. Some individuals, I may remark, are included in more than one group, while various miscellaneous persons are not included at all. A table is displayed on the page with index of pigmentation. 
Social and Political Reformers, 6. Pigmentation, 400. Scholars, 7. Pigmentation, 200. Lawyers, 15. Pigmentation, 114. Soldiers, 23. Pigmentation, 110. Men of Science, 45. Pigmentation, 109. Sailors, 13. Pigmentation, 100. Philosophers, 12. Pigmentation, 100. Painters, Sculptors and Architects, 38. Pigmentation, 94. Poets, 58. Pigmentation, 90. Men and Women of Letters, 98. Pigmentation, 79. Statesmen, 49. Pigmentation, 78. Explorers, 7. Pigmentation, 66. Divines, 44. Pigmentation, 48. Actors and Actresses, 18. Pigmentation, 30. Although the numbers of some groups few, and we must not regard the index as giving results which are quite invariable, we may accept the general results with some confidence. It may be regarded as fairly certain that the first six groups do really tend to be unusually fair, and the last three groups unusually dark. The average index of pigmentation for the British population, generally probably, lies between 80 and 100, but it varies greatly if we take separate districts, being very high in many parts of Scotland, and very low in many parts of the west of England. It is fairly obvious that this fact furnishes, to some extent, a key to the position of the various groups in reference to this index. Sailors who tend to be fair come largely from the coast, and the inhabitants of the coast are usually fairer than people from inland districts. Men of science come largely from regions where the population is fair. Artists tend to be fair, both in England and France, and it is, at first, a little surprising to find that they do not appear higher upon the list. It may be pointed out, however, that a large proportion of our most eminent painters come from East Anglia, a region in which, though the hair is not very dark, the eye colour is very frequently brown. Actors come largely from regions where the population is dark, but this factor, though it accounts for much, will not account for everything, nor will it explain the decisiveness of the results. Divines come from all parts of the United Kingdom, yet they tend to be distinctly dark. The darkness of eminent actors is very marked, whatever their place of origin. Only one of the eighteen on my list, Munden, falls in the unpigmented group, and he is certainly not an actor of the highest rank. The extreme fairness of political agitators and social reformers, religious reformers who tend to be decidedly dark, not being included, is peculiar. The darkness of travellers and explorers may be explained by a kind of natural selection, fair persons speedily succumbing to the effects of tropical climates. It may be remarked that this group would have been still darker if it had not been for the presence of two or three individuals of so-called Celtic type, who are fairly pigmented on the whole, though their eyes are not dark. It would, however, be out of place here to discuss fully the very interesting question of the significance of pigment in relation to intellectual ability. The results of this inquiry are on the whole confirmed by an inquiry I have elsewhere carried out as to the index of pigmentation of all the persons whose portraits are to be seen in the National Portrait Gallery, and whose eyes are fairly visible. Monthly Review, August 1901. I may say that I regard the results of my observations in the National Portrait Gallery, though some of the data are common to both series of observations, as distinctly more trustworthy in the light they throw on the relationship of pigmentation to intellectual evocation, not only because the numbers are larger, but also because the standard of ability is much lower, so that the influence of predilection in the direction of the intellectual ability is as complicated by the possibly disturbing factor of very high and versatile intellectual ability. Thus, in the small group of very eminent sailors, we have several very exceptional men, like Cook and Dampier, who were notably dark. The large number of more typical less eminent sailors in the National Portrait Gallery gives us a higher index, which is doubtless nearer to the truth. I shall add, however, that the index of pigmentation was here obtained in a way that at one point slightly differed from the adopted in the latter series. I.e., in the National Portrait Gallery groups, I simply divided all the medium persons in each group equally between the unpigmented and the fully pigmented sections. The table is displayed on the page with a group, number of individuals, and the index of pigmentation. Political reformers and agitators, 20, pigmentation, 233. Sailors, 45, pigmentation, 150. Men of science, 53, pigmentation, 121. Soldiers, 42, pigmentation, 113. Artists, 74, pigmentation, 111. Poets, 56, pigmentation, 107. Royal Family, 66, pigmentation, 107. Lawyers, 56, pigmentation, 107. Created Peers and Their Sons, 89, pigmentation, 102. Statesmen, 53, pigmentation, 89. Men and Women of Letters, 87, pigmentation, 85. Hereditary Aristocracy, 149, pigmentation, 82. Divines, 57, pigmentation, 58. Men of Low Birth, 12, 
Pigmentation, 50. Explorers, 8. Pigmentation, 33. Actors and actresses, 16. Pigmentation, 33. End of chapter 10. Section of 11 of A Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 11. Other Characteristics. Personal Beauty or the Reverse. The Eyes. Shyness and Timidity. Tendency to Melancholy. Persecution by the World. A physical characteristic to which the national biographers frequently allude, though I do not propose to attempt to give it any numerical values, is personal beauty or the absence of it. A very large proportion of persons are referred to as notably handsome, commonly imposing. A very considerable but small proportion are spoken of as showing some disproportion or asymmetry of feature, body or limbs, as notably peculiar or even ludicrous in appearance. A not uncommon type is that of the stunted giant with massive head and robust body but very short legs. There is one feature, however, which is noted as striking and beautiful in a very large number of cases, even in persons who are otherwise wholly without physical attractions, that is the eyes. It is very frequently found that descriptions of the personal appearance of men of genius, however widely they may differ in other respects, agree in noting an unusual brilliancy of the eyes. Thus the eyes of Burns were said by one observer to be like coals of living fire and Scott writes that they literally glowed. While of Chatterton's eyes it was said that there was fire rolling at the bottom of them, it is significant that both of these instances, chosen almost at random, were poets. While, however, the phenomenon seems to be noted more frequently, and with more emphasis in poets, it is found among men of genius of all classes. One may suppose it to be connected with an unusual degree of activity of the cerebral circulation. In regard to the mental and emotional disposition of British persons of genius, the national biographers enable us to trace the prevalence of one or two tendencies. One of these is shyness, bashfulness, or timidity. This is noted in 68 cases, while 50 are described as very sensitive, nervous, or emotional, and although this is not equivalent to a large percentage, it must of course be remembered that the real number of such cases is certainly very much larger, and also that the characteristic is in many cases extremely well marked. Some had to abandon the profession they had chosen on account of their nervous shyness at appearing in public. Others were too bashful to declare their love to the women they were attracted to. Sir Thomas Brown, one of the greatest masters of English prose, was so modest that he was always blushing causelessly. Hooker, one of the chief luminaries of the English church, could never look anyone in the face. Dryden, the recognised prince of literally men of his time, was, said Congreve, the most easily put out of countenance of any man he had ever met. It is not difficult to see why the timid temperament, which is very far from involving lack of courage, should be especially associated with intellectual aptitudes. It causes a distaste for social contact and so favours those forms of activity which may be exerted in solitude. These later, again, reacting to produce increased awkwardness in social relations. Moreover, the mental state of timidity, which may be regarded as a mild form of folie du don, a perpetual self-questioning and uncertainty, However unpleasant it may be from the social point of view, is by no means an unsatisfactory attitude in the face of intellectual problems, for it involves that unceasing self-criticism, which is an essential element of all good intellectual work, and has marked more or less clearly the greatest men of scientific genius. Fundamentally, no doubt, timidity is a minor congenital defect of the nervous mechanism, fairly comparable to stammering. It may be noted that the opposite characteristic of over-self-confidence with more or less tendency to arrogance and insolence is also noted, but with much less frequency, and usually in men whose eminence is not due to purely intellectual qualities. In some cases it would seem the two opposite tendencies are combined, the timid man seeking refuge of his own timidity in the assumption of arrogance. In a certain number of cases, information is given as to their general emotional disposition, whether to melancholy or depression, or of a gay, cheerful, and genial character. In 85 cases, the disposition is known as melancholy, and 20 is cheerful or jovial. In 7 cases, both dispositions are noted as occurring in varying association in the same person. This marked tendency to melancholy among persons of intellectual aptitude is no new observation, but was indeed one of the very earliest points noted concerning men of genius. According to a saying attributed to Aristotle, all men of ability are melancholy, 
and Reville Paris, one of the first and still one of the most sagacious of the modern writers on genius, devoted a chapter to the point. It is not altogether difficult to account for this phenomenon. Melancholy children, as Munro found, are in large proportion the offspring of elderly fathers, as we have also found our persons of intellectual eminence to be. A tendency to melancholy, again, even though it may always fall short of insane melancholia, is allied to those neurotic and abnormal conditions which we have found to be not infrequent. Moreover, it certainly has a stimulating influence on intellectual work. The more normal men of cheerful disposition instinctively seek the consolations of society. The melancholy man, like the shy man, is ill-adapted to society, and more naturally seeks his consolations in a non-social field, such as that of the intellect. Often plunging more deeply into intellectual work, the more profound his melancholy becomes. Wagner said that his best work was done at times of melancholy, and among the eminent men on our list several writers are mentioned who turn to authorship as a relief of personal depression. It may also be said that not only is melancholy a favourable condition for intellectual work, that the sedentary and nerve-exhausting nature of nearly all forms of intellectual work in turn reacts to emphasise or produce moods of depression. Another cause that serves largely to accentuate the tendency of men of genius to melancholy is the attitude of the world towards them. Every original worker in intellectual fields, every man who makes some new thing, is certain to arouse hostility where he does not meet with indifference. He sets out in his chosen path, ignorant of men, but moved by high ideals, content to work in laborious solitude and to wait, and when at last he turns to his fellows, saying, See what I have done for you? He often finds that he has to meet only the sneering prejudices of the few who might have comprehended, and the absolute indifference of the many who are too absorbed in the daily struggle for bread to comprehend any intellectual achievement. The wise worker knows this, and arms himself with benevolent contempt, alike against the few and the many. Thus, of one of the great men of science on our list, Stephen Hales, it was said that he could look even upon those who did him unkind offices without any emotion of particular indignation, not from what of discernment or sensibility, but he used to consider them only like those experiments which, upon trial, he found could never be applied to any useful purpose, and which he therefore calmly and dispassionately laid aside. But it has to be remembered that the prevailing temperament of men of genius is one of great nervous sensitiveness and irritability. So that, as Reveil Paris puts it, they are apt to roar at a pinprick, and even when they are well aware what the opinion of the world is worth, they still cannot help being profoundly affected by that opinion, hence a fruitful source of melancholy. The attitude of the world towards the man of original intellect, being not merely one of disdain or indifference, but a constantly intending to become aggressive, has certainly reinforced the tendency to melancholy. It is particularly impossible to estimate the amount of persecution to which this group of preeminent British persons has been subjected, for it has shown itself in innumerable forms, and varies between a more passive refusal to have anything whatever to do with them or their work, and the active infliction of physical torture and death. There is, however, at least one form of persecution, very definite in character, which it is easy to estimate since the national biographers have probably in few cases passed it over i refer to imprisonment i find that at least one hundred and sixty or over sixteen per cent of our nine hundred and seventy five enemy men were imprisoned once or oftener for periods varying length or many others only escaped imprisonment by voluntary exile it is true that the causes of imprisonment are various but even imprisonment for such a cause as debt may usually be taken to indicate an anomalous lack of adjustment to the social environment the man of genius is an abnormal being, thus arousing the instructive hostility of society, which by every means seeks to put him out of the way. It will be seen that the various personal traits noted in this section, while completing a picture of British persons of genius, may be linked on at numerous points to other traits we have previously noted. It only remains to gather together the threads we have traced and to ascertain how far they may be harmoniously woven into a complete whole. End of chapter 11《Section 12 of a Study of British Genius by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on the volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 12 Conclusions The characteristics of men of genius probably to a large extent independent of the particular field of their ability is shown in. What is the temperament of genius? In what sense genius is healthy? The probable basis of inaptitude for ordinary life. 
In what sense genius is a neurosis? It may be reasonable to ask and estimate the significance of those characteristics of British persons of genius we have here ascertained. To what degree an investigation of persons of eminent intellectual aptitude belonging to other countries would bring out different results? It is not possible to answer this question quite decisively. The fact, however, that at many points our investigation simply gives precision to characteristics which have been noted as marketing genius in various countries seems to indicate that in all probability the characteristics that constitute genius are fundamentally alike in all countries, though it may well be that minor modifications are associated with national differences. The point is one that can only be decisively settled when similar investigations are carried out concerning similar groups of persons of superior intellectual ability belonging to various countries. A further question may be asked. How far has confusion been introduced by lumping together persons whose intellectual aptitudes have been shown in very different fields? May not the average biological characteristics of the man of science be the reverse of those of the actor and those of the divine at the other extreme from those of the lawyer? I believe that Mr. Gowden is inclined to think that the investigation of groups of men with different intellectual aptitudes would yield different results. As, however, we have seen, the investigation of eminent British persons when carried out without reference to the particular fields in which their activities have been exercised, yields results which, when comparable with those of Galton, do not usually show any striking discrepancies. Nor so far I have at present looked into the matter. Does it appear that, on the whole, when we consider separately the various groups of British eminent persons we are here concerned with, such groups show any widely varying biological characteristics? Certain variations there certainly are. We have seen that the geographical distribution of the various kinds of intellectual activity to some extent varies, and also that in pigmentation there are in some cases marked variations. On the whole, however, it would appear that, whatever the field in which it displays itself, the elements that constitute the temperament of genius show a tendency to resemble each other. I shall probably be asked to define precisely what the temperament is that underlies genius. That, however, is a question which the material before us only enables us to approach very cautiously. There are two distinct tendencies among writers on genius. On the one hand, are those who seem to assume that genius is a strictly normal variation. This is the standpoint of Galton. On the other hand, those chiefly alienists who assume that genius is fundamentally a pathological condition and closely allied to insanity. This is the position of Blombroso, who compares genius to a pearl. So regarding it, as a pathological condition, the result of morbid irritation, and by chance has produced a beautiful result, and who seeks to find the germs of genius among the literary and artistic productions of the inmates of lunatic asylums. It can scarcely be said that the course of our investigation, uncertain as it may sometimes appear, has led to either of these conclusions. On the one hand, we have found along various lines the marked prevalence of conditions which can hardly be said to be constant with a normal degree of health or the normal conditions of vitality. On the other hand, it cannot be said that we have seen any ground to infer that there is any general connection between genius and insanity, or that genius tends to proceed from families in which insanity is prevalent. For while it is certainly true that insanity occurs with unusual frequency among men of genius, it is very rare to find that periods of intellectual ability are combined with periods of insanity. And it is, moreover, notable that putting aside senile forms of insanity, the intellectual achievements of those eminent men in whom unquestionable insanity has occurred have rarely been of a very high order. We cannot therefore regard genius either as a purely healthy variation occurring within normal limits, or yet as a radically pathological condition, not even as an alteration, a sort of allotropic form of insanity. We may rather regard it as a highly sensitive and complexity developed adjustment of the nervous system along special lines, with con Comitant tendency to defect along other lines. Its elaborate organization along special lines is often built up on a basis even less highly organized than that of the ordinary average man. It's no paradox to say that the real affinity of genius is with congenital imbecility rather than with insanity. If indeed we consider the matter well, we see that it must be so. The organization that is well adapted for adjustment to the ordinary activities of the life it is born into is not prompted to find new adjustments to suit itself. The organic inhibition of ordinary activities is necessarily a highly favorable condition for the development of extraordinary abilities when these are present in a latent condition.
Hence it is that so many men of the highest intellectual aptitudes have so often shown the tendency to muscular incoordination and clumsiness with marked idiots, and even within the intellectual sphere, when straying outside their own province. They have frequently shown a lack of perception which placed them on scarcely so high a level as the man of average intelligence. It is not surprising that by means of the idiots' events, the wonderful calculators, the matioids, and men of one idea, and the men whose intellectual originality is strictly confined to one field, we may bridge the gulf that divides idiocy from genius. Since the basis of organic inaptitude, a condition which in a more marked and unmitigated form we call imbecility, may thus often be traced at the foundation of genius, we must regard it as a more fundamental fact in the constitution of genius than the undue prevalence of insanity, which is merely a state of mental dissolution. In nearly every case, temporarily or permanently abolishing the attitude for intellectual achievement. It must not, however, be hastily concluded that the prevalence of insanity among men of genius is an accidental fact, meaningless or unaccountable. In reality, it is a very significant fact. The intense cerebral energy of intellectual reaction involves an expenditure of tissue which is not the dissolution of insanity, for waste and repair must here be balanced but it reveals an instability which may sink to the mere dissolution of insanity. If the balance of waste and repair is lost and the high-pressure tension falls out of gear, insanity is rather a nemesis of the peculiar intellectual energy of genius exerted at a prolonged tied tension than an essential element in the foundation of genius. But a germinal nervous instability, such as to the ordinary mind stimulates some form of insanity, is certainly present from the first in many cases of genius, and certainly of immense value in creating the visions or stimulating the productiveness of men of genius. We have seen how significant a Gaudi inheritance seems to be. A typical example of this in recent years was presented by William Morris, a man of very original genius, of great physical vigour and strength, of immense capacity for work, who at the same time abnormally restless, irritable, and liable to random explosions of nervous energy. Morris inherited from his mother's side a peculiarly strong and solid constitution, on his father's side, he inherited a neurotic and gouty strain. It is evident that, given the robust constitution, the general instability furnished by such a morbid element as this, falling far short of insanity, acts as a precious fermentive element, an essential constituent in the man's genius. The mistake usually made is to exaggerate the insane character of such a fermentive element, and at the same time to ignore the element of sane and robust vigour, which is equally essential to any high degree of genius. We may perhaps accept the ancient dictum of Aristotle as reported by Seneca, no great genius without some mixture of insanity. But we have to remember that the insanity is not more than a mixture, and it must be a finely tempered mixture. This conclusion, suggested by our own survey of British persons of preeminent intellectual aptitude, is thus by no means either novel nor modern. It is that of most cautious and suggestious inquirers. The same position was rather vaguely adopted by Moreau, de Tours, in his Physiologie Morbide dans sans Rapports, etc., published in 1859. Though, as his book was prolix and badly written, his proposition has often been misunderstood. He regards genius as a neurosis, but he looked upon such neurose as simply the synonym of exaltation. I do not say trouble or perturbation of the intellectual faculties. The word neurosis would appear a particular disposition of the faculties, a disposition still in part physiological, but overflowing those physiological limits, and he presents a genealogical tree of genius, insanity, crime, etc., among its branches, the common root being the hereditary idiosyncratic nervous state. Professor Grasset, again, more recently, La superiorité intellectuelle et la neurose, 1900, while not regarding genius as a neurosis, considers that it is united to the neurosis by a common trunk, this trunk being a temperament and not a disease. The slight mixture of morbidity penetrating an otherwise healthy constitution, such as the present investigation suggests, as a frequent occurrence in genius, results in an organization marked by what Moreau calls a neurosis and grasset a temperament. It has been necessary to state as clearly as may be possible the conclusions suggested by the present study as regards the pathological relationships of genius, because although those conclusions are not essentially novel, the question is one that is apt to call extravagant answers in one direction or another. 
The most fruitful part of our investigation seems, however, to lie not in the aid it may give towards the exact definition of genius, for which our knowledge is not sufficient, but in the promising fields it seems to open out for the analysis of genius along definite and precise lines. A time has gone by for the vague and general discussion of genius. We are likely to learn much more about its causation and nature by following out a number of detailed lines of inquiry on a carefully objective basis. Such an inquiry, as we have seen, is difficult on account of the defective nature of the material and the lack of adequate normal standards of comparison. Yet even with these limitations, it has not been wholly unprofitable. It has enabled us to trace a number of conditions, which, even if they cannot always be described as factors of the genus constitution, clearly appear among the influences highly favourable to its development. Such a condition seems to be the great reproductive activity of the parents, the child destined to attain intellectual eminence in many cases alone surviving. The fact of being either the youngest or the eldest child is a condition favourable for subsequent intellectual eminence, and I may add that I could refer to numerous recent instances of large families in which the eldest and the youngest, but no other members, have attained intellectual distinction. We have further seen that there is a tendency for children who develop genius to be of feeble health or otherwise disabled during the period of physical development. It is easy to see the significance of this influence, which, by its unfavorable effects on the development of the limits, an effect not exerted by the head, which may thus remain relatively large, leaves an unusual surplus of energy to be used in other directions. At the same time, the child who is thus deprived of the ordinary occupations of childhood is thrown back onto more solitary and more intellectual pursuits. The clumsiness and other muscular incoordinations which we have found to be prevalent, while there is good reason to believe that they are of congenital origin, cooperate to the same end. Again, it is easy to see how the shock of contact with a strange novel environment, which we have proved to be so frequent, acts as a most powerful stimulant to the nascent intellectual aptitudes. It is possible to take a number of other common peculiarities in the course of the development of genius, and to show how either they serve to inhibit the growth of genius along unfruitful lines, or to further along fruitful lines. Such an investigation as the present is far from enabling us to state definitely all the determining factors of genius, or even all the conditions required for its development. It suggests that they are really very numerous, and that genius is the happy result of a combination of many concomitant circumstances, though some of the prenatal groups of circumstances must remain largely outside our ken. We are entitled to believe that the factors of genius include the nature of the various stocks meeting together in the individual and the matter of their combination, the evocation of the parents, the circumstances attending conception, pregnancy and birth, the early environment and all the manifold influences to which the child is subjected from infancy to youth. The precise weight and value of these manifold circumstances in the production of genius must be left to later investigation to determine. End of chapter 12 and end of a study of British genius by Havelock Ellis. Recorded by Leon Harvey.